Well, happy new year. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're here we are Saturday night live and looky here. Look who we have that is with us tonight. We have Chuck, the man himself. And uh, I'm trying to, I'm going to, you know, that makes everybody a little bigger until we get somebody else in here. Um, it's wonderful to have Chuck uh, popping in tonight. Uh, we have a fair amount of things to talk about tonight. And uh, we'll start off just by uh, seeing who's in the chat and saying hello. Um, got, uh, uh, Moz Man's in the chat. We got Ava in here. Hello, Ava. Always good to have you on here with us. Uh, Jeff and Leslie. Um, Albert's here. Uh, so we got seven people. Um, unfortunately, photos. unfortunately, we're going to have, um, you know, some things to talk about that aren't, that, that, isn't, that isn't good news per se at all. Um, but I don't want to have to repeat it two or three times during the show. Uh, talking about it once will be will be difficult enough. So we're going to wait till we get about 20 people in here before we get into any uh, in-depth conversation. Uh, Woody's in here now and Wayne. Um, he's going to try to get set up to come in on the panel as well. Um, <clears throat> Bob is uh, Bob from Bob Our Photos. He's in uh, Philly right now. Uh, visiting family and seeing his uh, grandchild, grandson. So um, he managed to get there in good time, even though um, there were the issues with the the bridge that collapsed. Yeah. Um, I'm letting you guys in here, but I got to. Unfortunately, I got to change over, and we're all going to be squeezing everybody in. Hello, Wayne. How you doing? Morning, guys. How's everyone? As good as as good as we can be at this point. <laughs> um, Try to buy Roy. Yeah, I haven't talked about it yet with everybody. I'm waiting until we get a few more people in here so we don't have to do a peat and repeat two or three times during the show because not something that you want to have to repeat two or three times during the show. <laughs> gotcha. Um, and... Uh, the uh, before uh, before we really get going here, I, one thing I will do is, is I want to send a thank you out to Luis uh, last week for talking about Costa Rica. Uh, the discussion it was very it was very uh, funny because the discussion was uh, initially going to be like ten minutes, <laughs> <laughs> and you know how that goes, right? Chuck Chuck knows how that goes. Yeah. yeah. Um, it was supposed to be like a warm up and a 10 minute discussion because he is coming on on April 13th to show pictures of Costa Rica and get into and I would I would say get into a little more detail but he got into quite a bit of detail last week so uh, like he said he said gee what am I going to talk about on April 13th I already talked about everything so <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll see what he manages to to come up with uh, in a couple weeks and um, want to remind everyone that next Saturday is the photo review. Uh, we are at currently, I got Gustavo snuck in his images uh, very late in the afternoon today. So we're up to 41 images. I'm hoping that we can break 50, which we've been pretty good at doing uh, for quite a while now. So um, you guys got all next week to send me images. So hopefully... Uh, be nice if we got 60 actually or better i don't I, I don't mind man it's just if we talk about images for three hours four hours whatever i don't i don't care i mean i i like the fact that everybody um likes to uh chip in and and show what they're working on show what they like to take um lucas here i'll put up the let me put up the information here um quickly and so everybody has the information um, up to four photos uh get it in by uh, next uh this coming you know friday friday of next week by noon time 2048 on the long side and um, we don't care what genre it is where we are not uh 
We just want you to share what you're comfortable shooting and what you like to share, what means something to you, uh, whether it be travel photos, photos of your kids, photos of your dog, photos of your friend's dog. We don't care. Whatever, whatever you want to share. Uh, we, we, like, we like to look at all the images. So, and we get a, a nice variety from everyone. And um, that, that's what makes it a very, enjoy, a very enjoyable show. And um, Chuck, have you had time to sneak out in the backyard and shoot any birds with your 600 rather than a, rather than a rifle? I mean, are you, are you getting them with the camera? <laughs> I, I, I've, uh, with the 600, uh, taking a few, uh, some, some shit shots, shot, shot, shots today. So I may have some to put hay on the wall for the, the snoop, okay? So let's, uh, everybody out there, you know, we, we don't get to see Chuck often enough. And so we're going to, you know, we're going to show off his, actually, you know, we're going to, we're going to show off his hairstyle because, you know, we want him to be big on the screen because... He's got the best hair of anybody that, that's that's on the live streams, period. And uh, he's he's always a classy dresser. And so, mm -hmm. you know, he deserves to be on the big on the big screen here. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it's nice to see. I, I I smile every time I see that on air sign lit up in the background and I see AP Studios <laughs> lit up and I see all his fancy little buttons to to his right. Uh, that I have no clue what they do, and he's got the image of his small, cat. his small kitty, his very small kitty cat, which <laughs> Chuck will argue that it's not that small. <laughs> no, he's, he's a pretty, he's a pretty good cat. <laughs> but uh, mm. it's, uh, it's wonderful to, to see you again, my friend, and uh, you know. Make it make it a habit to come on, man, for an hour, an hour or so a week, man. Just to, we gotta we gotta break you in. Plus, plus we gotta get you used to to, to putting the Chuck Talk shirt back on. You know, yeah. so we gotta, you know. <laughs> yeah, is your T-shirt handy? Yeah. Yeah, it's been it's been a while. We he, Chuck's got the Maribel got him a wonderfully made T-shirt. I mean, I, I get crappy T-shirts. Yeah. Chuck gets the good stuff. I, I get the crappy shirts. Yeah, that still looks good, Chuck. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, yeah, and for this show, for Jeff's show, don't forget to like and subscribe. Yeah. <laughs> but the. Um, the, let's see, we got 16 in here. I'll, I'll just share, I'll share a little, a little story here quick. Uh, I got a, um, let, let me, give me a second. I gotta, I gotta get this file up in the background. Um, you need, you need that, put you got, in, uh, yeah, put you in the, uh, this, this plane, okay? You want me to shrink you? Yeah. Oh, come on, you look so dapper. You're the, you're the best dressed guy on the show. So it's like, you know, I was showing you off. Um, I, I got an interesting email from uh, the Andre McAuliffe. Okay, he lives in Malta. And so he sent me a new thumbnail design for my channel as a gift. Um, so I'm now using it on my channel. I actually changed my, my logo. Uh, to what he redesigned for me. And um, I changed my background image on the channel as well. So it was greatly ap appreciated. The problem is now I have to change all the thousands of T-shirts I ordered. <laughs> kidding, kidding, only kidding. But I'll show now, he you. Gave me, uh, he gave me one too. You know, the when you see my video, you, you see that logo. Yeah. Uh, uh, his brother, he, he said his brother's a graphic artist and did it. That was really nice of him. Yeah, so I'm going to show you what it looks like if you haven't been to the channel lately. Um, this is this is what he did for me, and I really appreciate it. Yeah. Wow. Nice. So I think that's, I think that's pretty cool. 
See, he know, he know he knows that I just I just pencil whip something out quick, you know. Yeah. And I, I think he got tired of my subpar uh, logo, so he uh, was nice enough to spend the time and put something together. And uh, I just want to thank him uh, personally on the show and appreciate it very much. So very very nice of him to do that. Wayne, you need a refill. Yeah, yeah, hit me, man. Hit me. <laughs> there you go. Oh. You know what time zone you guys are in. You got that? Uh, Mar Mar Maribel's in the Maribel is refill. here. Uh, hello, Maribel. Nice to nice to see you. I'm glad you're home you for like Easter. Me? I'm glad you're home with Chuck for Easter. No, no. she's not. She's I'm not. Sure, I'm sure Chuck's happy. He, he, he's, he's, he's not. He, he's, uh, uh, he's still at the North oh, Carolina. Is he still in Raleigh? Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Oh, man. That, well, I can't say the word because I'll get fined five cents or something, you know? They'll take they'll take all my income I make from the show. Okay, I guess I could monetize. Swear. I guess I could swear. I, I got nothing. To, as I say, I have nothing to lose. <laughs> yeah. Only he they will so take won't your be video found. off. You take my video off. Well, yeah. I mean, that that may happen anyway. Who knows? <laughs> but uh, we got enough people in here. I guess I'll have I'll bring up the. Uh, the unfortunate uh, issue here that uh, that has happened. Um, as most of you probably noticed last week, uh, Roy was not on the panel with us, and that is highly unusual for Roy. Um, he would normally call me, or I'm not call me, but uh, email me and let me know that he's not able to come on for the show. And um, I had did not hear from him, so I was surprised when he wasn't on the show. And uh, then I tried to email him a couple times during the week. And I didn't get any response from him. So then I got really worried that maybe something had happened um, to, you know, some, a family member or him or his, or his spouse or what have you. And um, I know I texted uh, Ma's man and voiced my concern. And, and he went and looked at some other feeds, some other channels that, that Roy participates in and noticed that he didn't make any comments on their, on their videos or on their show. And, that just fueled the anxiety a little bit. And then early this morning, uh, Jeff Sluter, who you guys know, he's, he's in the chat. He, he shows up as Jeff and Leslie because his wife takes pictures with him. So Jeff and Leslie, that, that Jeff is Jeff Sluter. And he got contacted by Roy's wife, Stella, to inform uh, him that Roy had got, had a stroke last week. So um, I don't know the severity of the stroke. She implied in the, in the brief, very brief uh, conversation with Jeff that she thought he might be able to come back in the chat in a couple weeks, but uh, didn't really get specific about anything. So uh, we are going to hope that that's the case, that it was a minor stroke and, and that he recovers quickly. But in the meantime, um, let's all keep him in our prayers and thoughts. And, and wish him a speedy recovery and a full recovery. Um, he uh, obviously we want him in back in the chat at a minimum as soon as possible and back on the panel where he belongs. Um, and as as we all I think notice, Roy doesn't always talk a lot on the show, but everybody respects his expertise and knowledge. And there's no doubt when Roy speaks, people listen. And uh, he is a he is a big contributor, has been a big contributor to AP Studios and and uh, and this channel, uh, trying to keep things going for a while here. And um, you know he's in my prayers. I'm sure he's in all of our prayers now. And let's uh, wish him well. And let's just hope that he. Uh, he can get back as soon as possible and, and that he fully recovers from this. But I don't have, I don't have any um, big specifics. And, and like I said, uh, Jeff, yeah, Jeff is saying here in the chat that uh, she hopes he'll be back in a few weeks. And she says the text chat was only a few minutes long. So you, you can only get so much information in a few minutes. So uh, for those of you that, I mean, and we have people on here, other people on here that live in Australia that come on. I don't know if any of you live, know, know Roy personally. And uh, 
reach out to them or whatever. Um, you know, but uh, we're we're all going to be thinking about you and uh, no doubt about it. And so I appreciate uh, I appreciate Jeff contacting me this morning. And uh, I'd like to say it made me feel better. I mean, I was getting stressed not hearing from him, but it really didn't make me feel better because I didn't, yeah. you know, you don't want it to be this. So it's uh, unfortunately our, our, uh, our average, um, our demographic, our age demographics are not very favorable on this channel. <laughs> we have uh, we have Joey, but we need like a hundred more Joeys to kind of <laughs> knock the mean age uh, down a few more notches because uh, one Joey is not enough. Uh, Joey, we're going to need you to recruit some younger people to come on and visit the show, man. Well, Jeff, we need more Roy's, right? I mean, yeah, it's when I saw that email. <laughs> This morning, my heart just sunk. I mean, you know, him, Chuck, you know, all you guys, you're all just great human beings. And, you know, it's really a pleasure just to be around y'all and hear your stories and uh, hear your insights. And, you know, I mean, to your point, Jeff, you know, Roy doesn't always necessarily say a ton, but he doesn't have to. You know, he just he's the kind of person that his personality just comes across in who he is. And he's just a very caring, good person. So, you know, definitely wishing him and his family the best and, uh, you know, quick recovery for sure. And, you know, yeah. and we'll never have anybody that anybody could just say, do you remember this widget? Did you ever have one of these? And Roy just sits there and goes like this, turns around, spins around in a chair, finds the right box and says, well, yeah, I only got four of them. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, the Roy I mean, Museum. Uh, yep. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he should have the uh, the camera museum in Australia, and and if he ever yeah. does that, I might actually make a trip there and see it. <laughs> he sure does have a lot of stuff. Yeah, yeah, and well, what's great is you know darn well he used it all too. You know, yeah. he used it all. Um, but uh, yeah, so let, let, let's keep him in our thoughts for sure. I mean, and and let's hope that we. Uh, we get an update, um, you know, during the week and we can provide more information uh, on the next show. Um, I know it's 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 not a lot to go by, but uh, that, that's all we have right now. Um, yeah. Now, I really, yeah, I really like Roy's idea of the, the rear lens cap of all of his lenses, depending on the mount, they were different colors. And so that when he was looking for, and then what I've done is I've taken that one step further is I actually put the focal length of the lens on the lens cap. So when I go looking for something that's in my bag or whatever, it's a yellow is Z mount, red is F mount. So that narrows it down right there. And then I just go pick the one that I want and away you go. So, and but that's what he does, uh, except he's got shelves and shelves and you know yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah, if if, yeah, if, if, if someone said to Roy, hey, can you bring some of your gear for a photo shoot? And the guy'd say, Well, what do you want? The semi semi truck or the or the pickup <laughs> truck? <laughs> um unfortunately there's other uh bad news and uh, i i didn't know this but i didn't know this individual i mean it's possible that john might have heard of him or known him uh i get it i got an email from uh another uh, youtuber uh that has a channel uh, called suspect photography uh david bromer and he notified myself and sent out like a blanket uh email to a mailing list because a uh, famed photographer uh, Melchor DiGiacomo, uh, DiGiacomo, um, who he who he did a tribute page on his website uh, on suspectphotography.com. Um, this gentleman who liked to go by just go by Colin Mel. Um, he passed away on March 25th. He did a lot of types of photography uh, in his life: photojournalism, street photography, wedding and sports photography. Um, he covered the sport of tennis for, for many, many decades, starting in the 60s when tennis first started getting popular right up through into the 90s. Um, he's the only non-tennis player that got admitted into the Tennis Hall of Fame in 2015. Um, wow. 
he knew all the big names, you know, in tennis, and um, and and he did uh, a lot of seminars uh, at BNH Photo, and he um, had a very unique style in wedding photography. He was a, 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 a phenomenal wedding photographer, but he had a photo, photo. He called it a photojournalism style to wedding photography. He yeah. shot. He did not. He rarely used a flash. He shot with a wide angle lens and he got right into the fray, right onto the dance floor, right in the faces of the people in the wedding. And he captured images that showed the emotion and the engagement of the people in the wedding. And he shot primarily with a wide angle lens and no flash. And um, he did wonderful sports photography and had a lot of his work on, in Sports Illustrated magazine uh, and in tennis publications, of course, because he did a lot of tennis. He traveled over. He, he lived overseas for a while and and photo did photography for rugby matches, did a lot of rugby photography. Um, but anyway, um, David was kind enough to share this gentleman's story. And he has some links on his channel, like I said, Suspect Photography. Um, and he has um, links to some of his videos. Um, he has uh, one that's um, one that talk, where he talks about his career and another one where he offers uh, wedding tips and another one, you know, so you want to be a sports photographer. And I didn't, I didn't watch them all in the entirety, but I basically watched e each one like halfway just to kind of get a feel for this gentleman's work. And it is extremely interesting and different and wonderful to see. And the guy uh, was definitely someone that the photography world will miss. And uh, so um, I'll leave it at that. Visit his site. And David was in his tribute. He shared Mel's favorite joke. Which, which I just cracked up about. And, and his favorite joke was, uh, what's the difference between a pizza pie and a professional photographer? The pizza pie can feed a family of four. <laughs> 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 so, so if you get a chance to, uh, you know, to check out his, his channel and, and look at the history of this gentleman, I think you, you will be very impressed with the work that he did. And, he was quite a personality and, and quite a gentleman and really loved people. He loved being around people and he loved photographing people. Um, so put his information on the bottom or in the chat. So folks can find yeah, out. Yeah, let me, um, give me a second to type something in here. I got my, um, let's see. Give me, give me a few minutes here to, uh, Type this in. Wayne, you leaving in the morning? Afternoon. It's a 3 p.m. flight. Hey, today's Easter, isn't it? Yeah. Easter Sunday. Well, for us. Yeah. It's already tomorrow where you are, John. <laughs> yeah, I just. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, tomorrow is already. Here. Yeah. Yeah. So it's Sunday for us. Saturday night for the rest. Yeah. So for yeah. So for those of you in different time zones, where you're already way ahead of us, Happy Easter to you if you celebrate Easter. Um, and um, and and in case I forget later, which I hope not, after midnight, I was going to wish Happy Easter to everybody, but I'll do it right now in case I have a memory lapse and forget, which is which is highly possible. Uh, that that could happen. Um, and then, uh, unfortunately, one more piece of, of, of kind of, um, of bad news as well. I mean, I hate to start the show off on such a negative overtone. Um, I recently, I, I did some research. I had a, a Konica camera that I recently bought, and I had to get some parts for it, and I had a few issues with it, and uh, I did a lot of searching on the, uh, the Internet, and different, uh, a lot of different groups, and 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 one person's name kept coming up. That um, a, a gentleman, let me find it here. 
um, a gentleman named Greg Weber was a expert camera repair person for all Konica cameras. And he had, uh, was renowned for his knowledge of Konica. And so I, I found his uh, email address and I emailed him and I asked him a few questions and his website was, was uh, temporarily shut down and it said he wasn't doing any repairs at this time. And um, I heard from him like a week later and unfortunately um, he's recovering from uh, the same situation that we just talked about. Uh, and, um, Man. So he uh, went on to tell me that, you know, he he's not, you know, and he and he's an older gentleman and he says that he's not going to be able to do any repair work anymore. Um, he's hoping that he gets, you know, good enough so he can start going through some of his stu stuff and <clears throat> organizing it and whatnot. Um, and, and unfortunately, the sad thing is um, he he could not even even tell me anybody anybody period in the united states uh that even works on konica cameras anymore so he was like he was like the last guy okay there maybe there's someone in europe that does it or somebody in japan but in terms of the united states he was the man he was the guy that everybody would go to so um you know, and unfortunately, all that knowledge is lost. There's no one that's that could pick the ball up and take over uh, with what Greg has done for, I'm sure, decades and decades. And anybody who's had stuff serviced through this guy or communicated with him, uh, we all wish you well. We all hope that you have a speedy recovery. Uh, we hope that uh, things go OK and move along in, in a positive direction for you. Um, and I really appreciate you getting back to me. Uh, all things considered, you, you certainly did not owe a response to me when you're you're going through a recovery phase. Um, you're you're uh, a very nice gentleman, and uh, I wish you nothing but the best. And um, and and what's sad, and and Greg's situation isn't, uh, you know, the general situation in camera repair is obviously you have you have technicians out there that can work on all the latest and greatest stuff. You know, you, they work for Nikon or they work for Canon or, or whatever. Uh, but the sad thing is if you're someone like me uh, that likes vintage stuff, uh, it's getting harder and harder now to, to get anything worked on. Uh, so, I mean, there are, there are now definitely some cameras that I have in my collection that I, I am going to use them to, to take some shots with, and then they're going to be basically uh, collectibles and they're not going to get used because if they break, I, I'm not going to be able to get ever get them fixed. So I want them to be working cameras. I don't want them to be broken cameras. So, uh, it's sad. I mean, this is just this is just something that's been going on for years. As as uh, experts with different models uh, retire, um, and there's just nobody. You know, like I said, all the technicians now are all working on the latest and greatest stuff. They're not working on the old stuff. So let's uh, let's move on to positive uh, things that are positive here. Um, hopefully. Uh, let me just go quick and see who else we have in the chat because I've been rambling and um, we've got 30 people in here now and we got J-Rod is here from Maryland. Hello. Hello, Maryland. I hope you're, have you been at the, uh, the dam taking pictures of the Eagles uh, lately? And uh, Mike Farwell is talking about Tennessee being an Awesome state. I only drove through part of Tennessee once. I went to uh, I went to the Corvette Museum, and then and, uh, drove back through Tennessee and and you know to get back to Myrtle Beach, you know, and and then stayed here for a, for a week. Uh, and my wife flew in, and uh, we stayed for a week or so, and then we drove home uh, from here. Uh, but I went to the National Corvette Museum in Bowling Green, Kentucky, and I got to drive through part of Tennessee, and and, and I was shocked that that the that the highways in Tennessee. I mean, you drive through a lot of states, and you're on a main highway, and the road is just like straight, like forever. 
That ain't how it is in Tennessee. <laughs> you better stay awake if you're driving at night on the highways in Tennessee because you have some pretty good sweeping turns here and there. You know, you're not in a straight line. So you definitely you definitely want to have either a pile of, of, of coffee in the car or Coca-Cola or you got to have that uh, uh, energy drink that you could take because you don't want to doze off when you're driving through uh, through Tennessee. Um, I'm sure I'm sure Chuck can vouch for that. <laughs> and uh, who else we got in here? Da, 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 da. Uh, Luke, they said we got Luke and Gustavo. Are you having? Uh, oh, he says the internet is back, so we may have Gustavo popping in here. I know uh, now. Gustavo won't be here next week for the photo review because he's on his way to Texas. You know how you have that game? Where's Waldo? Well, there's a new game called Where's Randall, and we're sending ah. Gustavo out to drive to the state of Texas to see if he could find Randall. So that that's going to be his goal is to search Texas and see if he could find out where Randall is shooting the eclipse. He uh, says he so. says he's in the green room. He's in the green room. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so so Gustavo, do you accept the challenge of of trying to find Randall when you're going through Texas? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> I love the enthusiasm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. It was like a shaky, a shaky one of these, a little shaky. The, 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 the issue is that we don't know where everybody got to be because, uh, and we talk about that later, uh, the the forecast for the clips is not that great for Texas. So. Oh. Well, I know where I'm going to be, and I'm not going to tell you. All right. <laughs> So, so Jeff and Leslie and, uh, uh, and, and Ohio probably at this moment looks just good. <laughs> ah, everyone's going to be in Texas too. Ah. <clears throat> so she can find Randall. Yeah, Ava, you can, you can accept the challenge and find Randall. <clears throat> we'll, have, we'll have to. Uh... You're going to Dallas, am I correct? Uh, uh, my, yeah. my base would be in Plano. Uh, oh, Plano, which is, okay. Which is the outskirts of Dallas, because you know. Huh? Right. But, uh, but then then the let, let's see what happens with the forecast. Uh, so so I may I may get closer to you as I drive uh, <laughs> south if if that need, but the, at this moment all the all the weather for Texas is similar. But uh, it's ten days away, correct? So or yeah. Oh so. yeah. The forecast will change five times uh, before you get there. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. Only five. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, the three-day forecast uh, it's a it's a little bit uh, it becomes a little bit more reliable. And, yeah. Uh, the, the, the problem, and we can talk about that later, I don't want to talk about that uh, too much, but it's, the problem is that the the azimuth of the eclipse matches the way the fronts travel from the west to the east, correct? So so if there is a, a front coming, it will be in the same direction of the eclipse. Hey, hey uh, Joey, are you, are, you, uh, are you the type of guy that can take a joke? I mean... <laughs> oh no, it's good trigger. It's, it's, oh, it's, it's, I'm, it's, it's, I'm making him squirm. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm like, yeah, no, yeah, of course, of course, I'm I can like, take a joke. No, I, 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 I'm gonna, I'm gonna tease you a little bit. It's a very little tease. I think, I on. think you will actually find a little comic relief in it. So I, I got to yeah. find my notes here. I put it in my, in my little yeah, section where nice. I have, you know, trials and tribute tips and tribulations. Jeff, did I make it into your notes? You made it into my notes, man. <laughs> oh no! So, so I I got you down under as under tribulations. So you did a short recently uh, for the Panasonic twenty to sixty millimeter kit lens. Hmm. Correct. Yes, I did. Yes, he did. Now I want to pick it on you a little bit because there's a scene in there. Now Joey's filming himself. He's talking to the camera, so he's filming himself. And he picks up he picks up the camera like he's gonna take a picture, but his lens cap is on. 
<laughs> I know the shot you're you're thinking about. So I, I remember I got back. I think it was like two, three days later. I was starting to edit, and I had one shot of me pretending to take a photo like a goofy influencer. And I saw that damn <laughs> lens cap, and I was like, "Darn it!" I, I laughed. Could, I, I laughed so hard, and I said, <laughs> "I have to call you out on that." That even. <laughs> Even the young young professionals here can forget to take the lens cap off their lens before they take a picture. <laughs> yep. 100%, 100%. No, I, I remember, yeah, I was looking at it. It's just like, come on, man. Like, and I think it went from like three degrees outside and kind of nice to three days later, it was like minus 30 again. And I was like, well, we're keeping the lens cap. We're keeping the shot. Not redoing it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and and hey, hey, and and I'm one that should talk because I'll find I'll find stuff. I'll do a video, and I'll watch it, and I'll say, oh, I misspoke here, or I I butchered a word here, or I butchered a word there, and and some days it'll bother me enough where it never bothers me enough to redo it. It'll bother me enough where I go in and I correct it, you know, and, and like the titles, you know, Thanks. and I say, sorry, I meant to say this or I misspoke or whatever. But uh, because it, it, it's very frustrating, like if I'm doing a um, one of those old vintage camera reviews and I'm, I'm filming it from I'm using the camera on the Mac because when you're a one man crew and you're trying to show something up close on a camera. I don't have somebody filming for me and I can't like sit there and, and zoom in on a certain spot and talk for like 30 seconds and then get up and stop the video and then zoom back out. So I could talk about something else where I don't need to be zoomed in. So I just hold the camera up to my computer screen and I'm talking and I'm using that stupid app in the apple there the photo booth and, and photo booth likes to bomb out sometimes i have to do a take i've had to do a take sometimes six times because i'll do a 10 minute segment and then it'll show the, the counter the timer's going it says okay you know 10 minutes or whatever and i go okay it's recording and i'm i'm moving along and i'm going and then I go and I look over in the question. I hit the stop button and I look in the corner and it comes up with 0, 0.00 minutes of video. <laughs> and I'm like, you son of a bleep. And I do it again. And then it screws up again. And sometimes it's four times. So like the last, the last video I did, by the time I'm trying it like the fifth time, my throat's sore. You know, and and I'm like, okay, I'm only gonna do it in five minute chunks, and I'm just gonna stick it all together because that doggone thing is not gonna come up with that zero point zero zero again. Absolutely frustrating. And like Chuck would always say, Chuck, what was a famous saying you'd say when you were doing your show? You'd say, "I need who?" Oh, Assistant, um, uh, Mike or whoever. Even. Yeah, Steve. Steven. Yeah. Right? So I'm sitting here saying, I only know what Chuck felt like. I'm like, I need Steven. Where's Steven? Yeah. <laughs> that, that is the most frustrating thing, Jeff. I know that's one of the reasons why I ended up going over the Sony. Because, I, you know, even though I had that external screen, because it wasn't getting a red bar around it, I would use the Ninja sometimes. But, of course, if you're not scanning and the thing kind of lose focus, my issue was the focus, not me on me. But I give you a, a little bit of advice for those segments when you want to show something, just you know, do like a B-roll of it on a table or something, and then you can just like add it in later on mm -hmm. in the middle of the video, so you don't have to in front of the screen do it because sometimes, as you say, you may be doing it and it's not recording, but if you have the B-roll, you got it. And I think one of the things that people kind of forget about, you know, when people say you don't need a camera to flip screen, if you're a solo content creator. You can waste a lot of time thinking you push that button and it's not recorded and have to do retake after retake after retake. And it is annoying. Well, the, the, I mean, it's the worst. Like, I, I remember when yep. I got my Z6 still, I was at this shoot. It was a real estate one. And this was the last day I used that camera. And I, I mean, it was getting kind of worn out, but we were in this um, 
uh, loud construction site, which we didn't have permission to be at. But the real estate agent was like, no, 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 we're doing this here. This is going to be great. And I'm like, this isn't great so far. We don't even have a PPE, but okay. So we get in there. And I set my Z6 up with the 17 to 35 2.8 8 with the FTC 2 adapter on the tripod. There's no, like, I, I set it so the window's behind it, so the exposure shouldn't be an issue. Like, it should be able to pull autofocus at 17 mil, right? That shouldn't be an issue. So I click record, walk away. I've just got my little Sony ZV-1 from the uh, B, B side. I couldn't use a single piece of footage. <laughs> it was all out of focus. And all I was thinking the whole time was like, man, if I had a flippy screen, I would have been able to have seen from like the other side where I was filming from. It was just a bummer. So yeah, for like yeah. solo video creators, like, yeah, it's kind of a must. I mean, for a photography, yeah, hundred percent, like a flippy, like the regular sort of tilt screens actually better in a lot of ways. But you know, if you're shooting a lot of video and doing lots of these, I mean, having that flippy screen really can help save a lot of shots. Or a light, a tally light up front just to let you know that you're actually recording. Yeah. You're getting a few comments here, uh, Joey, on your skill set. <laughs> <laughs> I ain't got no skill set. <laughs> I've got a lot of enthusiasm. Yeah. That's that's what I use. <laughs> I only use a CF Express type C. Oh god. Yeah, you know what? I will I, I used to hate only being able to use CF Express. I had one card that I used for all things, and it was it, so expensive. It, it, you're not, your sound is going, Joe. I think he, oh. he was hit, he was hitting his his mic with all the the, the the arm hairs on his arm brushed up <laughs> against the microphone. Static. Uh, can, yeah. can, can you hear me now? Yeah, you yeah, hear me now. I hear you now. There we go. Sorry. It, my, my. It, keep your hand off your boom. Yeah. <laughs> ooh, 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 oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Did somebody come up with something pleasant to say? <laughs> so so, so hey. let me go, let me go in, in defense of Joey. Joey, as I said over to the people that I mentor in the office when I used to work, the people that don't make mistakes, the people that do nothing. That's right? right. That's right. You can't make a mistake if you don't shoot, right? Exactly. And you can't learn if you don't make mistakes. So there's, exactly. nothing, wrong with, there's nothing wrong with making mistakes as long as you learn from them. Yeah, but but I keep shooting and I keep making the same mistakes. That dog don't hunt. Um, I'm always, <laughs> yeah. Consistency is key. Consistent <laughs> mediocrity. That's what I always say to my friends, they're like, oh, maybe you're going to do it this way. I'm like, no, I'm, I'm out shooting by myself and there's no, I'm, I'm just gonna get the shot and move on. It's like one of my one of my, I had a comment a while ago. Guy was like, "Why don't you ever use a tripod for any of your street photo shots?" We were talking. I'm like, "Cause you have no idea the anarchy that's going on around the camera. I ain't setting that thing down. I'm stopping for five seconds, yelling at the camera, moving on to the next site, and realizing I didn't record it the first last one and redoing it right." <laughs> Uh, Wayne Wayne is about to leave us because his 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 stomach is churning and where he is it's breakfast time, so he's ready for breakfast. So yeah, the wife is going to grab some stuff and she's back, so we're about to have some breakfast. But I'll I'll be off camera. but still listening? Okay, I may speak every once in a while, but you know you guys will see me. Okay, we're, we're going to talk all about you while all you're right. gone. Yeah, yeah, Joe, you'll talk about you while you're gone. <laughs> <laughs> I'll still be here. <laughs> I wonder what he's eating. I can hear him eating. <laughs> I guess he went off camera. I can't yeah, we'll know if you're. If, we'll know if you're eating uh, something that's like has granola in it. We'll hear. We'll hear the crunching sounds. <laughs> oh no, there's gonna be no crunching sound. I'm pushing the mic as well. Uh, okay. <laughs> With the camera turned off, Wayne, and just the the voice, it was kind of like an ASMR vibe. I'm, I'm getting into it. <laughs> the, uh, the, the only let's see what else we got. Uh, da, 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 da. So we got. Um, give me a second here. Well, you know what's interesting is is I as I went back and I looked at a few oh, wow. other contributors uh, out there their um, their channels and uh, and I think it was like maybe four videos ago Simon from Ordinary Filmmaker did a had a, had a uh, conversation about talking about the Z6 III. And of course, Nikon rumors thought it was going to, I think we all thought it should. I mean, to say it, it, it was going to is obviously everybody's guess, but I think we all felt it. Sh a lot of us felt 
clean myself. It should have came out the third quarter, late in the third quarter of, or last quarter of, of last year. Uh, and uh, so then we're all making the assumption it was going to come out in time to start shipping in the first quarter of the new of the new year, which for Nikon is April 1st. And there's still no uh, no conversation. And so, but he went over, you know, supposedly what the specs are, and uh, and he was very impressed with with the specs. Um, and so now you kind of have to work. You, you kind of have to wonder if they're trying to time it so they they interject their announcement maybe shortly after Canon, you know, announces the R five two or or whatever to try to like. Uh, I don't know, uh, mix things up a little bit because uh, Simon seemed to feel that the if they hold the price point, let's say within $100 or $200 of the Z6 II with what it looks like they're putting in that camera, that's a very impressive camera for its price point. So uh, time will tell. But, you know, I, I mean, I, I hope they're not just playing a game where they're going to – Canon does their thing. They get the attention – for a week and then Nikon says, okay, time for us to sneak out the Z63 and we're going to grab the headlines for a while and try to steal the headlines. But you never know. I mean, I don't work in marketing, but uh, I wish, I wish it was already something that people could start pre-ordering at this point in time, you know, but. Uh, well, I just wish we knew it was coming or it was like on the roadmap because I mean, the Z62 release was in 2020 and I mean, it, was it really a, a 2.0 of the one? Like it was only nominally better, slightly better autofocus. It wasn't an up res in video at all. Like it, it specs wise really wasn't that much difference. So, you know, it's been, it's been enough time. They need to, they got to bring it in. I, I'm excited for them, but they just, they keep teasing us. And it's like, please just release the camera. We need, well, we, we want May of last year. So, you know, everyone that was making the same noise back then, it is what it is. When it comes out, it comes out, you know? Yeah. I mean, yeah. We got enough cameras yeah. already. It's not like, you, you know, you, you're going to, you know, bust the nut because you don't have a Z6 III. We got Z8s and ZFs and whatnot. Well, uh, he made, Simon so made a comment. Out which kind of fell along my my opinion and 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 I'd like to hear Chuck's opinion on it is is you have to wonder if the if the Z63 comes out with the specs that it has and we all know what the Z8 has and we know what the Z9 has you really got to wonder if you are we going to really have a Z73 are is it really going to happen I don't know well, Chuck, what do you think? Is it is you think a Z73 is going to happen? Uh, I I see it's still too early to um, see, seeing it won't. Um, um, but I think the a Z7 uh, could uh, be the um, high uh, the high mes me megapixel. Yeah, yeah. There you go. So, so there could give me a forty, a, a sixty-one. Mat, um, so I don't know. Yeah, I don't yeah. know. It's it's getting harder and harder to see it fitting into the scheme of things, though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and 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 here here's another here's another thing that will either either make people where I'll either tick people off or they'll be happy. I don't know which, or a little bit of, probably a little bit of both is, as I'm almost wondering, would they, because, you know, it, it's been out there for a while and there's been all sorts of fights about it on the internet and on the YouTube channels and channels fighting with each other. Would you, do you think that maybe instead of rushing out a Z3, Z73, obviously, uh, a Z63, a ZF, a Z63, a Z8, a Z9 is a pretty solid mid to upper tier offering. Do you think that maybe Nikon would surprise us all and sneak out with a pro APS-C body before they come out with a Z73? 
Maybe no, definitely no, or maybe yes. Who knows? You know, what do you guys think? The R7, no. They they could do it. Well, Z52 or ZFC2 or Z32 just come out with a new APS-C camera that can do it all, especially for bird watching. You know, Roy wouldn't like that, but. Well, Roy would have to get off, get get up and argue with us, you know, and that may be the the, the push that he needs to, to get going, as long as it's not too big of a push, you know. Yeah. But the way that I see it, uh, everybody's talking about that Z63, and they've been doing that for a couple of years. Just think of all the free advertising that Nikon is getting, and the and this being front and center. And they're not doing a thing other than they, they may give a little piece of information to somebody every so often so that the rumors get started again. You know, but it, it's, it's, I wouldn't doubt it. An awful lot of this is, is Nikon marketing. So, well, right, which is, which is like trying, is you might as well have one of those old, remember those old Ouija boards? You might as well get three people around the Ouija board and have your fingers on it and, and say, is Nikon going to come out with this next month and watch the thing float around to the letters, you know? <laughs> yeah. What the meteorologists do. Yeah, and see what see what it's going to tell us. Can you, can you hear me? Yeah. We can hear you, John. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, no, it'll say, it'll, it'll say, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'll be maybe. <laughs> we'll say Nikon well, doesn't know yeah, either. Yeah. I'm kidding. But I remember reading an article today on the Nikon rumors. They said that the Z63 and Z73 will be coming out from last year in November. Yeah. The the, the thing that we know is that the next fiscal year starts April first. April first. Yeah. And they, <laughs> they and they they need to have something to to achieve a goal for the fiscal year correct and, and that's not going to be that need to have the new camera so and like john was saying it may come back maybe they surprise us next week correct uh, maybe maybe comes uh, in may but something will happen this year yeah and 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 what's not what's not going to uh let me get it up here. What's what's not going to drive, what, you know, we'll give them some sales, but what, what's not going to drive their sales numbers is the new lens that just came out, you know. <laughs> yeah. uh, the, 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 the 28, the, the Z28, the 400 F4, F, F8 F at twelve ninety nine ninety five. Uh, my my comment my, my comment on it now now i've watched i've i've watched like three or four other content creators videos on it and pet i watched petapixels today and you know obviously all, all these folks had pre production units they didn't have the production units and petapixel kind of surprised me uh you know they they said the flare control was actually a pretty darn good they were surprised and I'm very surprised because when you look at the spec sheet for the camera, it doesn't have any lens coatings. There's no lens coatings at all. I mean, not one. And uh, I commented on Matt Irwin's channel, and I said, you know, to me, it's like, okay, if if you're if if you're on a budget and you're not looking for world class images, but respectable images, okay, uh, this may be the only camera you need for vacation shots with your kids and family or, or your kids high school soccer game or your, you know, whatnot, because a lot of that stuff, when you're shooting, you're shooting in typically shooting in, in uh, pretty bright situations uh, where uh, you're at that 400 and you're at F8. uh, It's not going to kill you. And nowadays, too, with all the noise reduction software and everything else and the quality of the cameras that we have now, if you're shooting at F8 with that lens, I mean, everybody was tooting their horns about the the F8 Canon glass at one time not too long ago, and they didn't seem to have any problem uh, applauding that lens, you know, being F8. 
Uh, I don't think it's as big a deal as it as it would have been, obviously, 10 years ago or whatever, you know. Um, but I, I think it's a great, really, a, a, a one-stop shopping for, uh, for someone that really is just taking pictures of their kids and their family growing up or whatever. And they go on vacation, you pack one lens and... And and you're good and you're good to go. Um, I mean, it's not it's not it has some weather resistance sealing and some and, and some dust proofing and that's why I kind of feel at least if they put the fluoride coating on it, you could say the water would beat up on the outside of the lens and you could wipe it off easy and stuff like that. You know, so I'm a little disappointed disappointed that they didn't do that, but. Um, but for the price point, and the, and there's no full frame lens with that zoom range out there. Period. What do you guys think? Is it like do you think it's a joke? Do you think it's for a very niche market? Uh, what are your feelings? Well, I think it's for I think it's for the you know the the family folks and and for the you know soccer mom and kind of do all everything. I mean, I wouldn't buy one, but yeah. And for the price point at twelve ninety nine. You know, that's all you need, it, right? It, it'll, sell, it'll sell well. Yeah, and I think also as well is it's a much more consumer entry level lens, which is which is great, right? I mean, Nikon glass is beautiful, and I mean the price point can sometimes be a little bit scary for some people. They're just getting into the system, so for them to have really one sort of all around lens for beginners to have when they first come over to the the Z system, now it's kind of like okay, cool, like I've got something I can get that I'll be able to use for everything to start, and then I can start buying more stuff. It's almost like the gateway drug to the Nikon ecosystem of lenses. Yeah. Well, you. You think about it, the range kind of replaces like three lenses. <laughs> so, easily. so so easily replaces three lenses now now and obviously if those three lenses were let's say higher level lenses or whatever, they'd be you know, you add up the cost of three lenses, you'd be like you'd be like three times higher than what this thing costs. So if you're really on a budget, I mean this may be this may be the perfect answer for you. And and, and Great for a first lens, right? Right. Yeah. Nothing wrong with it as a first lens. And then as you and then as your your demand the demands on yourself uh always uh get higher as time goes on and then you know then you start buying other glass, you know. Well the first two lens I bought with the Z5 was the 24 to the 50, which was the kit lens, and then the 24 to 200. And then I learned about the primes and stuff, but that was later. But uh so what is the perspective from somebody like Joy or Wayne as a lens for video? You know? I mean, I have never used a super zoom a lot for video, but I will say that like my 20 to 60 kit that I use with the variable aperture, I quite like it. You know, I, I don't know if I would necessarily take it to a, a client shoot, but just for run and gun, sort of doing some street photo video sort of combinations in good light. I mean, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, if you're doing street photography as well and you don't want to change lenses a ton, that could be perfect i mean I'm, I'm kind of waiting for the 35 to 150 um sam yang for the l mount to come out that's going to be kind of my all-around lens i'm just yeah it hasn't been released yet but um yeah yeah i mean you you're you're doing you know you know i, I don't want to i don't want to pigeonhole you joey so slap me in the head if i if i pigeonhole you here but i mean obviously you do a lot of street photography and if you're doing street photography you're typically not using a long, long zoom like that anyway. <laughs> no, like typically said, not. <laughs> 35 to 150 or in the Nikon world, the 24 to 120 is like an ideal street photography lens and general purpose walk around lens. And, uh, um, but, uh, like I said, but if you're, you're on vacations and you got, you got the kids on boogie boards and in the ocean, you know, uh, coming in with the surf and they're out there as a way out there a ways that that extra reach with that zoom would be handy, you know, for those vacation shots. And then, you know, if you have all the kids just uh, stuff in their face, eating watermelon at the picnic table or something at lunchtime, you know, you could fit the whole crew going down to the 24 millimeter end. So that, that lens may be pretty uh, attractive for, family photos. I, I think that's its high point, really. I think that's its that's its niche. That's that's its high point, I think. 
Is it 24 or is it 28 to 400? Uh, I think it's, well, maybe it's 28. 28. 28. 28. Uh, yeah, 28 to 400. I'm sorry. 28 to 400. Yeah. Uh, I, I look at that, like I said in the chat, it's a travel lens. There's certain places you don't want to take your expensive gear to get stolen. It's one lens. Let's say for me, for example, I don't want to go out in the outback of Mongolia with all this stuff. I just want to travel light. It'd be kind of cool. From the videos I've been seeing, you know, the quality is pretty decent for what it is. And the fact that it's got VR in there, and of course, we know what most of these the new uh, Z cameras have synchro VR, so you get the 5.5 stops. The ZF can give up to eight, but I think it's still going to be 5.5 with the synchros. But that's still pretty good at the 400 end. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> See, Eva has a really good point. It is, uh, it's, it's less than six inches long, so she can get it into stadiums, you know, for shooting in the daytime. But see, there's not an awful lot of difference between 6.3, which is Gustavo and I have a number of primes that are 6.3 and 8. <clears throat> you know. <clears throat> yeah, so so it it sounds like like it, it's it's fairly dark, but you know, go, going from four to eight, that, that's two stops. It'd be nice if it was if it was bit better. But yeah. better cost more, and we that's not the use for, for this. You know, they want something that you can get into easily. When my first DSLR was the D7000, and I bought the, the 28 to 300, and this would be equivalent to it. You know, and I was using it for baseball because I needed the reach. You know, and uh, it's going to work good for sports, and somebody's got noise in the background. Yeah. yeah. When when I had when I had the D100, uh, D100, 200, 300, you know the APS-C, uh, you know early early uh, digital cameras from Nikon. Uh, I had I bought the DX 18 to 200 lens, and that lens was was actually pretty good. It wasn't that bad. I mean, it was just a a good general purpose lens that. Wasn't going to break the bank. I mean, I think to this day they still sell it. I think it's somewhere in the neighborhood of six hundred and fifty dollars. You know, so it's like, uh, but of course, you know, then you go full frame. You got a DX lens, and then you're then you're dumping your DX glass, and you're getting full frame glass. So you have to keep that into consideration if you're if you're an APS-C person, and you say, well, you know, I think I'll go full frame at some point. Then you're probably better off buying the full frame glass and and putting it on your APS-C camera and uh, not buying too much DX glass to begin with, or, you know, or buying the cheaper DX glass. Um, the third That's pretty much what I did with it. Sorry, Jeff. Yeah. Pretty much what I did with it, uh, my DX, D200, 300, 500. I had full frame lenses, not DX lenses. Yeah. So I figured at some point you would go there, but I never went there and DSLized. I only went when I went over the mirrorless. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's like, uh, but, you know, for those that, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with this because, uh, you know, I mean, I, I shot wildlife uh, with the DX cameras and took advantage of the crop factor and, you know, so on and so forth. And, and I understand why people want a pro level APS-C camera. Uh, they, they, don't, they don't have to spend as much money on their glass to get the range. Okay, they don't have to spend as much on their body. Uh, it's a cost. It's a cost point thing for a lot of people too, and it gets, it gets them in the game. They get good pictures. You know, I mean, typically, obviously, typically, they're, you're talking a 24, 24, 24 and a half megapixel camera at this point. But uh, there's a market. There's a market for that. I mean, if you got people. Just like there's a market for a lot. I know, I know a handful of people that that love their Olympus uh, Micro Four Thirds cameras, and and because they got they they'll sit they'll be sitting there they'll be sitting there you know zooming as far out with me as as I am with a with a say a, the 500 PF on my camera and their and their lens is like this long, you know. <laughs> so. So they they go on trips and they can their kit doesn't weigh anything you know so it, there's it's good to have choice and you know it may not be our personal choice you know we all have different you know qualifiers you know what we want or what's important to us but I think choice there's nothing wrong with choice 
and as long as and, and as long as you or I can find what we want, we shouldn't have to. We shouldn't care so much about whether that other stuff exists because somebody else wants that stuff. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, and we may get surprised. The the twenty four to one twenty, which we all love, of course, is a S lens, but it turned out to. I, I mean, that's a, a a range that we would have not considered in the past. Right? Oh, the old the old F mount twenty four to one twenty. Not good. Flat out stunk. Exactly. So so anyway, Eva is going to order one or pre-order one. So we will get a review from Eva. Okay. So Eva, we're going to put you on the spot now that once you get that lens, we want to see 12 images and we want you to come on the show and we're going to put you on the panel. And we're going to have you do your do a little dissertation about your experience with the lens and share your photos. How's that? You willing to do it? Go for it. Come on. Say you'll do it. So you want her to unsubscribe? <laughs> Put her on. All, all of a sudden, wait, did she leave the chat now? Maybe she oh, left. she's not here anymore. <laughs> hey, Jeff, Chuck and yeah. Joe want me to take off. And if you saw that note, note in the chat. Oh, Joe, okay. you're taking off. Have a good one. Um, yeah. I'm glad you have a sense of humor, and I was able to pick on you a little bit. I mean, I, 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 yeah, I made a mistake. <laughs> I made a mistake, and uh, no, I appreciate it, Jeff. And uh, really nice seeing y'all. Have a great, uh, have a great week. We'll see y'all next week for the photo review. Make sure y'all send in your photos. We're gonna judge them harshly. I'm kidding, no. Uh, but it'll be really nice to see you guys' photos. And Chuck, great seeing you. And um, yeah, Roy, if you manage to uh, watch this cast, just know that we're all thinking about you and looking forward to seeing you. Hopefully, come back soon. You know, but take your time and you know, get well, get healthy, and we'll be able to see your collection hopefully super soon. Joey, you have a, you have a good night. Continue the good work. And you know you could have had a perfect comeback, but see you're you're getting you're getting a little sloppy, my friend. You know when I picked on you a little bit, you should have come right back with a zinger, and you should have said, "I did that on purpose, Jeff, to see if you were going to notice." <laughs> <laughs> That's what you should have said. <laughs> no, no, but it's good. I got I gotta get I gotta get caught up on these things, right? Yeah, at least it was a constructive piece of feedback though sometimes i'll get one that's just like the music was so loud i couldn't hear him good so I was like, oh, oh, why? <laughs> all right guys good night take it easy good joe, night, joe. Have a good one and a joe yeah, chuck is kind of hard i think it's yeah chuck uh, is gonna drop out too chuck you leaving us no I, i'm not gonna lay I'm not gonna be here long yeah. You, why don't you you have any 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 subject in particular you want to talk about? No. <laughs> uh, you going to share who your barber is with the rest of us? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> see, I'm a lost cause. I go to the barber. Well, see, I'm the kind of guy. If you go to the barber shop, they charge you by the hair. You know? <laughs> they, they, they don't give you a haircut. They charge you by the hair. They look at you and they go. Well, I cut off three hairs. That'll be that'll be thirty dollars, please. Um, <laughs> that, they'll ask you to wash it first. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did you wash your hair before I before I put my hands on your head? You know. <laughs> what well, what was that? Everybody loves Raymond. Remember when his when his dad was was cheating and and getting information from Ray for betting on the side, and he was making money. And then, and then because he had some money in his pocket, you know, he he takes Ray to the barber shop, you know, and says, I'm going to pay for you to get a shave, you know, the old fashioned way. They got the leather strap and they got the, the single blade, you know, and the guy puts the hot towel on his face and he screams and yells, you know, how hot it is and everything. I mean, that's <laughs> that would that would be what would happen to me. I'd sit in the chair and they'd throw that hot towel on my bald head and I'd be like, ah. <laughs> well, barber that I had before he retired, you know the massage thing where they put on your neck. Oh, best! Oh man, so, where do you go? I never got no massage at a barber shop. <laughs> <laughs> and he was cheap too. You sure you're you're talking the same store? The Wait, same this is Texas, so everything's cheap here. I think you went in the wrong door. You went into the other place. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one, one thing is you, you, you uh, 
look at uh, uh, at uh, the, the 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 videos from Randall. He's now wearing hats as well. Oh. You, you're looking good on the cowboy hat, Randall. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. Get that app that you're using to do that. Uh, <laughs> exactly. Do you now? Do you you wear you wear boots with spurs yet? Uh, no, no, no. Believe it or not, when I was a very young man, you know, like two years ago, uh, <laughs> I uh, I used to. <laughs> You guys still haven't gotten that one yet. Uh, I actually wore cowboy boots, and I was always tall. I was always over six, you know, six six two, six foot two, and so I'm in high school, and I'm wearing I'm wearing cowboy boots. You know, the cowboy boots had big heels on them. You know, I mean that, yeah. that probably made me like six five or, or or better. You know, and uh, I don't know why I I went through that phase. I didn't wear the cowboy hat, but I wore I wore the cowboy boots and I liked wearing the cowboy boots for some reason. But uh, I certainly well it gave me the advantage that I was looking down at most people, which was kind <laughs> of <laughs> I, I could just picture Jeff in a four inch stiletto. Yeah, well these these these, these, these had these had massive heels. They weren't skinny little ones. If, if, I, if, I wore, if I wore something like that with my weight, those those little stilettos would snap off and I'd break my ankle. So that wouldn't work out too good. <laughs> that, that's another thing is uh, finding a shoe place to, re, you know, if you have some good shoes, you get a good shoemaker to recover them. And they're disappearing just like earlier in the chat, they're talking about finding people to replace uh, cameras and grandfather clocks in my case. So yeah, that trade is just going. Yeah, find a find a good watchmaker, find a good watch repair guy too. We have we've some. Got but one. Yeah, we've got two in Calgary. You know. Yeah. It's just getting harder and harder and harder. You know, it's too bad. It really is. I mean, if I was, I told my wife, I I said to her the other day, you know, after after talking to that gentleman about the Konica and. uh feeling bad, you know, with this situation, obviously, and not being able to, to go back to working on cameras anymore. And I, I said, you know, I says, if I was 40, if I was 40 years old and I had some extra time, I would love to learn camera repair. But at, at my age, like now to learn it, you know, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. I mean, it would be, you know, it's, it's just a little too late in life to to get that ingrained and, and try to learn something like that. Cause that's not an, that's not, I mean, I do some minimal camera repair and I'm very good at, at making an old camera look as close to new, you know, cosmetically. I'm very good with cosmetics and I'm, um, and I can fix some things, but I'm not, I, I ha don't have the desire because I don't have the, um, you know, if you have to go on in the innards and, uh, and do a lot of stuff internally on a camera, you have to take the whole, all the leatherette off the camera body because all the screws are hidden under the leatherette. Like if you, if you look at old, um, like folding cameras from the 1920s or even, even, uh, uh, even some like, um, what do you call it? The Voigtlanger Bessa cameras. Uh, yeah, you see all you, you're looking at the, the you're looking at the skin, you know, of the camera, and you see all these lumps. And you go, what are all those lumps? You know, what what's that bump there and that bump there? And those are all the screws that are underneath the leatherette. You know, they're not necessarily uh, flathead screws that are, you mm -hmm. know, what I'm saying. You don't have enough thickness in the in the body sometimes on those back panels to do, use a countersunk screw. So you have a round head screw or whatever, and, and the leatherette is all bulging where those screws are, you know. So you got to be able to take the leatherette off, and you got to take it apart, and you got to re-glue it, put it back on, hope you don't tear it, taking it off. It's like I'm not, I'm not ready to dive into that, uh, that level of uh, camera repair uh, at my age. <laughs> so, so let me ask you a question, Jeff, because you probably researched that. Since you got your cap, as I complimented in your in your video, and you have that square uh, hood, yep, correct. And the new lens happened to have also a square hood. Now, I, I, here for the discussion here. Oh yeah, what is the advantage to having a square hood? Did we know? Is it better? Or it, 
why the cabra has a square hood? Well, you know, a lot of a lot of video, a lot of cinema cameras use square hoods. Well, they have the barn door. So barn door for, type. For there must be some reason behind it. I I don't know if for a conventional camera lens, you know, that it really matters. Uh, I maybe they were just looking for a different look, you <laughs> well, know. Uh, because in the old in the old days, most of the lens caps, most of the lens hoods were um, were uh, were metal, and they were uh, square. Oh, you know, okay. back in the back in the you know fifties and sixties, you know. Okay. Or even here, something like, even the Raleigh. Like I'll give you an example. Even the uh, here's the here's the here's the lens hood for the what they call the uh, taking lens on on a Raleigh flex. It's square. It's it's square. I'll see we got to the one that Randall was showing. And that's 1950 and that's 1950s. That's like mid 50s. Exactly. And, okay. and it's and it's and it's and it's different bayonets that are in and out and the yeah, round. I mean, it, it, it had it had a, a like a bayonet mount on it. Oh, okay. Yeah. You know. Um but uh yeah, I don't I don't know if there's a technical benefit from it. It would be interesting if somebody knew that. I don't. Somebody had said on one of the um, videos that the design of it allowed the front element to get closer if used for like micro purposes. Um, oh. And I guess a bayonet, uh, sorry, a pedal type hood or the fully round one usually are deeper. This one isn't as deep. Okay. That's what he was saying. A shallower, a shallower hood. Yeah. Yeah. It and didn't I guess look the rectangular shape probably yeah. helps. Yeah, it didn't. It didn't look very deep. And that one in the Nika uh, is metal, correct? Yes. But it, yeah. and it looks like in the video, it looks like chrome, like the lens. So, it, handsome lens and hood combination. Yeah, it, it was. Let me tell you, it. I mean that that putting that together to kind of match match exactly what came out of the factory on that camera was a royal pain in the you know what and uh because i mean i made out phenomenal with the body that was that was a no-brainer i mean i i wasn't like sitting there looking for that particular camera i was aware of its existence because i read about it in the nikon 100 th <laughs> 100 years of nikon they actually have pictures of the nika cameras in that book and um uh, but uh but when I saw the shape it was in, I'm like, I, I don't care if I, I mean, as a, as a collector too, I said, I got to get that camera. And then, but then the problem was finding a, finding a lens and, and know what's interesting about lenses from the fifties and people might not realize this, the lens processes in the fifties, a lot of the 50 fifties lenses. And I'm talking even the ones you'd say, Oh, they, they make perfect lenses like the, the Leica lenses or lenses for Hasselblad or the real high-end stuff, what was considered acceptable because it was just part of the process at the time. You know, they're, they're still learning how to do, how to improve glass manufacturing, right? So a lot of those lens elements in those cameras from the 50s and the 60s had air bubbles in them. So you're, look, you're looking, you know, you know how... You'll go to buy a. You, you'll go to look at a lens, and they'll they'll click the flashlight, and they'll shine it through both ends of the lens, and you're looking at it, and you're looking for dust. How many dust specks are in it, or whatever, or if there's any anything like that. A lot of those lenses had air bubbles in the glass due to the processing of that era. <coughs> that was considered acceptable. That was not a defect. Wow. Those lenses were shipped and sold with the air bubbles in them. <clears throat> I had uh, one of my salesman friends, uh, he sold a Hasselblad lens with uh, an air bubble in it. And wow. he figured if it made it past Hasselblad quality control, which obviously it did, it, it must be good. Yeah. Well, the customer didn't like it, but... Well, well, well. you know, if, if you can fly a plane that the bl a door blows out, why not? Well, you, you you look at any any lens. I don't. It doesn't even have to be a lens from the fifties. You look at a lens that you that maybe you bought and it's only ten years old. You're going to see dust inside the lens. 
there's going to be dust inside the lens. But the but unless it's like huge, huge, large dust specks, it does not. It it's not going to show up on your image. It's you know you can you you're not going to rip the whole thing apart to get rid of the dust. And and what's weird is is I I read. Somebody who did lens repair made a comment because I, I think with this new Nikon lenses, everybody everybody automatically says, "Oh, you know, when you have a lens that extends like that, and you and you go when you bring the lens in, it's going to suck in all the dirt and the dust and the rain droplets and everything else." And the guy said he took a took apart so many lenses in his life, and he says, "Believe it or not." The cameras that don't even extend at all, lots of times, have more dust in them than those lenses do. Mm. <laughs> so, so uh, John, you're taking off. Have a good one, my friend. And ha happy Easter. Well, he's already had his Easter, right? Because he's he's way yeah. ahead of us. Is he's that... having Easter now. He yeah. had his he having his Easter now. Yeah. Um, but the. Uh, so, so yeah, that whole that whole dust thing is. I mean, I've taken some lenses apart and cleaned individual elements. I have the tools to take the the lenses apart, um, especially the older ones. Uh, you got to be really, really careful. And and the the the, the thing that kills you is um, <laughs> that that that, it, that you buy anything old is fungus. Okay, you can have yeah. you can have fungus that looks like a thread and it looks like it's like floating in there. That's that's probably salvageable. But if the fungus has been in there for a long time and actually etches its it actually etches the glass, it, it and and it will have an effect on your image. So uh, when you have that white white spores and white uh, weird, weird weirdly shaped strands of white don't buy that lens if, if you if you could tell and it's and, and if you see it in person if you look at enough lenses and i've looked at a lot of them you you can actually remove uh you can actually remove the spores you can remove the spores as long as it hasn't etched into the glass but if it's etched into the glass you're screwed it's really really hard to tell when you're looking on something online whether it's etched its way into the glass or not so it's uh Definitely. I've yeah. seen a few videos lately where people have been uh, taking lens apart to clean them and uh, put them back together to get rid of fungus. So there's some people out there that can actually do that. You can do that. Times, you got you got to use hydrogen peroxide. Yeah. Because sometimes so you wonder like why these lenses are sale if they have slight fungus in them, and it's like because you can still use them and you can still get them cleaned up. That's why they're still for sale. Yeah, but the it, the hard thing though is visually looking at it from a picture. It's sometimes sometimes you could kind of feel confident that it's cleanable, and other times you might get it and then you got to send it back. You realize it's etched the glass. You send it back. You don't want it, but it's uh, but yeah, you can, it is cleanable. You just put it in uh, in hydrogen peroxide, let it soak for a while, and gently, you know, gently. Uh, flush it with that and it'll get rid it'll get rid of it and then then uh clean it with regular you know lens cleaning fluid and um be careful to it back together i always wonder why like um keh would sell lens with some fungus i mean they have a repair shop why not just clean up everything i'm i'm very disappointed lately in keh the last two camera bodies i bought from them i sent back and uh and 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 and, and and for and with both of them, when you took the both of them, I, I didn't get them with. I, I think one I got with a lens on it, and one I got was just the body only. But irregardless, okay, I took the lens off or I, or I took the body cap off. It's like the mirrors were filthy, the focusing oh. screens were filthy. It's like that is stuff that they could clean easily before they sell a camera and to me there was no excuse and and these were cameras that were rated you know excellent these weren't cameras oh, that no. were rated these were not cameras that were rated you know fair or bargain or whatever these were lent these were either camera bodies that were rated ex plus or whatever you know and you should not get a camera from any used reseller that has filthy mirrors 
and 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 dirt all over the focusing screens, and and and, and especially and you, if they're rated high. You know, they should be putting new foam seals in the camera, new foam new foam on the mirror. You know, uh, th that stuff doesn't cost a lot of money. You know, that that's just some minimal stuff they should be doing. And and I sent two cameras back to them, and and then when they sent me back cameras that were rated the same. They were still dirty on the inside. I had to clean them, which still ticked me off. But fun, the funny thing was, the rest of the camera looked would look better than the one that was rated the same that I got the first time. It's like, <laughs> it's like ah, you know, what's your criteria, guys? What's your criteria? So be very. I would look on the outside, not on the inside. Yeah, I mean, this is big. You know, buyer beware on and everything that's used, man. Buyer beware. Be really careful. Um, hey, uh, I'm really, I'm gonna hit, uh, hitting time to go head to, head to bed. All right, Chuck. Thanks Hi, for Chuck. coming on, my friend. You're looking good. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Thank yeah. you. Um, you have you have a well try to have a good a, try to have a good Easter. I mean it's horrible that Maribel isn't home. I, I just think that's that's I'll say the word sucks. That's bad. It's, it's, it's just <laughs> yeah, sucks. it's okay. We 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 get a long history of doing, doing uh, nothing or being no, away from each other. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but still, you know, it's uh Really good to see you, Chuck. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hopefully, hey, you know, it would be wonderful. You know, join us for an hour next week when we do the photo review. That would be great. I, I, I might try to do that. I'm going to try to send a picture to. Okay. All right. All right. Good night. All right. Well, thank you very much, Chuck, for coming on. And it was great talking to you today. And I hope to talk to you many more times. And just in the future. future. Yep. Yep. Thank you, sir. Hi, Chuck. How about hey, Jeff, I'm going to take off myself. Okay, Wayne. It's my last hey, day. Got some last minute things to do before we hit the Thailand tomorrow. So I want to take care of that, shop and whatnot. So, okay. see everyone. Well, thanks. Thanks for coming on, Wayne. We hadn't seen you in a while. So it was good to see you again. I hope you're, you know, you, you go in there for a, a long period of time. Yeah, I've been there for two months and then off to, Mong off to Mongolia and okay. uh, at the end of May. So for the summer again. Well, so. hey, happy happy travels and uh, enjoy your time. Have a good time. Thanks, guys. Take care, everyone. Everyone in the chat. Yep. And hopefully Bye. Roy gets better. We can see Roy back in here soon. Okay, thanks a lot. We wish you well. Have a good time. Right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Later. And, uh, and once again, thanks to Chuck for coming on. Maribel, uh, nice is nice of you to to log in, and uh, it it's it's horrible that you're still in Raleigh. I mean, that that just as I said, I'll, I won't be polite. I'll say that sucks ten times over. That's that's not that's no fun. Um, but uh, you guys are troopers, and uh, I'll always remember uh, us meeting in person, and that was uh, that was a special moment for me, and uh, I'll always remember that. And hopefully, sometime uh, I'll I'll get to meet you guys again sometime. I hope, uh, or or maybe you know, eventually when you do move to Tennessee, take a little, take an exit or two early, and swing through Myrtle Beach quick. <laughs> 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 so, uh, yeah, the. I, I, um, even though the show, you know, typically we go till till two in the morning. Uh, I am going to try to shoot in the morning. We're having we're having our Easter meal in uh, in the late afternoon, uh, like four or five o'clock, um, and and we purposely uh, uh, we put it out. We normally do it like at two in the afternoon. But I says let's push it out. It's going to be a beautiful day here today, and we haven't had too many. Beautiful days, uh, beautiful weekends in Myrtle Beach for a long time. This is the first Friday, Saturday, Sunday that we where we've had three days in a row with no rain, and uh, in a long time, like in months. So I'm gonna sneak out and try to take some pictures tomorrow, even if even if I have one eye closed when I'm doing it. I'm, I I just I haven't shot in over a week, and uh, between my foot injury that I had, you know, last week when I was on the show, and that didn't go away until like Tuesday morning, and 
and then I had some some home some home maintenance stuff going on this week where I had people coming out, you know, pressure washing the house and the driveway and all that kind of stuff and my heating and air conditioning getting checked out. So it tied me up at the house. I wasn't able to get out and shoot. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to sneak out tomorrow morning. Uh, even if, like I said, even if I'm half in the bag from the show, I, I got to get out and shoot. I'm, I'm really getting it. I'm getting antsy. <laughs> I'm getting antsy. And uh, and Gustavo uh, will will have to try to find Randall when he goes to Texas. That could be you and you know we could have made a contest. You and Ava, we could have been a we could come up with a prize, and whoever finds Randall first, you know, wins a prize. You know, <laughs> Randall doesn't want to be find out. He needs to chase his eclipse from there. <laughs> yeah, right. it's not far away. Um, all I have to do is go to Bernie. You know, if I can. Yeah, and I'm thinking uh, closer to Kerrville, but uh, yeah. But um, but you are in the south side of uh, of yeah. Um, it's uh, well, actually, it's west. west. Okay. okay. Well, that's yeah. good. It'll be like a northwest. Yeah. So uh, I have already have a couple of uh, places picked out. One is at one is off of 281 near uh, Johnson City, so that's another place. It's by Fredericksburg. So uh, if you take the triangle, uh, 281 is like north south, I 10 is east west, and then you have uh, Kerrville, and then you cut up this way to um, let's see, Bernie, Kerrville, Fredericksburg, and then there's Austin. Yeah, that Fredericksburg seems to be a good location. Yeah. I figured I'd put you on the big screen, uh, Randall, so that all your hand gestures, we could follow the map. <laughs> yeah, I, I was, well, you, know, you, you, you could do one of these. You could, you, could, you could say, and then you get to the mountain, and then you got to go over the mountain, and then you got the river. And you gotta go through the river. And then... <laughs> so uh, I, I don't know what my heritage is. I was adopted, but I think I'm part Italian. You know, so you talk with hands, or you're Greek, or something. You, you, you have to talk with your hands. The only problem is with certain Nikon cameras, you get out of focus when you go to the hand. It's like short <laughs> product. You, and then it doesn't come back into focus when you remove the hand, and then you have to mess with that. But, I'm uh, wondering how many. Uh, I mean, is there are there a lot of people in the? We still got 29 in the chat. Are there a lot of people in the chat that are that are anxiously awaiting the Z63, or are you comfortable with what you're shooting now, and you? have no intentions of buying that camera because you just, you don't need it. Uh, I'd be interested to hear what people in the chat, um, whether they even care about the Z63. The, the ZF I'm happy with. The Z8 I love. All right. If I would have had my hands on the Z8 first, I might have forgot about the ZF. And, <laughs> but I, I used the Z62. I had the Z7, Z72. A lot of people don't talk about the Z72 where it can do 8K photos. No one ever talks about it. But, uh, you know, a 45 megapixel camera, it's still good. Um, I don't know. Yeah, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with where I am. I mean, if I if I was shooting professionally and, and I... Um, you know, was earning a living, you know, which I'm, which I, which I don't do, uh, then, you know, then maybe I would buy, um, a refurb Z9. So I have two Z9s. Uh, but with, with me just being a, a serious amateur or semi pro or whatever I want to call myself, I'll, I'll just invent the name, a klutz with a camera, whatever you want to call me. Uh, you having having the, the D850, the ZF, and the Z9. I don't really need it. I, I'm not going to be looking to buy a Z63. Uh, I can I can I could see that you know they're 
there will be a market for it because if it stays within a hundred or two hundred dollars of the of what the original Z six two came out as, I think it'll be an attractive camera for the price, and it'll 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 attract people that you know <clears throat> basically don't want to don't want to lay down the cash for a Z eight or or a Z nine, um, and I, I think they'd be very happy with that camera once it does come out. I mean, it's going to have you know it's going to have. Uh, you know, 6K. It's going to have great video. It looks like it's going to have you know great video specs. It's supposedly still going to be able to do the 120 frames per second. You know, with JPEG. If you if you like like your Z8, your Z9 do. Uh, it's it's going to be able to. It's going to have a mechanical shutter. Some people like a mechanical shutter, so you're going to have a mechanical shutter and you're going to have an electronic shutter. So you can argue you got the best of both worlds, and you're you know you'll be able to shoot 20 frames per second raw with the electronic shutter, uh, which is nothing to sneeze at, you know, with, uh, and so I, I think for a lot of people that have been waiting, uh, and feel that, you know, the Z9 and Z8, you know, were just too, too far at the high end beyond what they need and, uh, with capabilities and beyond what they want to spend price wise, the Z63 might be, in nirvana for them i mean i think they'll sell a lot of them once it ever comes out i mean i just don't quite understand the you well, know they're probably making a, enough for people to buy before they get rid of it they don't want to have yeah, kind of like a paper uh tiger or something where they put out a mount and then it's sold out and then you're waiting oh yeah look, look, i mean funny. well they, they did a great job with the z8 they did a great job with the having enough, having basically really having enough out there for the Z8 to uh, satisfy the initial surge for the most part, and then a very quick recovery time in terms of you know if there if somebody was waiting, they weren't waiting months, they were maybe waiting a couple weeks. Very different story than the Z9 for sure. Yeah, Z9. I mean, I, I, being the price it was at, and and I mean, I think they assumed that because of the price point, it wasn't going to sell as much as it did. But people were so tired of waiting, you know, they were waiting that they they spent the extra, they spent more money, and I'm one of them, I spent more money than I wanted to spend, because I didn't want to wait anymore. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I made the leap, and I did it, you know, and I had to sell a few things in order to be able to get it. Uh, and I'm glad I did. But uh, you know, I, I think more people did that than they expected, and then they then they couldn't satisfy the demand. You know, I mean, not not right away anyway. And it, but uh, you know, yeah, anybody would. You, no one, no one has anything to complain about if they're shooting with the Z8 and the and the or the Z9 and and the ZF. I'll tell you, for all that all the all the BS knocks that that camera got before it ever got released and it's the wrong camera and why is Nikon is Nikon crazy why are they doing that you you find me you find me more than two or three reviews where somebody after it came out wasn't saying how great a camera it was i mean uh, it it really is a fun it, it really is a fun carry carry around camera to to have and it's great in low light too so i mean uh you know, you you ben you ben at you do get benefits still with a lower megapixel sensor. You know, <laughs> for, for low light. And, and we cannot blame Nikon. I mean, they have been rather active, correct? It's not like we haven't had any news. We have actually news and updates and lenses and camera every other week for the yeah. last month and a half. So, so, so there's nothing to complain. I, no, I, think, I mean, yeah. I think there's a shortage of red paint at the moment, you know, for them to come up with a new camera. <laughs> yeah. But but uh, I, I like my my uh, ZF. It's uh, <clears throat> right now I'm using it as a webcam, and it's uh, I've well I, I've had my 800 on it and use it for for portraits, and it works good for that. Is what uh, I will do is uh, I'll. Uh, put a, a low light lens on it when I'm out to to check and to see if there's any aurora there and I'll shoot handheld just to see what what it's like you know it, and it is great for that and, and right now it's like I use it as a webcam and it's a spare camera for me because they always need a spare 
not as if I don't have enough, though. Yeah. <clears throat> but Greg, uh, yeah. Greg's wondering if anybody's interested in the new lens that came out. And and uh, for me personally, just, just because of what I already own, for me, the answer is no. Uh, I've got... You know, I don't really have too many more lenses, you know, too many more lenses. Like I said, there were there were two lenses for this year that were on my bucket list, the uh, the Plena and the 21.8. And I, I recently got the Plena and be honest with you, because of a lot of reasons and a lot of it, part of it being me having some a few little physical quirks here and there and uh and the weather patterns we've had down here, I, I haven't gotten a chance to even use my Plena yet. So I'm really itching to go out and do some street photography with the Plena. I haven't had a chance to do that yet. Uh, but, you know, you get really, I get really, if, if it's during the day, I don't have a problem carrying a, a good camera body with a couple good lenses, you know, on me. But I like to take a lot of a lot of the uh, street photography, um, you know, an hour before sunset, you know, and, and then when it gets in, you know, that twilight period and then and then into when it's dark, you know, and get the illumination on the lighting on the buildings and the storefronts and things like that. And and when when I get into that time of the of the evening, you know, I I don't like to shoot by myself. It's just there's just too many opportunities for somebody to I, I just the world we live in now too many opportunities for someone to try to you know just steal your stuff from you, you know, unfortunately so you, you're you're better when you're with us with at least one other person you kind of have each other's back yeah. you know and, and that's a shame because you know didn't even worry about that you know when I was younger and went wherever I wanted, whenever I wanted, whatever time I wanted. And I didn't worry about anything. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I think the 21, eight is the only other thing on my, uh, you know, unless they came out with a high quality, uh, ultra wide angle lens, uh, not the 14 to 24 if they came out with something, you know, like remember they used to have, was it David? You would know. I was, it was, they had like 17, 17 to 35, was it? And they had an 18 to. They, they've got an 8 to 15. An 8 to 15. Now is that, is that uh, the fisheye at 8 and rectangular at 15, right? Unless you're using Photoshop. If you use Photoshop, it's rectangular all the way. All the way, okay. because it's got the uh, the lens correction for it. Okay, but, but uh, without that, it, it is circular. You know, and at eight, it, you <clears throat> when I'm using it, you either got to you got to hold the camera out so you don't get your gut in the picture. <laughs> at eight, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, the, I guess I might have to put mine on a ladder then. <laughs> Don't put it on the ladder. You get the ladder in the picture. Get the ladder. You, you, you've got to hold. You got to hold it out a bit, you know. <laughs> and, and so you don't get your feet in. But it's it's an interesting lens. Uh, I've used it uh, after dark. And what I'll do is I'll I'll set it up on a tripod high and aim it straight up. <clears throat> I want to set it up high enough so that you could walk around and not get your head in the shot you know because otherwise uh you, you got to duck down and everybody else has got to duck down too but it's uh you get some interesting shots after dark i've got the aurora all the way around you know and uh with the milky way in the middle using it it's not an everyday lens it's something that yeah. you, you take out every so often and but I've almost bought it. I've almost bought it a couple times when they had a refurb on sale on Nikon USA and you know that eight to fifteen. And I'm like, I know I wouldn't use it very often, but you know, there's certain instances where I would I'm like, oh, I'd love to have that lens. Like every once in a while you, you get into a, a domed building or you know, something like that that has great architectural character to it with maybe murals or 
like stained glass or something, you know, on the inside uh, inside of it. And I'm like, I would just lay on, flat on my back on the floor and shoot up at that thing and get that nice circular shot. And I would love to have that, you know, but it's like, uh, yeah, like you said, it's, it's a once in a while use case uh, other than the, wanting the ultra other than using it at 15 without doing the Photoshop stuff, using it at 15 and getting a nice rectangular image, you know, at 15 millimeters, nothing wrong with that. Uh, but I've, I've held, I've held, I've held back on, uh, I've held back on that because I, I have this, this gas syndrome that, that is, 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 is where I'm torn between vintage stuff and modern stuff. And, uh, that's what, uh, I, I try to have a balance and not get too insane. And, and, and I'll tell you in the last, probably the last six months, I've gotten a little too insane. <laughs> uh, and you'll you'll see when you see my next uh when you see my next camera that i'm going to talk about my next show you'll you'll be shaking your head a little but, bit i think but see you've got the 14 to 30 and at the yeah. and at the 14 end you, you've got the duplicate for for the 8 to 15. And yeah and it's uh it, it's i only found out about the photoshop thing when i did uh bit of stuff this year and, and uh, I, I headed out for a, a day or so because I figured it needs some love a and then when I put it into Photoshop and see how Photoshop was uh, was squaring everything off and, and uh, man is is quite the effect you know and it's uh, because uh, you can be <clears throat> inches wherever how far they are away from everything and uh, you get it in focus and the backgrounds in focus and lovely distortion of your perspective. You know, and it, it's great that way. But uh, Luke has a question for me. Yeah, I'm putting it up here on the and, screen uh, right now. <laughs> I, I've got it off of one knob. And uh, I have the, the weather hasn't been that good on the weekends. And I've been doing other things because... I've got to get in there with a Q-tip and paint remover. And as I've been doing it in Anita's garage so that we got decent ventilation. And it is very intricate because just below the brass knob, it's all plastic. And you've got to go over the paint maybe four or five times to soften it up and you don't want to touch the plastic and so it's not something that that i can do in a hurry and um i was uh, and then if you get too high on your on your knob then you start taking the paint off the top and then you don't know what your dial say so it's uh, it's not a job for the faint of hurt yeah, and and when you're done when you're done with it, we'll know if you if you pass the test or not because if the top of your dial has all the numbers written with a sharpie pen, we'll know it didn't work out too well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I might have to get out my engraver. And <laughs> yeah, <laughs> engrave them in and, and and paint it back. You know. <laughs> You'll be calling up Nikon Parts and say, "Can you just sell me a couple knobs?" He said, "Can you sell me some new knobs?" Yeah. How much is it going to cost to fix this? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I don't know how this happened. I got it like this from the dealer. <laughs> yeah, and they say it was the dealer, Richie. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got it from I got it from Richie. Yeah, it was Richie's <laughs> camera. <laughs> Yeah. But uh, I think I think we're the only two that have advertised it, you know. But but it, it looks nice the, the the knob that I've got done, you know. And uh, the only thing is I'm using the camera right now, so I can't show you what it looks like. Maybe I'll get a mirror. Yeah. But anyway, that's what I'll do. I'll get a mirror and see if this will work. <laughs> All right. All right. Uh -huh. I was, I was going, I forgot to mention this when Chuck was here because I was going to tell him I found the perfect camera for him. 
So I'll, t- I'll tell you, this, this is another, this is from another email that I got. Uh, so I get an e- I don't know if any of you folks have heard, well, you, you know, my friend, Bob, and you know, my B- Bob from Bob, our photos. Okay. Here, here, let me, let me bring David's uh, screen bigger, make his screen bigger here. There you go. Yeah. No, ah, we can see it. Ah, there we go. Yeah. You can see it. Yep. I see some brass tacks there. Yeah, and you don't see the word Nikon either. Yeah. Wow. Anyway. But um, I, I so my friend Bob, he he does a lot of um, old where well where I collect cameras, certain cameras. He collects uh, movie cameras. He collects old movie cameras. So he collects old. Super eight, eight millimeter um, cameras, and um, so he buys his film. He gets he gets his stuff processed by a place called uh, the Film Photography Project, which I think is located either in New York or New Jersey. I think it's somewhere out there. And so they and and I bought a few. I think I bought some film from them once, some one twenty film for some of my older my from my raleigh flex and uh so i got an email from them the other day and they were talking about um they were showing products that they sold and they were talking about a company called lomography company l-o-m-o graphy lomography company and believe it or not and this this is where i wanted to bring this up when chuck was here and i forgot they 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 are they make their own 110 film 110 film which if those of you are old enough will know those were instamatic cameras 110 film in the cartridges that you drop in wow okay so they're making 110 film and the film photography project store sells that film and in march of this year they released a series of 110 instamatics that are their brand name so are we all feeling feeling a little bit old right now? Uh, so the film runs about nine to ten dollars uh, per twenty four exposure roll, and their newest camera, the Lomo Matic One Ten, has two versions. Uh, the low end one is ninety nine dollars. I think the higher end one might be one nineteen or one twenty nine. That has like a removable flash that you could take off the camera body. So I thought that would be a camera that Chuck would really be interested in, you know, wow. an old 110 Instamatic film camera. That that would be perfect. I think Chuck would really No, like that no good photo came out of 110. No. In my opinion. <laughs> well, yeah, but remember 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 how it was used, right? It was it was it was used, well, it was used for the same thing that we just talked about with that new lens. It was used for snapshots of your kids exactly right our, mo- our moms and our dads used those cameras on us <laughs> we, we were the victims we were the victims of that photographic experiment <laughs> but but you yeah, remember it did get worse you had the kodak disc that was worse that's true that was much worse than the 110 cameras <laughs> yeah. the, the even at that time the plastic you think on these 110 cartridges it was so flimsy. I mean, it was. But I agree. The, the that this camera, that this film, that was horrible. But it is interesting that you know, and they 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 keep saying that film is coming back, and and it really is. I mean, it really is. And then, and like Nikon Rumors has been talking about it for the last couple of weeks, where people are scoffing up and trying to find old. Uh, uh, you know, point and shoot cameras that Nikon made, you know, that they no longer make, you know, and then uh, they actually had a, uh, an article about uh, an underwater camera that Nikon made that supposedly is available now for pre-order on Amazon. And, and they thought that that camera did not exist anymore. So they, they don't know whether they, they found a, a, batch. a, a stash of them that yeah. they, that they forgot about or whatever, but the Amazon is, is taking pre-orders for these uh, 
underwater Nikon point and shoot cameras that that are good for a hundred feet down, and they're digit they're digital cameras. They got LCD screens on them. They're good for a hundred feet depth. <clears throat> I think they I think they were going to charge like three hundred ninety nine dollars for them, which is obviously more than probably what they cost when they first came out, but. Uh, <laughs> It's still, still, you know, we were talking underwater photography, uh, you know, uh, just what two, three weeks ago. Uh, so you perfect for snorkeling, right? Good enough for snorkeling. Take a picture with it. Take a picture with either the like uh, David's got the underwater um, the uh, Olympus uh, camera. The Olympus, was it the Olympus Tough, Dave? Is that what it's called? The Tough. Yeah, it's yeah. There you go. Oh yeah, there you go. Yeah, the Olympus that, 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 that. Cuff. So that's an underwater camera right there. Yeah. And uh, so Nikon had something similar to that, and uh, so check it out on Amazon. I think it was the AW three hundred or something like that, yeah. if I remember right. Yeah. Um, uh, Jim uh, mentioned the real nickel dollar that indeed with this one ten because they were all course and long. Most of the picture had the finger. In the, in the, <laughs> usually this finger. Yeah. <laughs> this finger. Yeah. So, so many of our uh, childhood photos, you know, the nice photo and the figure is in there. <laughs> well, how many, you know, you know, when I, I, I can't tell you how many images that I found going through photos uh, where where I only had like three quarters of a head, exactly. you know, your, your head's chopped off, you know, or somebody in the picture, the head's chopped off. And I was, I was usually the tallest person in the picture. So the, the shorter people, they, they had their heads in the picture and mine was, <laughs> mine was chopped off right about here. <laughs> and you're wearing your cowboy boots. You know. <laughs> wearing my cowboy, my cowboy boots. Yeah. That, that put me over the frame line in the camera, you know, chop my head off. <laughs> Well, they want everybody would be tiny. Great. Go further, further, further. <clears throat> well, you know, like a camera. Well, here's a good like Jeff and Leslie. This is a good point. You know, a camera like David just showed, or the or the the Nikon one that they're saying that you're going to be able to get is perfect if you want to get those pictures where half the image is underwater and half the image is above the water. <clears throat> yeah. Really fun. Really fun for that kind of stuff. Yeah, of course. Yeah, the, the, this one. Is a TG four, and I oh. have a uh, and I have a TG five, and and now OM Systems has come out with a TG seven, so yeah. there's got to be a six out there too, and and uh, these are good down to fifty feet. No, I'm not going to go snorkeling down that far, <laughs> and I don't want to go down that far. Well, if you're down that far, you failed the snorkel test, and you're you're basically sinking to the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> yeah. But the camera still works. <laughs> but the camera still works, yeah. <laughs> they'll have they'll have all your shots as you were getting ready to hit the bottom. <laughs> yeah. And it shoots video too. And it has a built-in GPS. Yeah, I know I know that, that Nikon one was that said it shot 4K video. Yeah. That's pretty good. Pretty good. So the latest uh, TG7 is fifty dollars off. Until after tomorrow. What's so, it selling for now? Uh, then? 500, 500. Yeah. $50 off. So yeah. we got one more day. <clears throat> so, yeah. I, I've been looking at that camera. So, very interesting. And, yeah. and then I've been also looking at the FM3A. So uh, they have a camera store up in Austin where it's used. And for fourteen hundred dollars, I'm thinking about it. So it comes with the fifty millimeter. But, but Jeff, I mean that camera you just did the review, correct? The Nikon. I mean, you have to look from one view, uh, one view to get the focus, another another view to compose. Yeah. <laughs> then you you have to remember whether you. You, the, you want your film or not? Come on, <laughs> come on. 
Hey, that, that was that was that was that was advanced in that in that time frame. Oh, that, for sure. I mean, those were the compromises they had to make. Well, that's why time. that's why when Roy Roy said Roy would always say because I because I have quite a few range finders. Yeah. Now, yeah. now, now, now the thing. The, well, the thing with the one I showed did the did the video on you know for this Thursday night yeah, it yeah, came yeah. Out at midnight Thursday, and then I did a preview and I kind of showed it to you guys. I think last. Week uh, last last uh, show the last show that that was when um, if you fast forwarded not too many years uh, that was I think that camera I think it said it was 1956 I believe I believe 56 but anyway a, a year or two after that you started getting uh, rangefinder cameras where. Um, the the image that you had to match up <laughs> where you had to lay you know have the images lay on top of each other to confirm focus was they had a mirror system in the camera where now you only had to look through one eyepiece you didn't have to look through them separately so you could compose and focus through the same through the same eyepiece so that that was like the 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 next uh, futuristic rangefinder camera where exactly. you still you still focus the same way, but you only had to look through one viewfinder, and you would have what they call the focus patch, and it could and it was normally like a a different color, like centrally located in the viewfinder. It could be yellow, it could be usually it was yellow, but it could be a different color. It could be rectangular, it could be round, and that's where you would look. You'd look at that patch. And that's where you'd see where, where let's say the side of your building didn't line up. It was like this, and then you'd exactly. focus and you'd get it to line up, and then you'd say, "Okay, now I could take the picture." But at least with those cameras, which were ones that were usually shaped like, uh, uh, give me a second here. Let me find one here. You know, ones ones that were shaped like this. Yeah, exactly. Okay, ones that were shaped like this. You just had the one. You know, you had the one I you know, the one place to look through on the back. Yeah. And uh, and and so that was that's that's where things you know um, moved to over time. But you know, like the, the like some of the disadvantages, like like I said, were you you had limited lens selection. You you did have removable lenses, but you had uh, restricted lenses. You couldn't go past 135 millimeters. You had to buy those separate viewfinders to put on the on the cold shoe if it was anything different than 50 yes, millimeters. Extra cost that you had to spend. So that's why Roy says, "Oh, I hate rangefinder cameras," and then. And, and then, of course, and then, but most of the rangefinder cameras that were that were made, when you when you collectively look at rangefinder cameras, they were not interchangeable lenses. They were they were fixed lenses like this. Exactly. Okay. And a lot of them were. Um, this happens to be a Minolta lens. Um, this is an this is the Ansco camera. This is the Ansco auto set camera, which was actually uh, a Minolta camera that got rebadged for Ansco. And this was the camera that John Glenn took up on the Mercury capsule, Mercury Seven capsule, and took wow. pictures, took slide images of the uh, Florida coastline with. And when they sold when they sold this camera publicly, when this camera got introduced. They included three, I think it was three slides, uh, duplicate slides of the images that John Glenn took from the Mercury capsule when he was going around the going around Earth's orbit. Had you found those? In the, in the I, I have those slides thanks thanks to a, a certain gentleman named Mozman who found them for me and got them for me as a gift. Fantastic. <laughs> uh, he uh you know, he he actually gifted he gifted me the camera as well. Wow! So mm -hmm. so I 
So thumbs thumbs up to him. And and it's a it's a working meter, which is rare because it's a selenium meter. Okay, it's not a so, CDS. So that thing that you're touching now. That's that's the meter. That's the meter, correct? That's the meter. And 99% of them do not work. Wow. This one works. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is a, this has a good story around it. And, uh, and like I said, he, I told him, I told him I had found a guy who was selling it on, on eBay, the slides. And I wasn't willing to pay what the guy wanted for him. And um, I guess Tim, he had, the guy had removed them from the uh, posting, okay. and and Tim found the guy and got a hold of him and said, uh, "I'll give you this much for him or whatever." And the guy and he and and he got it cheaper than what he was asking for, and he and he got them for me, which was really kind of him to do. But they're in this envelope here. I'll, I'll hold it up. Okay. Wow. And, and, wow. and, they are, and they are mounted in, in what, what what film do they use? Kodachrome? They're they're um so it was a series of four slides. You need to make a a show about that camera. Uh, I did, I did. I got yeah. a show about it. No, yeah. that yes, is, I, I, we can we can see through. <laughs> we can see you. Ants go chrome. Ah, okay, okay. You could, well, yeah, I can't really show it where you could see the image, but there, there's four, there's four images in there, and it says the uh, view of the Atlas Mountains and Sahara Desert, coast of Morocco and Atlantic Ocean in the foreground. Wow. One of three sunsets, um, clouds over the Pacific, and the east coast of Florida with the Atlantic Ocean in the foreground, Gulf, Gulf of Mexico in the center background. So, remember, he only did one revolution two years, correct? They didn't allow him to do multiple revolutions, if I correctly remember. But probably Mossman can check me out here. Yeah. Yeah, I, I did a, I did a whole video on this because I yeah, one, no, of my, one of my things for the memories I did like Okay. I got really crazy, and I think I, I actually reviewed like four cameras in one episode or okay. something. And, and you and talk about the you talk about the slides as well. Yeah. Okay, I will yeah. look at it. Yeah. Anyway, that, that's that's cool. Thank but, you, boss. Uh, but uh, yeah, Tim was Tim was very uh, was very generous. I really appreciate well, that. Did, did you see his latest note here uh, on the, the bottom of the chat? Ah. Well, I think I think I have I think I have a slide holder for my scanner. I could probably I could probably scan them on my scanner. I I think this will do a better job though than your scanner will. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> but the uh, but yeah, he was very very generous and got me that, um, and I appreciate it. It was it was very uh, very nice of him to do that. Um, and so, so how do you find out that they they were selling that the original ones they were be selling it with that promo of the four slides? I just I just looked looked at old old documentation and old and old references. You know, I mean, I searched the internet for you know like uh, anywhere where they discuss vintage cameras or whatnot, and I and you, or a good source is you you got like. Uh, um, a Wilk, a, like a, a Wilk, Wikipedia site that's for cameras. Okay. Uh, that talks a lot about cameras, and you can get some information uh, in there. And uh, but I, I spent a lot of time, like every time David Stewart calls me up at home, he let he just says you're on your computer again. I go, yeah, I'm always on my computer when you call me. Uh, <laughs> I'm on the computer way too much. I'm 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 either. I'm either doing research or uh, and educating myself about uh, old cameras, and uh, I have to, I have to slow down. I think I'm up to. I mean, I had a lot more cam. I had a lot of cameras, you know, before I moved, um, but a lot of them were, they weren't cameras that necessarily had any significant uh, historical significance. And I try now to find cameras that 
Um, other than I had the goal of getting every 35 millimeter film camera that I ever owned. Mm. Okay. So I, I owned an OM one. I bought, I got an OM one. I owned a, uh, well, I owned him an old SRT 101, and but my neighbor gave me his SRT 100 close enough. I didn't go out and buy a, a 101, but I had the the one that he gave me. I sent it out for CLA, and I had to get it. I got it repaired, so it works like a new camera now. I had a Fujika ST801. I had a uh, Minolta XGM. So I found all the cameras that I shot when I was in my teenage years. And I got all of them. And then from there, um, I tried to find cameras that were harder to find, told a story, um, you know, uh, you know, just interesting cameras. And it'll be, I'll give you a sneak peek of one that will be in a future video that I just got. I just got the last part I needed for it. John would John would like to see this one. See, I'm gonna I'm gonna compete with Mr. Wu on this this old camera discussion stuff. Because <laughs> you know, John's got Mr. Wu and I just have me, you know, and I don't and I don't have I don't have cases of cameras that I could pull off the shelf and talk about. Um I'm going to show you this camera, which weighs a ton, by the way. What? This is a con. This is a Connie Omega, Omega Flex M. This camera is 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 considered to be scarce. This 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 is the camera I had an issue with, where I contacted that gentleman, and unfortunately, isn't going to be able to repair cameras anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, this camera is very scarce. So it's a four by four type it's of film. A six, it's a six by seven. Wow. Oh, it's okay. a six by seven. So a Raleigh, a Raleigh Flex is a six by six. This is a six by seven. And what's nice about a six by seven is a six by seven without cropping gives you a perfect eight by ten with no cropping. Okay. And at very high resolution because medium format. Okay, it's 120 film, 10 shots per roll. And um, unlike a, um, it had, and, it, and it's not, you look at this and you say, oh, that's a twin, le twin lens reflex camera like a Raleigh. It's not, it's not a twin lens. It's a twin lens, but it's not a reflex camera. It doesn't have a mirror in it. So how do you use one or the other? Your, your image, it's more like a viewfinder camera. I'm gonna take the I'm gonna take the uh, the viewfinder off because right now the viewfinder is one where you you stand up like you look down like a waist finder. Yeah, yeah. You're looking down. Yes. I got one that goes straight out from the back. Okay, I got a different attachment that goes straight out. And I can take the viewfinder off. And the reason it's not a TLR is because the a regular, like a Raleigh, you'd have that flip-up lid exactly. most of the time. You'd have that flip-up lid and you're mm -hmm. looking down, right? Yes. The... Um, the, the the glass that you're looking at your focusing screen your you know your your glass is not going horizontally and on the top it's going vertically on the back <laughs> see yeah but yeah. what lens what lens is it so you, have, you have two lenses on it, whether it be a twin lens reflex or this camera is considered a viewfinder camera because it has no mirror in it. The image you have oh. a, a you have a a a, a uh, it's like a rangefinder. You have two lens you have two lenses. Okay. One of them projects the image right to the back screen. Okay, okay. That you're that you're focusing on. Okay. okay. Oh, wow, that's and a model of all rangefinders. And the other one, 
the bottom the bottom lens is the taking lens and that's the one that's actually the, where the, the image is going against onto the film okay oh my god but on, a, on a tlr the upper lens your viewing lens the the image comes in through the lens it reflects off a mirror and then it directs it onto the glass that's on the top yeah yeah, yeah. going this way yeah wow so this one because of because the glass is vertical okay it's a it's really a viewfinder camera exactly it's a model of all viewfinders and and what's <laughs> neat about this camera is the camera back this this ratchet here this is how you advance the film you have a one you have a 120 back or a 220 back and you want and, I, and you want to advance the film so that you pull it you pull it out it's ratchet you pull okay. it out and you push it back in and it advances the film wow and and the, and the thing is too was they uh what year was that camera me this was in the i'm guessing without looking it up well actually i'll tell you 1968 1968 okay and and now uh, they made Konica made a another medium format camera that was a rangefinder type it was still a six by seven it was a rangefinder type and that and that camera would use the use the same uh use the same grip this, this, this grip you can <clears throat> this grip you can adjust the handle you loosen up the screws you can tilt it you can move it so it fits your hand good and um so what is the shutter the shutter is right here on on this side so you're okay. holding the grip there's your there's your button okay okay uh, on your left hand on your left hand and then your your focus knob is here <laughs> your focus knob is here Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and the lens was how many millimeters? The lens is um, it's one of those that is in meters. <laughs> there, it's a 90 millimeter f3.5, okay. which was considered a normal lens for medium format. So that's probably like a portrait cover. Yes, no, but, that, that'd but, be... but, but similar to the Mamiya C3 or the Mamiya cameras, this, <laughs> this, these, this pair of lenses is removable. I could take the plate off and put wow. another plate on with different lenses. Oh, brother. Which you can't do with a Raleigh Flex. When you buy a Raleigh, they sold it with different lenses. And if you wanted a certain if you wanted a 135 millimeter lens, you had to buy a Raleigh that had a 135 millimeter lens. Wow. If you wanted a Raleigh with a with a 90 millimeter lens, you had to buy a Raleigh, you had to buy another camera with a 90 millimeter lens. This one. I could if I squeeze on these two knobs inwards, I could pop this whole front off and snap on another one with a different with a different pair of lenses. That's crazy. So this this camera is is considered very very scarce, and I had to find parts for it because the this did not this was jammed on the other one did oh. not work, and then you have a see see this on the back. You're gonna say, "What the heck's what the heck's this that thing right here?" Thing? I'm gonna show you what this is. The pinky thing. A plate. It's a plate. If you want to take the film, this is one of the few cameras where, if you want to, if you wanted to change film, if you wanted to change mid roll, you would you would slide this plate in the side, and it would cover up the opening. And you would take the whole back off on the camera, and you could put another back on with a different kind of film. Wow! And this would this would keep it so the film didn't get exposed. It's like a dark slide. You'd slide it in, and it would cover the opening. And then when you're not when you're not using it, it just fits right in the fits right in the in the back of the camera for storage. Uh, this, is, this is a very very rare camera. Not crazy, and um, and and that's why you know once again I bought something because it was I had to find 
some parts. It didn't. It didn't have the slide. I had to find somebody that had a slide. I had to find a back that worked. Um, I had to do a lot of cleaning. Uh, I had to buy. I had to buy a viewfinder. Did the ratchet system now works? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It works. It works fine. I don't. I don't have any film in it, but I can. Uh, wow. And I can hear it. <laughs> yeah. I can. Sounds like a toaster. <laughs> well, I, I have it set on like a two second exposure. Exactly. So that's why it's doing that. But uh, but it works, you know. Wow. So that'll be a, that'll be another photo review down the road. Yeah, the shutter is in the lens, isn't it, Jeff? Yeah, the shutter's in the lens, so you could shoot, you could you could have your flash sync at any shutter speed you want. No rolling shutter. No rolling, <laughs> no rolling, yeah, no rolling shutter. And uh, but it's a it's a it's a uh, like I said, because I can't ever get that fixed. If it breaks, I'm gonna put one roll of film in it. I'm gonna shoot it. I'm gonna say I shot it. I used it. It work. I know it works. I mean, I know it's going to work. I mean, I I just know that without a doubt. But I'm gonna shoot a roll of it at some point in time and get it developed, and um, and then it's gonna be preserved. Wow. Because it's uh, very, very hard to get them and they're very, ex they're very expensive. So t tell us again, what was the maker of the camera? It was a, they called it a Connie dash Omega Flex M. Made so it was made by Konica. Okay. So it's a Japanese camera. Yeah. Made by Konica and they only made it for two years. Wow. And they made it, they made a, uh, a Connie flat. They made a Connie, they call it a Connie 100, I believe. Uh, which was a rangefinder version that used the same film backs and used the same grip. And I think it used the same flash, like on the opposite side of the camera for where, where the handle was, where I was holding the grip mm -hmm. on the opposite side, it had mounting a mounting bracket already there where you can mount a, uh, where they, they call them what the, um, like an old Mets kind of flash. Exactly. That looked like a hammer. Yeah, 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 you know, one of those, one of Thor those, hammer. yeah, one of those, yeah, Thor's hammer, one of those big yeah. flashes. It's a potato masher, potato masher, yeah, that's exactly. it. yeah. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it, it's so that's another that's that's probably the the rarest camera that I have at this point, I think, now, but uh. Like I said, you know, I, I switch back and forth, vintage, new, vintage, new, but uh, new cameras, no, a lens or two, maybe, uh, and and I'm I'm happy. I got I got seven I got seven or eight I got seven I uh, probably seven or eight F mount glasses uh, F mount lenses and seven or eight Z mount lenses, and I'm done. Uh, I mean, I you know I might get one more lens. That's it. I'm I'm happy. I'm done. So, other other than the vintage stuff, as as I see vintage, but you'll I'm not going to tell you what my net what the next week's video is, but it's no, going to no, wait, wait. We wait, we wait. That 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 camera, that camera, is um, let's just say a tad bit older than the one I just showed you. A tad wow. bit, a tad bit older. <laughs> you want uh, one of these as a flash? There you go. This but is a Honeywell. Works. Yeah. And um, if you held a piece of paper up to it with, with printing on it, when you run the flash, it would burn the paper or right where the printing was. It got that hot. No. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh, the, yeah, those old flash units put out a hell of a lot of power, real lot of power. Came out of those things. Yeah, but well, they take a to recharge as well. Remember those up? Bah! Then, okay. Well, like the, this the, uh, battery. I know. Yeah. Well, so, big well, battery. Oh, I'm gonna show you. I'm gonna show you guys. Up, you guys up for me to show you a couple interesting pictures? Yeah, go ahead. You feel like it? 
Yeah. Why not? Let me, uh, I'm just going to show me, uh, show you a few pictures of, uh, of an Eagle shot, a couple Eagle shots. Um, especially since we have for, for a lot of us, Easter is, is, uh, 35 minutes away. Um, I thought it would be appropriate to share, uh, I'm Eagle eating a body. A few, no. a, a few, images, a few images here. So we'll we'll start we'll start with this one. All right. So this is a uh, an eagle perched on top of a cross on the top of a church. Uh, early morning light. So I got a few different. Uh, um, you know, a few different in Moz Man. If you want to bring that with you, you can. I don't want you to have to overpack stuff when you come down come down to see your dad. But if you want to bring that kit, we can digitize the slides. Uh, but anyway, this is the uh, this is one shot here. And then I said, well, let's see if we could do a little better. So then let me get rid of that one and. So then we got a little better. And that was with the 800? That's with the 800. Wow. I like this one. Yeah, I love it. Mm -hmm. And um, now, now then something happened that I wasn't expecting. I didn't really have my shutter speed set for what was about to happen next. Um, but I, it did come out, you know, uh, sharper, you know, pretty sharp, you know, acceptably, I'll say acceptably sharp. Uh, I'll use that term, acceptably sharp. Um, let me, uh, and I, I call this one, um, oh, I had a name for it. What was a good name for this one? Oh, uh, crap. I'm trying to think now. I had a nifty name for this shot. Now I'm forgetting it. <clears throat> I wouldn't call my picture all crap. No. A better title. Yeah. yeah. Oh. I'll probably think of it once I show it. Oof. That's nice. But, uh, you know, oh. so like you said, I wasn't expecting it, so I clipped the wings a little on the, on the top. But I got one where I didn't clip it, but I like this one because it's, it, it's a, a better angle of the bird i mean i have another one where where the wing isn't clipped at all but i don't like the pose as much um but i i like i like this pose so um i like it i don't remember what nifty title i had for this fall from grace or um, <laughs> i had some church 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 themed uh uh verbiage to go along with this uh I uh, think you were mm -hmm. at a decent uh, shot speed that it didn't get blurred, correct? Because that's the problem with that other shot that you had before. You say, okay, one better ISO. So you start lowering your shot speed and then the eagle goes. I, I this believe it or not, this shot, I believe, was only at one eight hundredth of a second. Wow. And okay. I got away with it. And I got away with it. I, I tell you one thing, Jeff, this week... Uh, uh, that that uh, new way that we can switch between the different focus mode, that is very useful. Well, I haven't set that up yet. If you, oh, you set it, it up, yeah, okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you a question then about that. Okay. When, when you, let's put it this way. Right now, my primary focus is my back button on my back button focus. Mm -hmm. And what I do is my back button focus is set for either um, wide area, large or wide area, medium. Okay. So I obtain my focus on my subject with my back, back button focus button. And then I do, as Steve Perry says, I do a handoff. Mm -hmm. I have my shutter button programmed for 3D tracking. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I grab it with the wide area large or wide area medium. And then I hand it off and I switch to 3D tracking and I follow the bird and I take the picture with my shutter button. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So when you when you program another button, and I know how to do it, I know you go into the menu and you basically check the boxes and you decide how many choices do I want to have when I push that particular button. That goes to the shutter. That okay, uh, that's what I'm going to ask you. What what when you when you're toggling that to different? Let's say my first, I, I push it once. It's single point autofocus. It goes to the shutter. It goes to the shutter button. Yeah. Okay. You won't go to the back button button. No. Now that's what I wanted to find out is what it what it was what it's linked to. So 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 for me, what what it was useful for correct is because I, I went this week to photograph the Sand Hill migration in Nebraska. So I drove there six hours, stay overnight. Did one afternoon, one morning, right? And uh, now around the plate river, correct? Where which is where they congregate. They congregate in a smaller. You have like actually probably next year we'll try to go again. You have like ten thousand cranes, correct? Right? And everybody waiting for them to blow off in one at one time. But even when they are in the river, when they have overnight there. You want to photograph, I mean, you have, obviously you're looking for a, you know, photography with a 600 or something like that. You have to select which bird you want to have in focus, correct? Because otherwise the autofocus will go, the random bird that may not be, I prefer. If I want to focus on whichever one is closest to the frame. Well, sometimes not, correct? I actually wanted the closest to the frame because it were, in my opinion, more pleasing to have, you know, the one in the front row, if you want to call yeah. it, to be yeah. focused on the other ones will fall off. Yeah. But no, it was choosing another one because, we, the, you know, the system, whatever it, it brings, in, hey, this is a bird that has an eye, I go for that. <laughs> so, so, so having the ability to, you know, switch to it quickly we, we, without taking my eye from the, from the uh, eyepiece, that, that was useful. Right. So okay. So now, now I I described you how I typically shoot, right? Mm -hmm. If I program a different button, you know, to toggle through the list, yes, and it's going to assign it to my shutter button. Mm -hmm. Does that mean I can no longer, if I use my back button fo back button mode? I can't pass it off to 3D anymore? No, it goes 3D. It, it goes to that other thing? Yes. Yeah, see, I'm not going to like that then. Uh, no, I like it, actually. because it's, I, I actually sometimes... Okay, so I abandon a little bit the the back focus. I was big out back focus person, but I don't use it that much anymore, Okay. Right? So I'm actually using more the shutter, but I still have the 3D in in the back focus. So if I press two, it will trigger the, through the shutter, but it will use the three focus. Now, well, as long, thing, yeah, as long as you hold the back button, well, that's the thing. That's as long the priority. As you hold the back button focus in the shutter button won't override it. That will override when you when you press your if you press the shutter and the back focus. Auto focus, if I correct, that override it. So the one that will dominate is the auto focus 3D that you have in your back. Right. If you have your three, if you have your 3D autofocus program for your back button, that would dominate. Button, and you hold that in and then you push your shutter button, it will still be 3D. That's right. Well, that, that's okay, right. So what I would have to do, if I wanted to use this new thing, mm -hmm. what I would have to do is I would have to set up a, I would, I would have to use a, I would, I would have to change my back button to 3D and then use my shutter button as whatever I want to acquire my initial focus. You know what I'm saying? So if I want to say I wanted to toggle through and I, I toggle, I hit the shutter button three times and now I'm using the full screen mm -hmm. focusing. 
Yeah. Which is what I use now. Right. So then I could then I could toggle through to that focus focus full screen, grab the subject, and then hit the back button and switch to 3D. That's right. And then hold it and then hit the shutter button. It'll still be 3D and take the picture. That's right. So for me to be able to use this new feature, I basically have to change my assignment of my what my back button focus does. Exactly. And then, I have, and then I have to program another function button to use as that toggle. Exactly. Uh, selection. That's all. That's all I got to do, and then it'll work the. And then, and then it'll work the way I want it to work. Exactly, and that's the way I have it. And actually, the recommendation from Steve to use the to use the basically the record button for video. It, yeah. See, right a, now, I have my report. My I have my record button set to to get me into the my menu screen. Well, so. so But so the, now I have now I have to figure out another spot for that. <laughs> exactly, but, but that's the that's the beauty. But I did it that way because for me it works, correct? Because I have it is it, the same finger that you can either do the uh, the ISO or the exposure compensation, or you can switch the the between different focus mode. And I have it the same for the C8 and the C9. So for me, it's working fine. Yeah, I mean, I think I'll use it now that we had this chat, but I have, like I said, I have to just, I just have to reassign my back, back button uh, to 3D. And then I have to pick a button that I'm going to use to, to toggle and then acquire my initial focus with the shutter button. And if I want to go to 3D, exactly. then I push the back button and I and I'll go to 3D and then I hit the shutter to take the picture. Exactly. And that's the way I have it now. So I, I just have to come up with a I just have to basically identify uh change one button and then pick a button to assign the one I'm going to toggle through the choices. Yeah. But but I tell you what I miss because I, I think In, in, in at one point, correct? I have the right idea, but I was not patient enough, correct? That's a typical thing that happened because I have the, you know, a section of the river where I have, I don't know, maybe that little section of the river at 600 millimeters, you will see 200 birds, correct? So, so I got all that, so that's fine. Actually, I did some some video which I pan around to show to show the, the magnitude correct but what you are uh, so i took the, the 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 tripod and put the z9 there on the tripod and i took the z8 and, and have a handheld correct now what i did not do which is i should have done is so i had two cameras correct i should have put one camera for video right yeah. that i can trigger With the with the remotely, okay, and then I do the shoot because when all these birds, you know, go into the air, that's impressive, Jeff. I mean, the whole sky go covered by the sandhill cranes, and the noise is amazing, correct? So, well, I I know the noise of one. Like I joked, remember I joked? I exactly. said I wouldn't want to hear a, a hundred of them or a thousand of them. And, and but imagine now you have five thousand. That would drive me nuts. Uh, you got to wear earplugs. Oh, for sure. I mean, I, I, I would show it, but not now because I haven't, I haven't even start selecting and downloading. But it, it, for video, if we can, one of these, we could share the video. It, it, it's, uh, it's amazing, right? Uh, so I, I, but I did it because I have seen them. There is another place in Corral that they also migrate, but they, they, that, that place is during the, when they go south, correct? They go to Bosque del Apache or, and, and to uh, and Texas, correct? Yeah. But this is in the way back. They come back and stop there at the Plate River, the Brasca, correct? Actually, but now I know the place because, you know, it's the scouting, correct? Yeah. Now I know the the location where I had to stand. So this year, I, I try to catch it again. But I'm, now I know what, what needs to be done because I think be, this... It's a situation that lends very nicely for video, but you have to wait. And actually, that was the, the funny part, right? You're right there. They, they land 
in the river, little islands and in the river, and they they overnight there because they are protected by the river itself. Correct? But then in the morning, they have to go to the cornfields, right? And then as they go to the cornfields, you they 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 fly off, and you wait you wait for the fly off, you know. And actually, at the time, you know there were like six seven cars of we photographers, and at the end only I and other photography stay there, and 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 that went. A, a big band passed up, across, and then they all flew off, and it was amazing. Well, what I I don't know I don't know what what you uh, do at times, but like sometimes you know when I get uh, where you have layers of birds, you know rows, you know yes. front row, next row, back uh, background row, and I want to get the first row, you know, in focus. And as I, I used uh, the, one of the C1 or C2 uh, custom, uh, and I stretch it out so it's not very tall and it's exactly. wide. And then I can put that right on that first row exactly. of birds, and that yeah. works great. That, 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 that would have been the smart thing to do. But I have a program actually for vertical, which turned out good because, you know, these, these birds are lanky. So if, if it was a, a closer one. Yeah. That one, then I can go on, and that's where this button is essential, correct? Because I have like five different things programmed there. Because the camera, I mean, the camera when they have six birds, they get confused, correct? Well, they get we get confused using the camera. <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, for sure. it's like what I found myself doing is I program my my uh, my function button um, closest to the lens. Uh, I program that function button for single point autofocus. So when I have a long lens and I want single point, my hand's already out. You know, I push the fu function button on the lens and I got single point autofocus. You know, but now, like I said, now with this new feature, it really is kind of a big deal. You just, I just have to do, I mean, in 10 minutes, I can set it up now that we had this conversation because I wasn't sure. I wasn't sure if it was going to automatically know what button I was using for my dominant focusing control. Exactly. Uh, it, but if it defaults to the shutter button, I just got to move a few things around. I'll be fine. Let, 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 me, let me give a preview. So, so th this was a easier one to 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 do. Right. So, so, so you can see here actually the. So this is a pair, you know, they are, they are in big group, but they are always a pair because they mate. These are, correct? And in this case, what they do is they go into the river overnight, but in this migration path, they go to the fields. Obviously, this is a cornfield that was uh, basically, these are the stubbles from the cornfield from the last season. Yeah, and those are just like the, the short parts of the stalk sticking up. Exactly. Yeah. And that's where they go for eating whatever is there, correct? So, so that that's uh, that's one of the few that I have programmed. But you can see it was uh, it was interesting. Let me see if I can because I'm I'm working them this afternoon. I I started to start working them, but uh, so let me see. There is one here. So th this is in flight, a single one. Uh, and and they, I think I don't know if I have one here, if I have a, a, a group one. You see, this uh, is a yeah. This is when they start flying off. I love when they they start running, correct? But this is the because I was looking for the six hundred, correct? Now the, I I should have captured this at the same time that I try to capture the big zine. But that's you go one time and you learn, correct? So yeah. But uh, it's it's an amazing place, for sure. So I, I'm glad that I uh, that I make the, the the trip. But you can see here, you have to select which one is the one. So so if you have the full frame, and it happened to me, correct? It, 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 sometimes it will go and go into this. Oh yeah, it could, it could end up on this row. <laughs> exactly, you want up the full here. row, and you want and you want well, you you either want. You either want these or you or maybe these, 
Exactly. You know, like if you had if you had the front ones blurry and the middle ones sharp and the background blurry, that's cool too. Definitely. You know, but you usually want to you usually always want to have one where the foreground was, was sharp. And, and then that's a little bit blurry, and then that's really blurry, you know, but... Uh, now you see all these little things that are dropping here? The, this is because the one that I have already left, or that further to the right, there, you know, there are pieces of ice and water that are falling. It's, I mean, it's, it's amazing. It, it, nature put a good show there, I can tell you. Yeah, and lots of times when you get birds in a flock, and I mean not just these birds, but you get any any group of birds in a flock, it's bad because you'll, you're you're looking at your pictures sometimes. And you go, is that dust or something? And it's not. They're like pooping while they're flying. Exactly. You, you exactly. get all you get all the turd droppings coming down while they're while they're flying. Off. Exactly. So 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 and you know you so so that's what I was doing today. That editing, looking for the right wing position, which ones I like. Uh, and the trick with this one is, and, and, and it, is the chance that you're not going to get one that is cut half way through is bad. Oh, you're so, going to get lots of times. You're going to get some near the edge that are cut in half. Exactly. So, so in this one, because this is already in in, in Photoshop, the ones that were half, I edit them out <laughs> because yeah. I don't want to have have half a bird. And so, so for me, that's that's good. I taking stuff out, not putting stuff in. Right. So anyway, so, so that, that, that was uh, that 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 definitely that place. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a good one to go. So I probably will make a little presentation, show exactly the location because I know people like David Moots, which is in, in in Kansas. Correct? He probably can drive there as well in a overnight type of trip. And it's, it's a fantastic place for sure. Well, you know, you know what they would call the picture if you had a few here where just the back end was showing. They'd call the picture half blank, you know, half <laughs> half. <you> know? <laughs> but <laughs> let me uh, get back to normal size here, uh, and uh, let's see. Since there's only, can I do this? Let me see what happens. Can I, I can we go. There we go. It's uh since there's only a few of us left, I can make us all larger. Call them assholes. <laughs> so I actually, I I, I I put together a, a set of uh, slides or a couple of slides <laughs> to discuss with uh, Randall, but I also need the advice from Mr. Stewart on the photograph in the eclipse. Okay. Oh. So, Later okay. on, I show I show, I, I show that because there is some contradiction on the recommendation, correct? Okay? And and David last week mentioned, you know, if you don't have a a tracking mount, correct? Okay? What is kind of the minimum uh, shutter speed, so that you don't get uh, uh, th that they start to look like a point. So I, I share that later on. So we 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 okay. Um, if um. If you're using a, a tracker, because, no, yeah, oh, if, if, if you're not, okay, that's. Uh, I'll, I'll be back in a second, guys. I just got to grab a water. <laughs> you guys go ahead. You guys go they, ahead. They, uh, they used to have uh, a 500 rule. And, okay, I heard about that. Okay, but the thing is, that would only work with about a 20 megapixel camera. Okay. Now, if you're going to use your your nine you're mm -hmm. going to have to use maybe uh, a 1200 rule yeah okay. because it's got to be faster okay. yeah but yeah. Um, well, but so i i think after all these i eventually i i, I have been doing some research on trackers okay yeah and apparently there are some trackers now that don't require the counterweight that much correct oh you want to balance it as well as you can, though. I know, I but say, a, 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 because a, you need more power if you're not balanced. Exactly, and apparently there are some good ones yeah. that don't require the counterbalance. Particularly, the people that I mean, you have to travel, correct, by plane 
yeah. having the counterbalance is a problem, correct? Because it's a, oh, yeah. it's a lot of dead weight. Yeah. That's what so, your luggage is for. But I, 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 I'm not ready to to move on on that one yet, uh, David. So when I do the research, I'll share with you and see what is your opinion. See, this is more into your, uh, you know, belly yeah, wire. It, yeah, it, it's um, like, uh, it, it's, I do a, an awful lot of my, my uh, photography or my night stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'll start it again in the middle of August and I'll go into September or October. And it's, uh, and on the middle of August, there's only two hours of darkness. And, and so then I, I got to go go later. And if I if I head south down towards you are in mm -hmm. the summer, you get more darkness than we do up here. Okay, okay. 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 And, and and that <clears throat> that's because uh, of the land of the midnight sun and whatever. And <laughs> like I, I can see light when I shoot to the north any time of the night in the summertime so and, and then so i did a calculation of, of whether i should get a star tracker for myself and, right. and i figured that it wasn't worth it for me yeah i i, I have seen actually saw some pictures jeff with a planner yeah and, and a tracker yeah on some nebula and uh that the obviously you need really really dark sky for that type of photo but so beautiful uh you you know beautiful uh, captures okay. yeah they they uh dp uh no uh what do you call it uh, nikon rumors had week after week for like a month they had articles about people that were using the planet planet for astrophotography and uh and they and they they just raved about it i mean yeah. Obviously, for more of a, 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 a I mean, you know, like it, like like you said, a galaxy section of the galaxy or whatever yeah, right. type of thing. Not, uh, you know, not not specifically what uh, wouldn't be wouldn't be wide enough for you know what David's shooting. You know, exactly. But but yeah. that that one require obviously a tracker because some of the posters have, you know, few minutes long. Well, yeah, and. Uh, and when you're using the planet being the, the length that, that it is without a tracker, you're, you're, you're in seconds or, or less, you know, because uh, with my 20, I think I've got to be less than about 14 seconds or stuff like that, you know, or else I get the stars moving. But, but, uh, <clears throat> and so, and, and then that being longer, then you're down to one or two seconds, so you need a tracker. But but uh, if I had a planet, I would probably have a tracker. But 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 uh, what what did I have for 500, my 800, whatever, being you know it's being uh, six three. I <clears throat> if I was going to shoot the night sky, I would need a tracker for sure because my exposures would be so long. Exactly. Yeah. But uh, I, I'm more in, into shooting the, the Milky Way and the, yeah. and the Aurora, and then I don't need a tracker. No, 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 no. That's a, the, definitely but, the wider sky. Yeah. But yes. uh, so, um, in September, the, the weekend of the, of the new moon, we have a bunch of stargazers that go out, and there will be between 50 and 100 out. And they'll all have trackers, and they'll all have, well, <clears throat> the the glass that they have is all for, for looking at stars and whatever. And uh, <clears throat> and that that's where, where I I saw the sun in the daytime on with the tracker, and, and you can see the flares that are coming out from it. Mm -hmm. You know, and if uh, if you wanted to see the flares, you would need a tracker. You know, and I couldn't see the, the exposure on the flares changing any time during the eclipse because the flares are being lit from the sun. You know, and, uh, no, and I, that, I, yeah, I, that, I, that I, would I, be I, interesting I, to see. The, these, uh, uh, what do you call, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the little 
not the flair, but the, the the promotion, which are actually, you know, those I I I try to photograph in the 2017. Actually, I I, 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 I later on when we discuss it, I would show the the one that actually took a friend of mine, and and I know his settings because he gave me the photo. So 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 that that is the issue, Randall. If you listen to one camp, correct? That's what the well, all right. Now I got a class set up on the sixth, just to fine tune some stuff. Uh -huh. and, uh, uh, my local camera store is going to talk about that. Okay. So they told me to bring the lens or the cameras that I'm going to use, and they got two classes to that day. So okay. I'm going to go to the first one. You got to send an appointment, but. Uh, You know, um, uh, I've never done anything like this, so I, I'm and I'm looking at a lot of videos, you know, like BH video, uh, Steve Perry, there's a couple others. You're right. Everybody has a different opinion. So I don't know. Uh, they got some experts coming <clears throat> in on the 6th. Yeah, so yeah, Randall, I would take test shots early to make sure okay. everything works. The, the problem is totality, there is no test shot that you can take, right? Yeah, that you got to take your test shots now to make sure you can get the sun and everything else. So yeah. let, me, let me show here, Jeff. Okay. Uh, <coughs> so, Excuse me. <coughs> wait, wait. Let me see, because I don't, when I put this one in front, I don't see. So so this is Randall, right? It's a, it's a, it's a table that is in this website, which is probably one, that is very famous called mrclips.com okay okay but come from this guy which is a not ex a retired ex a, a guy called fred spenak who has probably has i think he has done 30 total eclipses okay and, and in his site he's he has this table that uh, that allows you to depending on your iso and uh And the F, F number that you're going to use, correct? Right? It tells you the bracketing because this is for a bracketing, okay? Uh, depending on what you want to do, you want to do the corona, and this relate to the radius of the corona, correct? Right? So this is like one radius corona, half a radius, point uh, two of a radio, point one, correct? Right? And that allows you to see the the different prominence because obviously a, a different <coughs> Uh, at different exposures, you're going to see different phenomena. But, and that's for totality, which is what I'm most interested on. Okay? So, so I use this table, and actually that's pretty close to what I used in 2017. Okay? But then you have other people, and, and I will show you here what my settings are, and I can send you that spreadsheet as well. So this is actually the settings from uh, Hudson Henry which is so he, he gave different settings for for the the partial portion of the lid but also for the totality correct and then depending on what f top you have one is the whether you want to photograph basically the chromosphere correct uh, uh then then it tells you if you use a f11 or you put the camera in f11 right. and then you use uh uh and and Uh, an ISO of let's say uh, uh, 100, 100. And okay so your 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 middle bracketing is one over 500 okay okay. 500th of a second shutter speed okay. yeah yeah now that that is uh, very very different from what this Fred Espenak recommends okay now um So, so, so what I'm doing, and now, now this is kind of because you don't want to be messing up, correct? You don't want to miss it, right. correct? So I, I am going. This is actually what I'm going to try to do, correct? Because I, correct. So, so for totality, this is my totality spreadsheet that I prepare, correct? So, so I use this is the based on the Fred Fred Espinar, correct? Which I started with the base. Uh, my base bracketing, correct? Uh, ISO 400, so it's a lot. And then, uh, because this will be on the 600 PF, 
they yeah. will be a set fully open. And you can see here at 6.3 and 400, right? it will be the base will be one over 100 of a second. Correct? Now, and this is the question for you with the nine brackets that we have. So we have four below, four overexposed, and four underexposed, so that you can later on create an HDR. Right? Then, if I start with the setting, these exposures here, which I mark in red, is one eighth of a second and one fifteenth of a second. I suspect, based on what I did in 2017, that anything on the one thirty of a second, a 600 millimeter, is going to is going to not to be a single point for the stars around the sun. Okay. What What would happen if you just bracketed? You had your base exposure and you bracketed two stops below and two stops above instead of four. Well, the, you 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 get it, but the 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 more the more. Uh, so this is a scheme. With when, a, you, when, when you get it close, when you get it close enough doing that, where then you know if you got to do any changes, you're no, just the, doing the, minor. The, minor I show you here. I show you these examples. Correct. So this is this is my own example in two thousand. So this is a two, in, in 2017, correct? So 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 that's fine. So this is like the middle exposure of the corona, right? But 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 you want to capture all the phenomena that this prominence, correct? You can see this is like yeah. those arches of solar masses coming out of the sun. You want to combine it with this picture, correct? And, and the exposure for this is several stop under. So the only way to do that, to combine all this, you have to use HDR. Now, this is actually for a friend that was photographing with me, the last eclipse, correct? But if you look, I mean, obviously I study all the different exposures that we did at a time, okay? This is closer to Fred Espinac, and that's why I'm shooting one camera with that type of setting. Correct? Okay. Because the, at the other end, Jeff, you want to capture this one, which is that you see the Earth shine. So it's basically the light of the Earth illuminating the moon. And, and you can see the different mare and everything, correct? So the, what I'm trying to do here is to, co to, co to do a combination of all of these in a single ACR made out of the nine exposure but then you have to have your middle exposure yeah at the right place correct because you only have now you can do this in one and a half steps but apparently a one step ev up and down seem to be good so so i would probably start with this table here in one camera and in the other camera the c8 with the 160 to 600 i will start i will do the try to do the hustle harry so i will have these two, and I will try to shoot them remotely at almost at the same time. But you can see here, it's very different, correct? At a 100, F9, and, and one over 500 of a second. So this is very, very different to the to this recommendation, right? Okay? Well, now, it's different. I I do, well, right? it's, it's different because, yeah. he's, because he's stopping it down more and... Uh, but, but look at the base exposure here. So yeah. this is more sensitive. Yeah. High zone 100, yeah. Uh, exactly. So that's this, an F6.3. The zoom lens, the 180 to 600, is what, F9. So exactly. maybe that's why he's doing it different, because it's different lenses. Well, I, I'm going to try to, yeah, but it's, uh, it's, I mean, these two lenses that I'm using, that I'm going to be using here, their maximum aperture is about 6.3, yeah. right? Yeah. So... So I'm doing for for the C9. I'm doing one full fully open, correct? Okay. Obviously, this is, will be all quick cable release or uh, or or a remote release at six point three, and then I'm I'm using a, another with F9 because you don't want to be messing this up, correct? So I'm just changing quickly the aperture and then shooting another series. Yeah, there's five stops difference between the two tables. Exactly. That that's yeah. that's my concern. Oh yeah, and they, they the cannot way, be right both. Okay. 
you know, no, no, they, they, they both can't be right. You know, exactly. and uh, the, I, I think you're better off shooting this uh, one stop between. And, and uh, because th then you, after you're finished, you get it, you can pick which which ones that you want to merge into which exactly. pair. But, but, but five stops difference. Like you exactly. said, these, these settings here from the NASA guy are similar to what you shot years ago. Exactly, and that's why. And, and, and I you know were, you were, were and, and, it, and it looks like you were got some good results. Exactly. So, so I, I wouldn't even bother with the Hudson Henry one at all. I would just use the other guy. Yeah, but yeah. So uh, I mean, the, the, the beauty of having, a, and I may do that at the end, so you can see that's a, a being, uh, that's what I'm preparing myself. Correct, yeah. studying and deciding because the beauty of the 180 to 600. Correct is that as you basically expose the corona okay, more, it becomes bigger, correct? So I may not shoot this at 600. I may shoot it at 400 or, or 500, correct? I may have to, in order to capture the entire corona, you can see between these two exposures, correct? The, the size of the corona ch changes completely. And what you want to do with HDR, the HDR is to capture the structure of, of the corona. Right. Yeah. So anyway, so so that's part of the experimentation. Hopefully, the weather will cooperate. Uh, but but you can see even, I mean, people that I trust. Correct. I mean, I obviously I trust this guy. I mean, this guy is an expert. That's his life is dedicated to this. Correct. Yeah. That's that's why I would I would that's why I would trust his numbers more. If you're if you're working for NASA, you're going to have a lot more knowledge than pretty much any photographer. Who's done it? Because it, that's yeah. that's that's your your career is based on that. Well, it, it, yes, that, that's his hobby. In NASA, he did other things, but I mean, this this guy called is is publicly known as Mister Eclipse, correct? I mean, he is. I mean, he has written the books, many books, correct, and the apps and everything. So for sure, this is my default, and I know it works because I did it in 2017. But I'm intrigued about the other one. Yeah, right? so you have the other camera, but. Uh, I think that the difference is in ND filters. Well, yeah. they both I, they both recommend. Actually, this guy, uh, Espinac, correct? He actually shooting also Nikon, and he himself said that he, he that his photography has changed for this type of event because he's now shooting mirrorless, correct? Yeah. So 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 things so evolve. So he, he even himself said that some of these tables may not be exactly like he, what he did in 2008 when he published his table although that table is still appearing on the on the, on this uh, yeah. uh site which which he endorses okay yeah but to go with this table he has to specify which nd filter that he's yeah using. and, the, and, and it's, yes exactly so so i know how sir henry has this uh, the same that randall and i have the the 16 stop, correct? Yeah. The, 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 the guy, 16, yeah. And, and he said that that was okay, <laughs> correct? So so anyway, uh, look, but I don't know, uh, and I did this one with a uh, um, Myler, uh, and actually, you. this is where I had to be prepared. The first time, I checked the, my base exposure, and that's what I created, correct? Let's say if I'm on this scheme, I know how the base posture should look like, correct? Yeah. So if my base posture, it looks reasonably well with a corona that I can uh, see some details, then I know I'm going to be good, correct? But I, I want to see it. I don't want to spend all the time behind the camera, correct? So so I need to have something prepared that I can make some adjustments. Uh, but And that's and that's what the, the recommendation and discussion point uh, here today uh, okay, uh, because obviously totality for me totality is what I want to photograph. Yeah. Right? So so anyway, so that's the the dilemma at this moment, and you can see that I mean the, 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 this is from that website, and this is the one that I downloaded uh, uh, from from Henry Hobson. Okay? <laughs> so anyway, so uh, indeed. Uh, so some interesting discussions here, correct? 
Yeah. I mean, I guess if you had to prioritize, if, you know, say for some reason there's a distraction or something is focus on the, on the NASA one. And then if you, if you could do the other one too, uh, without, uh, any, any issue, then do them both, you know, but, uh, yeah, obviously you're going to favor one over the other. If you had to only pick one, if something something were to happen for some reason or whatever, because you only have a small window of time, you, you know. I go with the Espinac because that yeah. closes to what I did in 2017. Yeah. So I have experience myself uh, and, and I know he's a trusted uh, source uh, and I know how to check it. Correct? I mean, uh, uh, but but I need to have, you know, this is all about rapid reaction, correct? So I need to have, so I probably set one camera one way and another camera the other way and have them both mounted. Correct? I got to do a, a doggy break here. So you you want to leave this up while I'm gone or you want me to take it down? Well, we, we, we no, that's okay. We can leave it on. And then in, in other, if somebody okay. has a question. Right. And we I'll, be back, I'll be back in a few minutes. Yeah, Gustavo, so, uh, could you send me those tables? Because I, yeah. it, uh, I think there's a bit more to look at than just what's on the tables. Because, no, no, I uh, send it to you for sure. Yeah, because uh, during totality is, is one thing, and, and and both sides of it is, is something totally different. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And, and, and these tables have that exposure too, correct? You can yeah. see here partial, correct? He had yeah. a different part, and, and Henry Hudson also have uh, uh, information on the. Uh, you see the partial. He, he had them divided in three, correct? Yeah. A partial setting for partial setting for totality, and even totality he separate the chromosphere and and the beginning, which is at the the Bailey's beads, correct? Yeah. So so he he had them he had them both. Uh, so, so, so this looks like a comprehensive note, but like you said, it's too far away from the other one. Okay, so yeah, surprising. Now he's using exactly what Randall and I are using, right. the sitting top, Nisi or the, the uh, you yeah, know. The, the, like I, I can barely see it on my screen. That's why I want you to send it to me. No, so. no, I send it to you. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so, thank you very much. No, no, no problem. But uh, it's uh, right, so is that the guy that's on YouTube, or is that the NASA guy? This, this table, no, no. Right? Most, most of these are. I mean, of course, the NASA guy has his own channel. You know, his right website, that's, correct? Which yeah. is which is here. All right. Yeah. You see, it, uh, sorry, I, I need to move. You see, the, this is the site. Yeah. MrEclipse.com. Okay. So that's yeah. the that, that is. And the table was put by this is the NASA guy. Oh, Fred uh, I was on the NASA side. Okay, I was the wrong way. So uh, I mean, me. not the NASA side. He he retired from NASA, but he have been doing this. See, okay. you know, for I mean, he have, this guy have photographed thirty eclipses. Thirty, <laughs> correct? Well, he's got to have some bucks behind him to do thirty eclipses. Exactly. Well, I, I just went to the side, and it's. The domain is up for sale. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's... Uh, it's I mean, Dan.com, right? Is that where you got it from originally? The Eclipse.com? That's... No, no, he might have moved. No, Mr. Eclipse. Eclipse.org. No, it's right, Mr. I went to Eclipse. Eclipse.com and it's not there. Yeah. They call, sorry, Randall, the two arrows on my window. Call MR from Mr. Eclipse.com. Oh, all right. And, okay. and, that, and, and that, that is an excellent site. I, 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 I mean, the, the, these are where they, and if you look for his name, Espenac, correct? In YouTube, everybody in any astronomical society has invited him to give presentations on Eclipse. He is the guy, okay? Now, I may be misinterpreting the table, but I don't think so. So anyway, I, I sent it to you, David, and to you, Randall, so that you can- Yeah. 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 But, uh, but, but I know this is closer to what I shot. Now, I was shooting with a mailer 
uh, you know, a, a filter that is made of this plastic thing uh, in 2017 because now I'm shooting with a neutral density. Okay. So that, that's another variable there, David. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so anyway, and, and then this is, you know, we know he's the, this YouTuber, correct? Henry Hobson. Yeah. yeah. They're like, like they're, they're, there's two different things you got to do is there is one's for totality and one's for when it's not. Yeah. And, and so, I'm, I'm interested mostly, I would take some partials, correct? Yeah. But I had done that before. Uh, the, the kind of composite with a lot of the partials, I probably take only one or two partials uh, and one end and one or two partial after the clip. But I, 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 I interested more in totality, correct? Uh, and yeah. Because I, I, what I want to do different from, from 2017 is to create a composite HDR with, with a nine exposure. And by the way, David, so, so you can see in this one here, okay? <coughs> So yeah. you can see this was taken at one ISO 400, so similar to what I'm doing now here. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it was taken with the D800E, which is, uh, I, I think it's, it's, it's not a, it's a, it was not a D800E. I don't think it was a full frame, if I recall correctly. And it, uh, this is a one eighth of a second exposure. Yeah. Right? At A4, because this was taken with my, my G lens. Yeah, G lens, and you can see the star here, which I think is regulus or one of those stars. Yeah, there is a little bit of movement, correct? Yeah, it's not a single, it's not a single, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> it has a little bit of a movement. So I know that I, uh, while this one here, that you can see the same star here, okay? Yeah, yeah. there is no movement. And this was taken at one over 40 of a second. And I know that one over 30 of a second, at 600 millimeter, it will be static. And that's what in my own table, oh, I mark that, everything. Yeah. I mark see, everything about 125 yeah. as, as not having any problem. Right? See, see, there's a difference now is your sensor is much higher resolution. That so is that's true. That's going to make a difference too. That That is true. Right? Yeah. So if you shoot with a 24 megapixel camera, okay. Yeah. Yeah, but I'm not going to. I mean, I want. No, no, there's no way Gustavo is going to take his, uh, his, his Z9 and, and set it aside and use a 24 <laughs> megapixel camera. You know? That is for sure. Oh, yeah. Uh, because, yeah. I, because what you want, Randall, you, you want actually maximum resolution. As a, as a matter of fact, Okay. If it's not because it's a, you don't want to be changing camera, I would like to go with actually with 800 plus a 1.4 just to get this, this prominence, right? Okay? Yeah. Because those are cool too, those, those prominence, yeah. right? So those are solar mass ejections. Yeah, you, you can you can see them in, in the daytime, but the, the stargazers can see them in the daytime because I've seen them myself. Yeah, they use a, yeah, I think they use a, something called a 100, hydrogen filter. That's like the sun when it has gas problems. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and and it, it's like that an awful lot now because I, I've been I've been getting notifications uh, on the average of six a day now. Exactly. So, yeah. uh, and there is a lot of, apparently there is a lot of solar spots, correct? Right? Because we are at a solar maximum. Well, so, yeah. it, it, it is. Well, we're not there yet. It's going to be more so than that. But um, <clears throat> as uh, Thomas Escove is sending or doing at least two videos a week now, and, and because of all of this, and she can't keep up, and this is how she he, she makes her coin, and she teaches a postgraduate um, space weather course. And, and, and uh, David, as you, you know, as an astrophotographer, correct? You can see th this is the red color, correct? That of that, uh, these prominence have the red color. Hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah. So, so anyway, uh, it, it, it that will be interesting to, to do. But I, I sent you the table. So I'm still refining my table, but I have to be ready 
you know, the yeah. two cameras. Because it only lasts three, four minutes. Hopefully, the way will cooperate, Randall. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you have to change the settings. So bracketing is a, is essential. So people say, don't, no, bracketing, I do agree. That's what we need to do. Okay? You taking, I mean, I already said the camera for bracketing. I mean, you, you even on these tables, correct? Okay? You do one click and... It takes no time to go through all this dying exposure. You try to yeah. do manually, it's a crazy stuff. Right? Oh, yeah. Right. It, 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 yeah. 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 The, the only, if you want to do it faster, Randall, rather than go one stop between, go two stops because of the dynamic range in our new cameras is such that when I do bracketing on, on, my, on my 850 and newer, I go three stops. And David, when you look at this photo, you look at this table, you can see for this guy in NASA, <clears throat> he's actually doing one and a half EVs. Yeah. Rather than one. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You can see that he goes from 115 to 160, then to one over 250. That's yeah. one and a half. Yeah. But but see, we, we can easily go two with our Nikons now. Yeah. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. Yeah, yeah but I think, yeah. That, so that that's basically the dilemma, guys. Yeah. See, see, Randall, if you go two rather than taking nine exposures, you can get down to five, so you're faster. Then you can do it many more times. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, that, that's just a guess. So yeah. Everybody could look at these charts and have a have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> like anything in photography, Jeff, it's a uh, there is a lot of research that needs to be done, yeah. and, and there's a lot of UFI too. Well, and, and like 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 we were talking about, correct? You have to. There is a lot of misinformation, so you have to switch between what is good advice and what is not. <laughs> Well, well, Eva, that yeah. that does not make a difference whether he's using film or not. You know, the the the, the table <laughs> is uh, the the big difference is is the resolution on a digital camera is much higher than for ISO four hundred film, <clears throat> and, and that that's what makes the difference. It, it, it's it's nothing else. You know, because if you're going to shoot at, at ISO 400, everything else is the same. You know. And with the roll, with, with the film, you could not do HDR easily. I presume there is. A, I yeah, presume yeah that, that, that's the big problem with film with HDR. You know. Yeah. <clears throat> and of course, David, you can imagine even you know the song is going to move a little bit, correct? Well, that, that's what I'm saying with the Star Tracker. Exactly. Yeah. So, so that means and, and so that, that, and you really want to knock it down from nine shots for your HDR to five. And the, I, that's eclipse. Yeah. Well, which, well, which it, he, it, uh, do what you can. You know, which, but, which here in North America for us it will be twenty forty five. So that's a stretch. Well, there. we might have to travel a little bit further, Gustavo. Exactly. But, no, no, that the, uh, the, you know, the. But the beauty yeah. with nine is you don't have to use them all if they're not good. Exactly. Uh, and, 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 the, and the, in Photoshop, even if the, other, if the sun sphere is a little bit misaligned, you can align them first and then do the HDR. Yeah. Well, you can have Photoshop align them. Exactly. So Because they, they should be close enough. Yeah, so, but you'd be surprised at how fast the sun moves. Yeah, you see, Jeff, that's what you are being spared of. <laughs> you, you don't have to go through the madness. No, no, I don't. I don't worry about taking those kinds of shots because I'm not. I'm not. I. I don't. That's not me. I'm not into that. So <laughs> and see, I, I'm on the left side of Canada, and this is happening on the right. So I'm not going to be there. So anyway, so I don't have any irons in the fire. Exactly. So so Eva is asking about the base ISO. So, so indeed, and that's actually what Hudson Henry recommend. Hudson Henry say, go to your best ISO, your base ISO, 
The same in a Z9 is ISO 64. Yeah, 64. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Because I will yeah. have the largest dynamic range. But you see, but not you really. Can... Not on the not on the nine. It's higher than that. But anyway, but, but, it, it you know. Okay. If, if, okay. Yeah, if you're 400 or less, it doesn't really matter. Yeah, exactly. It, I, and I know with that day, the the 800 E. Yeah, at 400, I mean, I could make a, and that was a 24 megapixel camera, whatever number megapixel camera was. I don't remember. Was it a 33? 33. Because my 810 is 33. My my 810 A. Yeah. Yeah. I forget what the E stands for. Yeah, 64. Yeah. Yeah, but but uh, the, the the base ISO has less relevance in the Z line than, than it did it, with, with your DSLRs. Exactly. Yeah. So, but, so, so, so here's the dilemma where I was maybe shooting the two cameras, right? And I mean, it doesn't take long to choose one series right so because i don't want to change so each camera i would shoot only you know one set of parameters you cannot be shooting changing iso aperture and no uh, you, you definitely can't yeah i mean you know? uh, then you you are looking at the whole thing through the viewfinders <laughs> i don't want to do that <laughs> the, the other thing with, with bracketing if your exposure is out a stop or two, you can compensate. Exactly. Because when you make your HDR, you just pick different ones, different shots. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. But do you want to have all your bases covered? And I think you're getting close to it, Gustavo. Exactly. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna take the shots in seconds and you're going to be processing them for hours. <laughs> oh, that, 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 that is for sure. <laughs> but, but, but my Mookie, you just this is a Mookie Mac is asking about burning the a hole in the and through my camera for sure. Do it in totality, it, you cannot do that. I mean, you can see it with your own eyes, correct? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so for totality, there is no filter, and, and, and for partial, you do have to put the filter, correct? So, as a matter of fact, there is a app. And actually, because that we mark with Martin, who's also coming to Texas, that that you can basically adjust to your actual position in GPS, and he gives you instruction that what is the time to take your your filter off and all that kind of stuff. Correct. So he he, he alerts you what to do and when. Mm -hmm. So I probably you know before totality, maybe a couple of minutes before I take the camera, not looking at the sun. Take the filters off, and then be ready when totality comes. And I shoot the yeah. I, I, yeah. I put yeah, Eva's got a really big problem here, <laughs> yeah. and maybe we can solve it for. Her. <laughs> well, use the use the the best resolution on the close up. Well, she's got an eight. Right, but I'm not too sure what her other one is. The other one, though, I guess that's the the other one. Her uh, well, she had an Olympus, didn't she? So I wonder if one is a different brand. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Ava, what was what's the what's the megapixels? What's the resolution on the other camera that you're going to use? OM one. Okay, so that's a crop. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And that, that that's the that's the latest from OM systems. Yeah, so it depends on what you're using for yeah, long for glass sure. too, because I think it's part of it's gonna depend on what lens what lens do you have that you're gonna put on the Z eight? What's what's what what telephoto lens or zoom lens were you gonna put on the Z eight? Well, she's talking about landscape here, so well right, but you're saying totally which, you're, which one you use for Landscape and, and and versus the other though is going to depend on what your lens choices are too, for each camera that you own. Okay. If she doesn't have long glass for the Olympus, then you're going to use that for the landscape. 
If you got long glass for both, then you got to decide. Okay, you want the higher resolution camera for the for the uh, the sun image, then versus the landscape image. I I, I think that Jeff is she's talking about a totally different problem and not the not the eclipse. Yeah, the four hundred. It only five. has a four hundred though. The four hundred four point five for the Corona photo, that would be a good. See, yeah. I, I had the one to four hundred, but I just picked up the one fifty to six hundred. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and ours is a six point three, so that's why I got it. Yeah. So the the one that that's the other alternative that I have, Randall, using the one hundred to four hundred. At uh, 400, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the size of the sun in a 400 is not that big. I mean, you photograph right. the, the moon, it will tell you, okay? Yeah. But but, the, the, but remember, when the corona comes, it's like an explosion. It, it goes to time, two times the diameter of the sun, correct? That's why I want to use this, the, the zoom because I may be able to adjust it to the viewfinder to on the base exposure to 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 what I see the streamers, okay? Okay. She's saying she's got the one to four hundred for the Olympus and she's got the four hundred four five for the V yeah. eight. So the four point five for the C eight will be fantastic. Now no now would you put a tell would you put a one four on it? No. Not 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 for the I mean not uh, the, the, for the photos of the corona that with 400 is good enough. about the right size just i mean you, you you still give yourself a little bit of cropping ability correct yeah Look, see you can always practice with moon shots because the moon is going to be the same size as the sun exactly but but then you have to realize the size of the corona is sometimes three four times the diameter yeah, yeah. of the but, but, moon. But, See, you, can, you can practice on the moon exactly and, and and you don't have to worry about filters or anything else exactly and that, what, what i do for that for base exposure is your iso is the same as your focal length of your lens then you go f11 or f10 and that'll give you a proper exposure for shooting the moon Exactly. And, I, and and that's the other thing, Dave, David. I may probably shoot it manual focus, and I will use focus picking to to determine whether it's on focus rather than relying on the autofocus of the camera. Yeah, when I when I yeah. shoot the moon, I wait to get the guy on the moon doing this. <laughs> <laughs> right, do goes, You're good. I go. Oh, thank you. I go. We're good. We're good. <laughs> yeah, I, I I tried shooting the moon on, on a, a tripod that, that that I have that's got tangent screws that, that never end, and uh, every shot I had to move because the moon moves, I mean, moves that fast, and that's with a four hundred. Exactly, you, know? you have yeah. you, every series you have to recompose for sure. Yeah, here's her thoughts. I, I do them and they're, they're fun, Eva. Yeah, that, I, I try them at, at, at uh, sunrise. And uh, and when I put my composite together, I'll have one, one, one side to be almost dark and the other side to be daylight and I transition across. Yeah. Now, now in the case of the totality, okay? Yeah. Every, the... the it's, the bright part of the sky, which is at the horizon, is all around you. Okay. Okay. The reason why I, I would love to do some landscape with the with the clips. The reason why I'm not even going to try this time ever is because the sun is going to be pretty high in the sky for us in Texas or okay. So so you're shooting almost completely up. So incorporating any landscape is can be difficult. Yeah, Luke, you may be right. I'm not too sure what it is because 33, 36 doesn't mean much difference to me. I got the 810A and 
And I could easily be wrong. So, you know, <clears throat> all I know is the the files are big. <laughs> And I think I've shot less than 3,000 shots on it, and I've had the camera for four years. So I don't use it much. Yeah, yeah the, D8, the D810 is a 36.3 megapixel camera. Yeah. And what was that, the D800E? Since you are probably in the wiki side. D800E. Uh, where is my D800E? It's probably similar. Uh, read it when Google says. Uh, <laughs> Can we use your location? No, you don't need to know where I am. Go jump in well, What does that matter? It, there, yeah, it's it's the same. Thirty-six point three megapixel. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, why yeah. do you care where I live when I'm searching on a camera, Google? <laughs> exactly. You hey, know. they want to sell you something. Jeez. <laughs> you know. I don't know. This guy buy camera, so let's target this, those are to him. <laughs> yeah, what cameras do we have in your area that we can sell you? None in the case of Jeff. <laughs> I don't want to, I don't, I don't, I certainly don't need any more cameras. Like I said, I, I as they say, you know, cameras change a lot and lenses last, lenses technically can last you a lifetime. So, um, important to have good, good glass. Yeah. You know, you don't, like I said, when I, when I, when this is going back decades ago, when I had a Nikon school of photography, uh, they had, they used to go around the country and they used to do one day or two day classes. Mm -hmm. And, and all those guys were shooting, cam they, their daily camera was two generations behind whatever Nikon was selling at the time. I mean, they, those guys, as they say, the pros do not switch cameras unless the improvements significantly significant significantly reduce their workflow time where they can justify buying that new camera well, that makes sense and and uh and and even if you know and if it's like yeah but i could i could do it easier with this camera yeah but you know when you've when you've figured out how to get the good result with the old camera and you've done it that way a million times it's fast for you. You know, you're fat, you're good at it. You're fast doing it with that old camera. No, I'm sure. It may be faster with the new one, but not enough to make you want to go and spend the money. You know what I mean? So if it, but if it allows you to get a picture that you can't get with your camera, because the technology is that much better and you need, you really want to be able to capture something different and you can use that feature, then Boy. they'll, then they'll then they will spend the money, you know. Uh, and, but, that, and that's what I did in the past. I skip one generation, right? You you don't yeah. do it every generation, you do it every other generation. Yeah, because usually usually the one the the, the one uh, in between, like when if they come out with a Z9, say they come out with a Z92, mm -hmm. you're probably better off waiting for the Z93. Exactly. You know what I mean? The Z92 may have some improvements, but the 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 gap won't be huge, but there will be a gap when that next one comes out. Exactly. <laughs> oh, yeah, here's the <laughs> Google heard I was sad, Jeff, and they wanted to cheer me up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Google probably knows a lot more about me than I want them to. Yeah. I'm sure. Uh, along along with along with. All the government agencies. Uh, who is this? Who is this Neville guy? You say anything bad about NASA? Let's go after him. Exactly. Uh, where does he live? <laughs> no, I don't say anything bad about NASA. The only thing I say bad about NASA uh, and, and is uh, it, it is historically, I mean, they're incredible. 
but they but they stink at marketing because too many too many average Americans would always you know would be of the opinion well, why do we want to spend all that money to build a space station why do what are the benefits of us having a space station uh, why should we spend all that money and they do a very they do not do a well enough job a good enough job to explain the discoveries that they make or the or the, the things that they can uh, that they can come to a conclusion on, say with medical benefits or something like that, that they can only do in the in space that they can't do on Earth, and and uh, these breakthroughs that they come up with, they don't, they don't market themselves good enough so that people know, you know, instead of instead of the one they always say, well, Tempur-Pedic mattresses was based on the foam they used in the seats that the astronauts were in, uh, it made it very comfortable uh, handling the G forces when they launched or whatever. Uh, you you got to talk about more than uh tempurpedic foam, you know, the, 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 that the foam invention, you got to talk about other things and they're not good at marketing themselves. They could do a lot better. Computers and an awful lot of our chips. Yeah, are Jeff, that, that's not the priority, correct? The priority is, no, but you have to have public support. And you have to have congressional support to approve your budget. And if you want more money to do something, if you have the if the public if the public feels that there's value in spending that money, then then uh, then the congressmen realize they're not going to get any crap if they increase your budget by a hundred million dollars or whatever. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. So so unfortunately, p public relations. Is kind of important for NASA, and it's not always their best forte. It's not always the best thing that they do. But uh, say the, the the for sure, you see all these project managers. They say, "Do I employ another scientist or a PR person?" Well, you, well, the, you know, you know the whole thing. Like you know, you get into defense spending, you know, which is a touchy issue with a lot of people. You know how much this costs, and but you know how the, the here's. The, The thing is, there's this game that gets played between con congressmen act stupid. They know the game, okay? The game, the game is that company X says, I can build you X amount of fighter jets for this amount of money. Now, they throw out a number that's somewhat palatable. Okay, and, they, and, and Congress goes, oh, that isn't as bad as we thought it would be, and they approve the money. Yeah. So then they 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 know they're going to have pitfalls. They know they're going to have engineering redesigns. They know the cost is going to go up drastically, and the congressmen over the decades aren't dumb enough to know that's not going to happen, but they approve the initial budget, right? So then all of a sudden, let's say instead of uh, – I'll just make up a number. So let, let's say instead of uh, $30 million, and I'm making up fake numbers, say instead of $30 million, they go, uh, they, they come back and they say, well, it, it's really going to be $50 million per unit. <clears throat> Congress acts surprised and, oh, shock and awe. Oh, we got to have an investigation. Oh, what are we going to do? And then it always comes down to, It's going to cost you more to kill the program than to cough up the extra money. And if you don't cough cough up the extra money, look at all the jobs that are going to be lost that are working yes, on that, on that uh, job. So then all the congressional members, you know, throughout the country, it could be three or four different states that are benefiting from making that widget, that that ultimate widget. And then and they're all going to say, oh, we got to spend the money, you know. It, it, I got 10,000 jobs here that I'm going to lose. And the other guy says, well, I got 5,000 jobs I'm going to lose, right? So it's all a game. It all gets played out, and they say, well, we got to get tougher on, 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 on the budget and all this stuff. They've been playing the same game since I was, since I was, before I was born, the same game, you know? And, and, and we're all fools to fall for the, The oohs and the ahs and the, oh, what do we do? Oh, you know, you know what you're going to do. You're, you're not going. You're not going to have have tens of thousands of people. 
Well, actually, when you look at it, sometimes they'll say you hire one one guy here, it creates ten jobs somewhere else. You know, the whole process, all the all the the machinist, the guy that does machines the part, the guy that inspects the part, the guy that does this. So you, you're talking tens, tens, maybe a hundred thousand jobs or more. So they're gonna they're gonna spend the money. They're gonna spend the money, but it's all it's all a game. But it, obviously, taxation and spending your policies gets into politics very quickly. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. But, uh, but but the thing sure. is, they, but the thing is, they all play the game and they try to make sure. it out like like that, like shock and awe. And they know they know it's the same crap every single time. Never change. <clears throat> yeah, it, and, yeah. In Calgary, we have a new game. And it actually works out well for the city because if they want something done, they, they'll ask for fixed price bids. And uh, and so and like you, you you tender this and for whatever and and they they'll they'll pick whoever that they want, but they they've got the uh, the city policy is if you come back to the city for more money. Than, than what was in the contract for the fish for the fixed price that's too bad if you take the city to court over it you're not allowed to bid on any more contracts until yeah. after the court case is finished yeah. but you know why that doesn't work david either it is, works in is calgary be, is because the the vendor will say that fixed price is null and void because someone in the bureaucratic realm changed a requirement. Yeah. So the contract was not the same anymore. You made us do something different and that increased costs. Therefore that fixed price value has to be adjusted because you guys told us to do something <coughs> different. And that's but, but, that's yeah. what happens. But, but the way the city gets around it for, for most of the jobs that there's no changes. But if there is a change, that change is is done separate. You know, it, it, there's a change request that goes through, so that's a separate cost. But at the end, of the, at the end of the day, talking about NASA, they, but they still do good science. Oh yeah, they do. Yeah, no. yeah. You know, you know. What uh, now? Let's get back to on the Earth stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Because we're lost in space right now. We're lost in space. Um, do you... Um, I'm wondering how many folks in the chat who or who in the chat has had experience buying some of these third-party lenses, the Viltroxes and the TT Artisans and the you know, the Chinese lenses, you know, which are obviously are considerably cheaper than, uh, than, than the Nikon glass. Um, how many folks have bought, let's say a lens that cost them $700 that if it, if it was the Nikon version, maybe it would be $1,500 or $2,000. Um, have, are there folks out there that actually have done any kind of comparisons in terms of image quality where they maybe they had a a, a high-end Nikon lens and then they then they bought the seven hundred dollar one and they're just as happy with it. I have uh I look at the Viltrix 85 millimeter let's say 1.8 with the Nikon Z F 1.8. The Nikon was a little bit sharper but at the price point Viltrix was good enough in my opinion, all right? So I find that the native glass is always superior, you know, with the camera brand. You know, that's including Sony, because I've compared Sigma with Sony, <laughs> but Sony does that on purpose, where third-party glass really doesn't work as fast as their own glass. Uh, Canon, well, they're not letting anybody, unless you have an EF, you know, lens, but, you know, on the RF, but uh, I was comparing the, uh, well, I had two, three field trucks lenses, all right? And I bought two of them, but uh, one, but they were like APS-C because they didn't have any APS-C lenses. 
Uh, right. The, yeah, Nikon it, doesn't have much for that anymore. But what what I mean, what I've seen spec wise, when you look at them, one of the or one of the biggest the bif the biggest differences is the quality of the coatings too. So sometimes the other the other camera might be close to being close sharpness wise, not as good like you said, but close. But then it falls flat. Like if 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 you're shooting into the bright sun and you get you know you get a lot of flaring, you know, because it doesn't have the same level of coatings or or as many coatings. So it may not be as good. You might lose contrast if you're shooting into the sun. Or you may get the uh, the color, the chromatic aberrations might be uh, worse, you know, along the the branches of a, a branches of a tree or something. You might see a color cast on the branches of the tree with the cheaper lenses or whatever. So it's all it's really comes down to what you're where you're willing to compromise, I guess, and where you're not willing to compromise. And everybody's going to be different on that. Or what? Or what kind? Maybe some people say, "I never shoot in the sun. I don't take those kind of pictures." <laughs> you know, that's when you're going to have the most problems. So I don't ever shoot in the with the sun. You know, with the sun in the corner of the picture, or whatever. I just don't do it because I know it's not the best thing to do. But then, if you depending on the quality of the glass, sometimes you could do it just fine and do the star. You know, stop down the lens and get the nice starburst effect on the sun and. And get an interesting uh, result, but uh, it's uh, yeah, it, it really comes down to because that's what drives me nuts is when they do these reviews. Initially, when these reviews come out, they don't they they rarely show you image from this lens, image from that lens. You know, they just show you a bunch of images on the lens that they got to try out. They don't they don't always show you the same the same shot taken with the same camera body at the same settings with the native glass and then compare the images side by side. That's well, something that, that is I, not, not commonly in the reviews. I've seen some reviews like that, but what they do is they show you on YouTube that with the resolution of uh, 1080p maybe you know and, and then it's compressed and then when you go to look at it you can't see a difference on the screen exactly because you know they they they, they lost it all on, yeah. on youtube you know and like i've got uh this 15 millimeter because there's nikon doesn't make one and uh, i got this for going to yellow knife and so I had a choice: is uh, do I get a, a fifteen? So no, I you had your eight. To, you had your eight to fifteen, David. You had your eight to fifteen. <laughs> yes, that, that's the three five. This is a two. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and, and like the the other thing, what I could have done is it brought up my my fourteen to twenty four, but that that that's big and heavy, and I just and I don't. I and mean, this this here being a, an F two is is brighter and it it works well enough, you know. It, it's a I won't use it much. Like uh, Anita has a twenty F one eight, which is the the, the Nikkor, and we, we'll use that. But we won't use that much either. It, it'll be more of our our twenty four and our twenty eight. Hmm. And. and uh, I've got a, a 28 f1.8 as a Nikkor, and uh, I have a 28 f1.4, which is a Sigma. And um, the, when I put the, the Sigma on my Z8, it'll autofocus at night. And yeah, Sigma killing it with the lens. Oh, yeah. And, you know, like it's an yeah. art series. You know, it, it's. Uh, I got no complaints because when they're shooting the Aurora, the damn thing moves anyway, you know? And, and so what if you got green fringing is green? <laughs> <laughs> the Aurora is green. So houses, you're going to get a color. You're going to get the color cast everywhere. Oh yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and it's, it's a combination of, of price and, and availability, you know, and it's, uh, and as it is, I, I figured out how much it cost me to, to uh, to take a shot with, with all of these and 
because uh, it takes me a lot of years for for this thing to get it down to a dollar a shot. You know. But uh, I, I'm going to throw this up, and 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 I'm not. I, I'm going to explain why this happens. Okay, because this was always a uh, no. I'm serious. I'm going to explain for real why the hammer costs 700 bucks. Yeah. When you're when you're doing military contracts, or you're doing NASA work, traceability is the biggest cost. The biggest thing that adds cost. Like you can go to Radio Shack and buy a. Let's say, uh, I don't know. Let's just say you buy a, a 100 ohm resistor. Okay. You paid, you know, back in the day, you paid, you paid 12 cents for it, right? And you go, why is that? Why is that 100 ohm resistor on the parts list for uh, the military? And that 12 cent part costs, uh, you know, uh, $12. Well, it's just like why is why is a hammer cost seven hundred bucks? Because they have everything they have everything traced. No lie, they'll know, they'll pretty much know what tree that wooden handle for that hammer came from. They'll know where that wood came from, what forest, what tr where that wood came from. <laughs> they'll know the you know what what batch the uh, the head of that hammer came from from the manufacturer that made the head of the hammer what the date was what the lot number was how many were in that lot they'll know everything about the head of that hammer so that if something were to break no matter what no matter what the part is, no matter how big or how small, if they have a problem with one with one part, they can find out how many parts are out there everywhere with their paperwork and their database for every piece of hardware they've ever built. And they can find out what serial number pieces of hardware have that widget that had a problem. So that they can screen all that hardware and make sure that that part gets replaced on that hardware as well. So they don't have something happen that can result in an astronaut dying or getting killed. So mm -hmm. that's why everything costs so much. But that, that mentality and that uh, way of doing business flows down to the hammer. It costs $700. It doesn't end because, oh, it's just a hammer. I can go to Home Depot and buy one for $14. That traceability, all that stuff is on every single thing that the government that goes in a Navy vessel or a Black Hawk helicopter or a nuclear submarine or the space station. And it's the traceability is even higher on the NASA stuff. But that's how that's why all that stuff costs so much. It's because they because because like when you buy a television set, you think they got any traceability as to what batch number the capacitors on that PC board, uh, when those were made or who made them on what date. It's a television set. They don't care. Put a new board in the TV. Who cares when we made it? Who cares that it broke? We're not going to go back and look at, at a TV. We're not going to go back and look at a TV and say, gee, if that part went bad like five times, we better find out every TV that had that part made on that date because they don't have that information. And if they did, you'd be paying 10 times more for your television set. <laughs> so that's why that's why that happens, believe it or not. That's why it costs. That's why, that's why all this stuff made costs so much money. And Gustavo can attest to that too. He, he's very familiar with with requirements, uh, the the crazy requirements that you get on on government jobs. I mean, uh, absolutely insane, absolutely insane. And that's why they they I think they want to go with a private company, correct? Because if somebody else that that had to fulfill some requirement, but if they can fly to the satellites or, or to the 
to the station and do it cheaper. Well, that that's what's scary when they when they did when they, I'll, I'll tell you for a fact when they did outsource the Elon Musk and stuff, they were not they were not meeting the court requirements. Exactly, they were not, they were not meeting the requirements. They may be cheaper. But if they decide if they go if they decide to go with them, I'll guarantee you that there are a whole bunch of specifications and requirements where Elon Musk says, if you want us to save you money, we're not going to do X, Y, and Z. And that's and somebody had to swallow their pride and be willing to say, Okay, we won't make you do X, Y, and Z. But by the same token, when you're making when you're making your version of a launch vehicle to go on the space station, and you're and it's a NASA job, <clears throat> you're making NASA's and NASA's using their normal tier suppliers that they use. They're making them do X, Y, and Z, and that's why they can't comp- And that's what's not fair. That's why they can't compete with the Elon Musk's because for whatever reason. They're letting them get away, not doing X, Y, and Z. Exactly. So uh, that's that's you know because having worked in the in the department, we had to compete against those commercial enterprises. Uh, enterprises, and exactly. that was our and that was our biggest. Hey, but but, but look was, at this. Uh, the the alternative is to go to keep flying with the Russians. Yeah. Well, that that was our biggest complaint. Was, and the and the Russians don't do not track that well. The, Ru- the Russians to them, their astronauts are expendable. See, yeah. that's a big difference. Their astronauts are expendable. Exactly. In our in in our country, our astronauts are not expendable. I, re- I remember an interview from from one of those uh, astronauts that had to fly the Soyuz program, correct? And uh, they were talking about you know how we treat the astronaut. Here with regard to you know three days before a week before they they go into quarantine because they don't want them to get so these Russian astronauts the day they were going to fly they were drinking the vodka and kissing each other <laughs> with the family. <laughs> yeah, it, see that's the that's the biggest problem when you had the the NASA subs and you introduce commercial stuff. Exactly. You, we would get upset and say, well, "We'll never win the bid because you didn't you didn't lessen our requirements. Our requirement our requirements were up here, but you lessened the requirements for them and made it down here. So how could you how could you compete with them when you're not allowed to do things? It's not a level playing field. That's that's the big that's the biggest problem. It's not a level playing field." And I, and I don't really know why why NASA kind of let that sh- that crap happen. To be honest with you, it's too much too much pressure f- too much pressure from the bean counters is what it was. Too much pressure from the bean counters. But uh, but anyway, uh, we we digress as they say. We're at one o two a.m. So we're gonna I guess we're gonna try to make it to our two o'clock uh, <laughs> target. Um, what 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 other things of interest have you guys um, do you guys want to bring up? You have anything in particular? Well, a book <laughs> recommendation. A book <laughs> recommendation. It's not it's not a bi- it's not a Bible, is it? Uh, no, 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 I'm not saying Bible. Is this a is this presidential approval? Yeah. No, no. They, they, this actually, as I told you before, sometimes I buy an audio book and I find it that is good because it has a lot of reference. Obviously, this is on uh, uh, wildlife and, uh, uh, you know, extinction of birds like the passenger pigeon. So it's, it's a great read, right? And now, is that, is, that, is that specific to a certain area? No, 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 no. This is this is a general book about the, uh, uh, mostly about the, the 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 United States, but basically it describes uh, how we uh, lost species uh, during the Pleistocene when the humans came first to the Americas, great, right? and the extinction of the megafauna like the mastodon. You know, I I love mm-hmm. those things, great, right? and all the dilemma 
whether it was a climate in use or it was actually us human that that got rid of it and it, it, it goes through through that and then it progresses through time and then how you know the deep uh, we we almost exterminated the bison and we exterminated the uh, the gray oak so for those that are in, it, it's a nature book correct uh the dodo the dodo bird but but it's centered on the united states correct okay uh, yeah. and then uh, then how for instance the the term, the disappearance of the uh, carolina uh parakeet okay so you go into great detail on, on so for those that are in the group here that are native lovers and want to find out about these type of things that that was a a, a good book it's a good companion for like for instance on that trip to nebraska I listened to half a book in one way and half a book on the other way. <laughs> but, but I like it so much because it has a lot of reference to stuff that mattered to me, correct? Uh, about, you know, for instance, he goes through, uh, you know, when John Adubon created his, his uh, uh, you know, his Birth of America and then uh, how that came to happen about or what other people we're doing at the same time, correct? It goes through the evolution of, of that type of stuff. So so I do recommend it, having read it, you know, listening to it, uh, it with a lot of details, and then, then I decided to buy it, correct? So I have it as a reference. So if I make a quote to you guys, I can go to the right page and... <laughs> you, I, could, you, say, I, you, you say, hey, I, I, got, I got backup. Oh, I got <laughs> out of the research, correct? <laughs> so, so, so it's it's definitely and and this guy uh, uh, has written about the. I think he's actually appeared in the uh, in the Buffalo series in uh, from uh, in PBS, correct? So, so the documentary about Buffalo, he he appeared there in that. Uh, uh, so it's, it's a great read and, and full of, to me, very interesting information, correct? You you want to know why, correct? <laughs> How did we lose that, the great off? Why, why do we lose? And, and since, a ch since childhood, correct? I always have been interested on uh, on the Pleistocene, correct? Uh, you, you know, you, you wonder, okay, why, why we don't have mastodons anymore, correct? So one of the things that he argued, Correct, which is interesting of the big megafauna of the Pleistocene, correct? Uh, that in the places where those survive, like in India, uh, where there's still rhinos and elephants, are the are where those species co-evolve with humans. But in the new world, correct? When the uh, hu the human came from Australia, talking about Roy, correct? Uh, the the megafauna disappear when humans came because the animals were naive. They didn't understand us as a predators. Okay. So 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 that's interesting to me. Well, they, be, they became our lunch basically. Exactly. But you know. Okay. So so that was you know ten thousand years ago and or twelve thousand years ago and we still keep doing it. Okay. And uh, and certainly with the American buffalo, correct? Okay? The American bi with the bison, okay? Well, it's like when I when I we could we could bring drill this right down to uh, my uh, when I when I've done some critical videos on uh, local the exactly. local park, okay. I've got I got emails from all over the all different parts of the world, uh, where where every where pretty much everybody is going through the same thing, yeah. because because unfortunately we as humans prioritize what we feel is important for us, and everything else takes a back seat, yeah. and we're we're very selfish. You know we. Uh, we worry about, uh, you know, like uh, I think it was, I don't know if it was Jeff and Leslie or it might have been them or I think it was them where 
you know, all the all the, the, the fields of flowers and stuff that Jeff uh, with Jeff and Leslie would take pictures of. A lot of those things got cleared out and they made, you know, they made soccer fields out of them or recreational uh, areas for for people. But now you now you destroyed a habitat for a lot of different creatures. But that was that was not important because it was more important to have the soccer fields. So we make those decisions every day. Oh, for sure. And and normally, if it's a decision between what, let's just say, the people that are in the power to make those decisions, if there's a if it's a choice between what they want and nature, nature's going to lose every time. That's oh, the problem. But, but 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 in this book, for instance, it goes it is playing. For instance, remember when hats with bird feathers, okay? were very oh, popular yeah. Yeah. and how that changed and why society changed who were the people that pressured the the uh, uh, i mean the change the fashion or the the consequence of the termination of the beaver okay uh, the the it, it goes into that detail yeah, but all the way mink coats right <laughs> killing all the minks to make mink coats exactly but how many minks does it how many minks does it take to make a mink coat But, the, but go, the mink were farmed, but that yeah. made a big difference. Yeah. But 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 it, yeah. it, it it goes for instance even you know uh, uh, to how culture has changed in time because you know the division of wildlife girl the wildlife uh, uh, they were the ones that were exterminating the wolf okay? and exterminating the coyotes okay? and because at that time at the beginning of the century right. Okay? Um, certain species, correct, the so-called uh, game species, were considered to be desirable, while well, predators were not considered desirable, correct? Uh, and it goes through all that, Jeff. And it, the the I mean, I think that mattered to you, like the dog stamp, how that was a good on the one side, but it also created pressure to create dog ponds, correct? So there is, it, it, oh, there is always, you know, a, a tug of war between well, different you know, there's, there's always, as they say, there's a, it's a, a cause and effect. Do a, a, cause, do, a cause, or, do, a, do a do a cause and effect diagram. Exactly. So, and you can trace exactly why certain things happen. And, and then, I mean, and it goes through the different, you know, in the in 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 the North America contents context, right? It goes through all the 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 uh, politics, right? So, for instance, here that we have a, our Canadian friend David, right? So, so when and in some species we save them, we save the American buffalo, right? But the saving of the American buffalo was not an easy journey, not because of the animal itself, but also because it, there was a lot of conflict. So, it's a, one of the last remaining herd, which was a private herd, right? Uh, they were trying to sell it to the American government for some of the, refu the refugees that just created. But there was all this discussion about prices and this and that, correct? And they, no, no, talk, I mean, we're talking about the same situation, yeah. but now in the 1920s or the 1910s, yeah. correct? And then people got upset because when there was this indecision, although they created the white the wildlife refuge for the animals, correct? They, and this is the connection to Canada when there was only seen this, because these are private herds, correct? So people don't realize that some of the buffalo herds were saved by individuals, correct? And this guy actually on this decision sold the herd to the Canadians. And then the Americans were pissed off because they were sending American buffalo to the Canadians because they also terminated The, some of the Canadian buffalo, okay? and actually, he went. Some of these buffalo went to Canada. Yeah, there, there's a long story about uh, about them because they went to Elk Island National Park, and, and they they developed a, a breeding program. They've got two different kinds of buffalo there. Exactly. Yeah. So, and and, uh, and it's uh, and they they've yeah. been set um, and they've. The, the, their herd is a decent size, and every so often, the well, they, they started another herd at Grasslands National Park, exactly. and uh, and they keep that 
herd between 350 and 500 head. Then when, when it gets up to 500, the, the, the bison are either sold off at auction or they're given to native communities. And now what's happening is an awful lot of the native communities have their own herds and they're going back to hunting the buffalo the yeah, traditional but, ways but and whatever. See, to understand where we are today, you have to understand history, correct? Oh, yeah. And this book goes to that history. For instance, Randall, those buffaloes that are in, in Canada came from the panhandle of yeah. Texas, correct? So because that was the remaining one, correct? And, and it was because some rancher, which actually happened to be a Native American, decided to save them. He was, you know, so this, this book got in the bison portion through that, correct? And it, so, so for me, correct? I, I can only, you know, like yeah. recommending a camera, correct? You have to yeah. recommend, it's your recommendation. So for the people that have that, that want yeah. that understanding, this is a good book, correct? Yeah. But we also have a, a herd that was in Wood Buffalo National Park that uh, have anthrax. And they've been surviving with anthrax, and, and so it's they're doing an awful lot of research. Well, into that, that you see, the, this is a this is another big thing. It's a, it's actually a battle in Yellowstone all the time, correct? Right? Because the buffaloes out of Yellowstone want to migrate out, or is in their nature to migrate from the high country to the lower valleys, correct? Right? Now yeah. the ranchers don't like it because they say that they, in this case they bring anthrax or brucellosis. But actually, the buffaloes actually got the bru the brucellosis and the anthrax from the cattle, right? So, yeah. it, it, and 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 you see that those tensions, Jeff, all the time, correct? On the buffalo uh, in the introduction of the of the wolf, correct? The mm -hmm. ranchers are, oh, we we're going to get, we don't want predators because they may take some calf, okay? But but the the people that are introduced to the wolf have created scheme that they get paid, correct, for any losses they may have. Now, I understand that as a owner, as a pet owner, you don't want your animal to be eaten by another animal, correct? But remember, these people raise cattle to take it to the slaughterhouse. So, so, so they cannot be that attached to that animal, like like Randall is to his pets, right? So, the, that discussion is a good one. Well, I don't know. You know, Randall cooks his cat on the grill outside from a picture that I saw. <laughs> <laughs> hey, uh, I found a whole bunch of feathers in the back, so I I know one of these two got to him, or they shared it. But uh, I'm left with kill. Uh, you wake up in the morning, you step out, and you feel something nice and soft, and you see a decapitated mouse at the foot of your bed. So yeah, they're trying to tell you, this is how you kill someone. We like <laughs> our food raw. Don't have to cook it. <laughs> I, I'm not a, a, a tree hogger. I am a nature lover, correct, like many here. But we have to understand that our, everything is compromises, correct, like you were talking about. And the, the more educated we are on a subject, the better we can try to influence others on compromising, right? I mean, and, and, and again, go against myth, right? So, so in Colorado here, we're reintroducing the wolf, which I support and I voted for, right? Now they are, re they are going to reintroduce the wolverine again because it was... It, it, these these high mountains here in Corral are one of the few places where there's still good wolverine environment. That well, we have that uh, that red wolf program here at the exactly. uh, down here in Myrtle Beach. We got the they got the approval and they and they got the you know they're going to be breeding them and they're going to re be releasing them to uh, they got uh, areas in North Carolina where they'll where they will release these wolves. And and and, they, and that was a as I told you that was a disaster, correct? They went well, from having Colorado, yeah at Colorado Springs too. They got a whole bunch of wolves that they're being raised, and then they're gonna 
Uh, exactly, but but the, yeah. the big controversy, but in the case of, of the Red Wolf, correct? The because the, what I'm saying is the interest and the human interest and the humans are going to try to bring the balance. In the case of the Red Wolf, they were doing great there in, in North Carolina, but then somebody decided, oh, the Red Wolf is not really a a different species, therefore we don't need to support that program anymore. And then the population went from 200 to only 60. And now you don't have as many as you should have. And then you have to reintroduce them again. So all these type of things is good to, I like to read about. Some people get, you know, like all the type of literature, unfortunately, for me, literature is something that I learned something about. Okay? Yeah. So anyway. <clears throat> yeah, it, it's interesting because when uh, the, the bison were in the prairies, there were no trees, period. Yeah, you know, the, 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 the trees are all in, in the north. And so uh, it, it uh, is an, about three years ago, I, I went on this tour with uh, Parks Calgary Head. They're, you know, they're showing you all the different types of trees that were around them. Then after it was all over, I, uh, <clears throat> I asked her, could you point out which tree is not an invasive species. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and I think there was a black spruce that, that she didn't know about. I could point that out, you know. I was going to say, then she became invasive. Evasive. <laughs> evasive, yeah. Evasive, evasive. Yeah. But, but uh, so, and, and that's because when the bison were around, is anything that was green, they would eat, you know. And uh, they ate all the shrubs and, and everything, so there were no trees. You know, it, it uh, some places you might have a tree. And in you know spot, why, David? You, you know that why, David? Because the bison not supposed to be there on their own. You are supposed to have the bison with the buffalo, so the, the bison with the with the with the wolf and and the bears, so they don't have time to eat all the trees. They have to move on, otherwise they could become prey. So. Yeah, they're coexisting in Banff National Park because what, when, when, when they brought the, the bison in and uh, and they're getting a fairly decent herd is that the wolves and the bears have, haven't figured out how to take the bison down yet. Yeah, but, but, but for instance, they're talking about, but, but, you're, but you probably are not even in Canada. Okay? Not tolerant to have grizzlies on the way into the plains. Okay? The reality is when we have, for instance, the Lewis and Clark expedition, the great majority of the grizzlies were living in the prairies. They were living yeah, in the plains. They, they, they were. They, they were all across, across the prairies. Uh, so, yeah. so that's what is interesting, Jeff, on this type of book. It, it goes through how nature, how we have modified nature and what the different pressure from ranchers and government agencies how that led to the nature that we have today oh we've mo we've modified it a lot exactly. <laughs> uh, and we are part of nature but uh, certainly here in the continent we only have been between 13,000 and 20,000 years old okay? uh, does it have a, a story about the pigeons that were wiped out in the early 1900s yes of course the passenger yeah. pigeons right? yeah. Uh, yeah so so that's the, the how that happened uh, Randall is describing there, correct? And and why it happened, correct? Obviously, due to the hunting, but also the animal. What what part of the animal was? Uh, I mean, for what uh, what the behavior of the animal also led to determination because they didn't have fear for certain uh, in a certain way, correct? And, and, and things that we don't know because obviously we didn't live in those times, correct? Majority of the passenger pigeons, pigeons were killed in order to satisfy relatively cheap food in Chicago, New York, yeah. uh, right? in the big cities. Right? So, so some of our ancestors, in order to have easy protein, they got it from the passenger pigeon. <laughs> yeah. so, so, so for me, that's interesting. Right? So I don't want to, uh, I want to understand why. And, and, and guys, operators are standing by. 
If you want to order that book right now, operators <laughs> are standing by, and Gustavo gets one percent of all the proceeds yeah. to come in for that book. <laughs> hey, so what, people read the book. What's the name of the book again? <laughs> Wild oh, New World. Dan, Dan yeah. Flores. Okay, Dan yeah. Flores. All right. Yeah, and then Paul is in the crowd. There, so he's up early. <laughs> oh yeah, Scooperazzi's here. Yeah, yeah. We woke him up. He heard. He heard. He heard the. the he heard the discussion earlier, and he got a, a, about the uh, the eclipse and 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 going over the tables and everything. And who's right? Who's wrong? What are you gonna do? <laughs> Who are you gonna call? <laughs> One thing I will tell you, Jeff. The problem with this book is that. This probably will make sad Jeff to emerge because you know that it shows you what we do to nature. Right? Oh yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you see it, you see it. You see, I, I, there are so many people that, like I said, there were a lot of people I didn't know that, that wrote for, wrote to me or or contacted me and said, "Oh, where I live, they're doing this or they're doing that or they they, you know." It, it it it's everywhere it's everywhere in, in in other countries it's the same thing it's everywhere well and also the, the what you said correct it's a sometimes even the agencies that are supposed to protect animals then you know they have outdated policies or uh, misconceptions about like in your case correct um, about how to operate an estuary but that's the guidance they have and they do it and that's a consequence that is bad consequence for the animals or, or for the environment. Well, and I don't want, you know, another thing that's, I mean, I, I don't have, I, I'm not going to pretend I have the facts, but one thing that just kind of, well, one, I mean, I know this happens because I know someone whose relative has done this. So I know it, it happens is, you know, you have all these uh, areas in Africa that are supposed to be, conservation areas or protect or protective areas for lions and tigers and you know what have you rhinos and so on and so forth and yet you still for the right price anyone can go there and kill a lion for the yeah. right price well they say it's you because they'll justify it and they'll say well the money we got from that is going to save a hundred more yeah. So if we sacrifice one, you know, it, it benefits us. Well, to me, that means you're getting your money that you're you're getting your money from the wrong sources, because you're you're allowing someone to just hang a head on their wall in their house to kill something that you're trying to protect. And and I and I, I, I take issue with that personally. I don't agree with that. But they do it all the time. They do it all the time. Oh. Well, I mean, the, I can tell you the in all the states, correct? And particularly here in Colorado, Department of Wildlife, they sell the license to hunt, correct? So they, they, it's the same agency that sends license for hunting that they're supposed to protect. And they try to make a balance. I, I don't criticize them completely. But you can see there is within the same organization probably people that say, no, let's, uh, uh, they, that they sell that their livelihood depend on selling licenses, correct? For, I mean, for all sorts of animals, right? Well, well see, the problem is, is we removed uh, the top predator. Oh, I'm sure. and, and, and so we have to replace it with hunters. You know, and, and that's a problem we created. Well, exactly. So, so anyway, that, that yeah. was my... <laughs> So so buy buy the book so that you can uh, yeah, understand, right understand truly understand how screwed up we really are. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> which I already knew from before. But uh, yeah. no, I, no. <laughs> but yeah, but now you know the specifics. You, you exactly, know, you, you know that you know the cause and the effect for all this stuff now. Exactly, <laughs> and, and the successes, correct? Like yeah, they, they have been. Oh, yeah. It, it, but it, I, I think even a comment in one of the other, uh, another YouTuber that the, had some discussions on photography, actually, uh, that uh, 
the it's all about coexistence, correct? The nature for nature to be preserved, we humans, correct, have to coexist with them. Otherwise, there's no choice. No well, choice. well, if you wipe out everything else, then we're next. <laughs> exactly. You know, you, if you if you if you overfish and you have no fish left to eat, in the end, who's who's not going to be around? If the, yeah. if there's no food supply, if you if you deplete your food supply to, to basically zero, who who's going to be next? To, who's going to be next to disappear from the planet? Yeah. You know, so if you don't manage things properly, and you get go overboard. Uh, then in the and, and you get to you will eventually get to a point where of no return where you can't recover anymore exactly. you know, because because I'm also a, a person that happens to like sharks exactly. and I'm, I'm in the minority most people hate sharks my wife hates sharks my wife won't even go in the, won't go in the ocean you know since I took her to see Jaws she's never been in the ocean since <laughs> so. So, uh, because, because every shark is like that one, you know, uh, you know, and, 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 and that's the problem. And, and, then people don't understand that all these, all the, and, and, you know, as a diver, all these species, all, they all interlock with each other, oh, sure. you know, one depends on another, you, you know, the, what you consider the vicious killer, the, the, the great white shark, the bull sharks, all these sharks, oh, they're horrible. They kill people. We, we, we kill, we kill, we, we kill sharks in the tens of millions a year. And on average, you have maybe 70 to 80 shark attacks a year and not all that are fatal. Not all of them are fatal. Yeah. You have 70 to 80 shark attacks on humans a year and you and we're killing them in the tens of millions, and now you have many shark species that are on the on the brink of extinction because for shark fin soup, basically, exactly okay, for shark fin soup, which and, is not that good to and, begin and with. The problem is when you get rid of when you get rid of a species that call it call it a uh, look look at a shark as like a, a, in in the, in the bird world like a vulture. Okay, look at look at the problems you had with no vultures in India, right? Right? You, a cow dies, you don't have anything to get dispose of the carcass. You, you, everything, everything, you know, they were pumping stuff into the cows. The, the vultures would eat the cows, and it was killing the vultures. And they hardly had any vultures left. So then you got all these cows that are that you have no way of disposing of the where, where, what do you do with the bodies when they die? You got nothing to naturally take care of that problem because you you almost wiped out that that species. Now it's recovered, it's recovering, but it's the same thing. Like a shark is like is is like a vulture. It's going to eat the weak and the wounded first. It doesn't want to work any harder than it has to to get its prey. You get rid of you get rid of the, those predators. Then you get an overpopulation of another species because you have no checks and balances anymore. Then that then that species might be something that eats a food source that humans want to eat. And now that food source gets depleted because that other species is running out of control because it doesn't have a checks and balances anymore. And then eventually it comes around and, and it affects humans because maybe you're... Uh, you're, you have no oyster beds anymore. You have no clams anymore because that species that isn't getting eaten and growing like crazy is eating what we like to put on our plate when we go to a seafood restaurant. Oh, the, 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 the nature so, is made out of all the balances, right? The otters eat the sea urchin, and then the sea urchins eat the kelp. So if you eliminate the otters, you eliminate the kelp forest in the cost of... of of California, and, and and one of the basic and we, I mean, those interactions between the species are so subtle sometimes that we don't understand it. It's only when introductions have been made. A, a classical case, and this this goes into this book as well. It described for a long, long time until our lifetime, it, when you know the the predators were being killed because they were considered undesirable, correct? 
any kind of predator got eliminated, right? So at one point, having eliminated all the wolf in, in Yellowstone, they decided that they needed to exterminate all the uh, all the coyotes, right? Because the coyotes were supposedly eaten, and this is where science is important, right? We're eating the the pronghorns, okay? Well, these guys, in order to justify the poisoning, because they were actually doing the poisoning using uh, of the coyote, commissioned to commission a study. And the study actually demonstrated that the coyotes actually were eating mostly rodents, correct? And occasionally. So so when you bring the facts, right? And and then when they they stopped killing the coyotes, the pronghorn population did not went down. Actually, the, the pronghorn population came up when the wolf was reintroduced because the wolf was actually keeping balance on the coyote. Yeah, so, so yeah. Yeah, but that, that's that's the thing that we're not. That's the thing where we're not good at is, well, either either we know we know, but we choose to ignore, exactly. or we're just not smart enough, one or the other. But when the end the end result is it it it's such a delicate balance from one end to the other. It doesn't take much to really mess things up. You know, it could be like you say, it could be as simple as a major oil spill, right? Exactly. It could be, it could be a natural disaster. It Man, could be a man-made disaster. It could be a million different things. But everything is such a delicate, delicate balance that once it once it gets off kilter, you know, sometimes it can't recover anymore. You know, it's like the. And and the whole shark population thing that that's all just for that's just stupidity of humans, you know. Oh, I'm going to get some therapeutic or magical magical cure from uh, eating shark fin soup, you know, because uh, we've been we've been uh, eating shark fin soup for centuries, and uh, so you know, and it cures everything from arth arthritis to uh, bad heart conditions, you know. Uh, so, but. I, I don't know. It's just, uh, you know, where the photographers and, and where this all ties in, whether it be naturalists or environmentalists and photographers and people that love nature. I mean, we're the ones that see the effects and need to, need to speak out and engage with people and explain what's going on because too many people don't understand what's going on. Okay. And, and it's not, Jeff, that we as a photographer don't have impact or responsibilities, correct? We right. do. But, but uh, part of our responsibility to document, like you had done, and to that's our contribution to say, hey, I see this happening. or And, and also for people to appreciate nature through the art of what you showing a good, a nice bird or, or something like that, it may motivate people to say, no, I like that. I want to conserve. Well, you know, it's, it's the, uh, you have the, you have certain groups that, hmm, let's see, I don't want to word this. Let's just, well, you have certain organizations that, that hate aquariums and they hate zoos. Mm -hmm. And I am of the opinion, and I'm not saying that there isn't uh, there that there are. I'm not going to sit here and stand on a soapbox and say there aren't instances where where animals are not treated fairly or not taken care of properly because that is a that does happen. But by the same token, if if no one if your child never saw a dolphin. And an aquarium. Exactly. You would they wouldn't know what a dolphin is. And so when you have those issues where uh a lot of dolphins may be getting killed from fish nets, okay, that are designed in such a way where you know the dolphins can't get out of them, okay. Um no one no one if if no one knows what they are. There's no one left to protect oh. them. So, so, and most people don't get to go, don't have that luxury of 
having scuba dived and seen them and, and seen them and swam with them or or gone on uh, uh, boat tours and had them, you know, jumping alongside the boat or something like that. So it's like if if you if if people if kids and children and young adults aren't exposed to the animals of the world and the and the fish of the world and the reptiles of the world, they have no way to even see them or know what they are. Then when they start to go away, there's no one there to cry foul. There's nowhere that there's no one there to call anybody out because nobody knows what it is. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you know, nobody knows what it is. <laughs> you know, I mean, you know, I don't know, but it, you know, it's, we, we got to do our part, you know, we got to do our part where we can. And uh, unfortunately, sometimes we, we, we fail, but we got to try, you know, we got to try. Well, and and the, and, the, and uh, I think it was Kuarasi early on mentioned as well that at, at the end the world function around money, correct? <laughs> so so by us part of the protection to the animal sometimes is hunting because the, sometimes that makes people pay certain fees that, that in some cases can be directed to a conservation. But also, photographers sometimes, you know, travel to places. We talked about Costa Rica last week. That is actually a reason why certain wildlife in Costa Rica is being preserved, or travel to these national parks to see the animals. Right? Oh, yeah. yeah, the money, the money, well, you know, that's where you had, uh, that's the old story where, um, when you when you teach especially in uh areas like say Af different parts of africa or whatever and and people can realize that they can they can make a living and do well the changing the mindset and realizing that you can make a living and do well by protecting the animals rather than killing the animals mm -hmm. because people want to see them Exactly. And, and 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 when you when 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 the formula gets changed, where there is now a benefit for you to protect them, whereas before you just hunted them, that's an important thing. Oh no! And, you know, and, and many of those parks, the actual poachers become eventually the the the, the, the protectors. The, the protectors, and they are the best protectors. Yeah. Right? But uh, but is this but in this case it's a historical recollection of what happened with nature in North America specifically, and, and that's what I like it, correct? Because I I would love to see a passenger pigeon, correct? <laughs> of course we cannot see those anymore, or the gray hawk. Yeah, yeah. It's, 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 Imagine it's, in your area, Jeff, seeing, you know. Hundreds of beautiful Carolina uh, parrots. That would be a treat for you, correct? <laughs> I'll settle. Or, for, I'll settle or, for one. <laughs> or, 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 or imagine the opposite, correct? Which we work close to that. Imagine today. Imagine in your area not being able to see a a, a golden eagle or an osprey. Right? They were that close to go out. That's right. So, so anyway, why we almost got into extinction, that's what this book is about. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, um, a lot of books out there that we should all read, you know. <laughs> exactly. I mean, there's a lot of books out there we should all read. Um but I, I think uh the I forget there was uh, that that gentleman I talked about earlier that that had passed away, and uh, a gentleman set up a tribute, you know, on his uh, website and whatnot. Yeah, hug a shark, absolutely. See where it gets you. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, he made a comment. And this was from old stats from, you know, you know, say the 80s or something or, or 90s. You know, they had the stats of, you know, with, especially with, when phones got popular, you know, with, that could take pictures, when your phone could take pictures. 
uh, and uh, how many pictures a day get taken by people are uh, take it easy, David. David's taking off, folks. Yeah. See, that's, yeah. see David. David wanted, suggest, David wanted to suggest that we that we put a warning label on the show that says uh, watching this show for five hours can cause health health uh, health problems uh, <laughs> exactly. due to probably due to lack of sleep uh, with with so many people you know <clears throat> have medical issues and everything lately that the show is becoming hazardous for your health so. Uh, be be warned if you stay on here for five hours every Saturday, it, it may cause uh, cause problems for you. Well, well, well there's it, <clears throat> too many of the participants have had a stroke. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, yeah, we don't need any more. So anyway, see you guys later. Thank you. Next sir. Saturday, and I've got my four pictures in, and Nita has her four in. And Gustavo snuck his four in late this afternoon. Because the Scott, the Gustavo won't be here. Gustavo won't be here next Saturday because he's going to be hunting down Randall. Exactly. <laughs> and, and, and Randall's going to be running. But particularly if there's no eclipse, then I can hunt Randall because yeah, there, yeah. there is nothing to follow. You know what? And and if and if the weather stinks and and it's it's totally shot, then you find Randall and you go take bird pictures somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. Right. That's that's that should be Plan B. That's right. If they one little problem, I'm like six hours away from where Randall is. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, <clears throat> good night, everybody. That's saying good night to me. That Luke, real Nikon lover, and Paul and Eva. Yep. And uh, <laughs> the front yard. Yep. And it's uh, it's been good uh, being here and. And like I say, I'll see you all next Saturday when we talk about our pictures and yeah. and Randall's eight pictures that he's putting in and, and just two. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and don't take advantage of, if I'm not on to criticize me. <laughs> oh, we're going we're gonna to say, geez, these are the worst images I ever got from Gustavo. Exactly. Well, <laughs> it, you, know, like, you know what's funny, folks? He'll send me the images and he'll critique himself when he sends the images. And he might, and every once in a while, he'll say, "Well, you know, I'm not. I wish it was like this, or I wish it was like that, or you know." And and these and these are pictures that belong in a magazine. <laughs> and and he and he picks them apart, picks his own stuff apart, and he goes, oh, "I'm not so sure about this one, but uh, you know, they're great pictures. Take take my word for it. They're great pictures." Like I'm really surprised that Gustavo doesn't have enough data when he get goes goes traveling in the states to be able to get on to critique his own pictures because I have enough data when I am in the States to get on and cr critique <laughs> my pictures and everybody else's. So what's the matter, Gustavo? But anyway, uh, on that note, I'm saying goodbye. And I send you the table. Bye. Bye-bye, David. Bye. Bye. Bye, David. Bye. Here's Ma's man's solution. We're going to just skip your images so ours look better. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, uh, you know, it, it, I, I'm hoping you guys, you know, you guys, some like, uh, I don't think I got any images from Ava yet. So, Ava, you got to send me some images for, for next, uh, next Saturday. And I'm trying to convince uh, here Jim and Greg and Mossman. They have to photograph the the super bloom there in California. We're going to have a potential good super bloom again. Well, I know Mossman's trying to get a picture of the uh, rocket of the launch vehicle, you know, That's, going up. Sounds and, good. Uh, yeah. It keeps getting weather, uh, because, of the, because of the weather. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, this is a thought. <laughs> oh, I'll, oh, I'll sh I'll show you what I should sell to the viewers. You guys will laugh at this. Let me. I gotta delete a few things here. Um, I was fooling around on an app the other day. So this is what I gotta sell sell to my viewers. And that I'm saying this tongue in cheek, so don't take me too seriously. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just trying to cause trouble. 
<clears throat> which I'm good at. See, this this is what this is what I got to this is what I got to sell, guys. Oh my god. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah, I like that. <laughs> that's my slogan, right? I always say that. Exactly. And there's the new logo. <laughs> And there's the there's the what there's the YouTube channel. Beautiful, great what do you think? Does That looked pretty good. Yeah, that that's my uh, body when I wake up. In, that's that, make... that's me when I wake up in the morning and I'm thinner before I eat breakfast. Uh, that's, that's me <laughs> wearing the <a> shirt. <laughs> no, but I was I was I've been looking into it. I've been looking into the shirts a little bit. I don't know if I'm going to do it because <clears throat> things get complicated when you try to make any money at all. Making money. Making money is 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 a sin on uh, in many cases here. But um, but anyway, I was fooling around with the shirt. I said I might just I just might buy one for me. And the logo looks good. I, I I saw when you change it, uh, and then I didn't know the whole story that you mentioned there. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, I was very appreciative of uh, of the gift of a, of a new logo because you know, I mean, I, I didn't have to, I didn't have to. It was, it, you know, what was funny. I told him, and I wasn't lying. I I was in the uh, the Adobe app. Let me let me look it up quick. Adobe Express, and you can do thumbnails in that, and and. Um, I do my thumbnails in that for my for the channel. When I do a video, I do my thumbnails in Adobe Express. Well, I thought I'd go in there and I would make up a new logo, and I found it limiting, and then there was just some simple things that I wanted to do, and I couldn't figure out how to do it. Um, and it was kind of, um, you know, it was kind of frustrating. And um, so then, so it was like literally the next the next day, I get the email with the with the gift of the of the logo and I'm like, oh, this is too funny. You know, I was trying to make up a new logo the other day and the software, I didn't like the software. It wasn't doing a good job. And and then all of a sudden, poof, you know, I, I you know, uh, I get I get a beautiful gift of a nice logo and I'm like, OK, I'll use it. You were nice enough to do it for me. I'll use it. It's better than the one I had. So Somebody much better. your mind. Yeah, he read my mind, man. He knew I was struggling to try to make one, and he read my mind. Well, you know, I'm finding that more often is where I was with a friend. He was taking me to a restaurant, and he was in a Jeep. And I had my cell phone on. He had his on. Finished eating. Went back home and uh, got on the Internet. And the first ads I saw were Jeeps. So... <laughs> <laughs> they, they track you, they know what you like, and then they advertise it. That's how they make the money. Except they, in this case, was a private person. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> so they says, well, he, we're going to help him out. That's when, and it may be an AI doing all that stuff. Yeah. You know? Randall, I'm going to ask you this because I know, um, I know real Nikon lover, um, Went yeah, to I went to like a, a ghost a ghost town in California. Okay. You know, uh, you know, from way back when, you know, saloons, you know, all the old buildings, yeah. you know, all abandoned and all that. I'm assuming you must have a bunch of ghost towns in Texas. Yeah, population one, population two, yeah, X cities. Yeah. You just so see are, a bar. So are, so are yeah. a lot of those like uh like touristy spots where people go to take pictures? Well, not really. All right. So what what is it? The hysterical marker? I call them hysterical markers, yeah. right? So you find one, you look in the area and it says, well, I don't see a church or I don't see this building or, or it fell down and stuff. So they put the sign up, but they don't take care of the building. You know, it, stuff like that. It's just, I mean, if you want to see ghost towns, take Route 66. Yeah. Out of that, so yeah. Uh, sometimes you go into places that says uh, such and such a town, population like ten, five, and you look in and you just see like maybe one or two houses. And uh -huh. look at this, because yeah, style has got everything in Colorado. He's got dead antelope. He's got dead antelope in his yard. 
that he can <laughs> that he can have animals eat for like a month. He's got uh, ghost towns in in in, uh, in Colorado. I mean, what's not there? You you see all the. Uh, I have to promote my state. It's not only here, South Carolina <laughs> channel. <laughs> No, but well, that, I, believe me, I don't promote South Carolina a whole lot, <laughs> a little they, bit. They, they sing they here in Colorado, and Randall knows that, that because he lives here, is because of the mining. Uh, during oh, the yeah. Mining, oh, yeah. Mining, <laughs> mining towns. Yeah. Is that all abandoned mining town? Now, yeah. do they restrict people from going near oh, them? No, it's, uh, if you have no, a four wheel drive, just, uh, you go, oh, it's you have like, a four wheel uh, drive and can get there, you, you can shoot. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, I, and I do love photographing this, but this book is uh, th there are so so many, and uh, they are disappearing. Yeah. And there are some that are super photogenic, right? Let me see if I can find. There is a um, particular mill. Uh, remember, the mill is where they used to grind the rock to extract the silver and the gold, and and, and that is. The most amazing thing, but I, I cannot find it here. Anyway, so 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 yes, the same place in California, correct? The mining towns in California. Now in in Texas, I don't think there were that many. <laughs> no, that's that's cool. I mean, uh, you know, it's cool to be able to get pictures from a place like that. Yeah. But the, the, the only downside, the, uh, Jeff, you can only go to those places like three months in a year because, I mean, it's uh, <laughs> the rest of the time. It's uh, you, you can't drive to it, right? You cannot drive to them. <laughs> and, the, and the good thing is that in many of these places, because they are high, all these mountains are high altitude, the wildflowers are amazing. Yeah, you know, you see those pictures sometimes in a magazine where they have the, you know, a, you know, a, a, an attractive woman in a nice dress and she's in the middle of a field and got all the flowers around her and all you see is flowers and they take a beautiful picture. Those are like, real. And, and it's like, I've never seen a field like that in my life. But they're real. <laughs> they probably six. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, I could get a picture of somebody standing in a field of of, of weeds, maybe, but not beautiful flowers, you know. <laughs> oh no, but that, that thing that we were talking here with uh, Mossman and uh, and Jim and Greg before about this, um, you know, super bloom in California, right? So, so indeed, I'm glad that to hear that at least Mister uh, Tim is in the hunt for one of those. Uh, because I, I will make a trip to California eventually to get one of those super blue. Right? Now that they got all that rain, they pro I mean, the, those things are unbelievable. Correct? It's an entire mountain. I mean, you can see the flower from a satellite, right? Well, you have you have some state parks, some I mean, some national parks that you'll see pictures of in, in the magazines and the books and stuff that have, you know, in the springtime have beautiful uh, flowers and become a great fore foreground element oh, okay. to follow right up to a peak of a mountain or a cliff or something like that. And I think some of them might be like in, uh, I think Olympic National Park in Washington has has a fair amount of flowers uh, in it uh, in the springtime. But there's uh, definitely some national parks that where you would see that magical moment where you oh, can get, right. you know, you got the water over here doing one of these and you oh, got right. the flowers and then you got the, the mountain in the background and you get all yeah, that. There is a, there, 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 in Corral, there is a, a place called Yankee Boy Basin, correct? You need a jeep to get there. You cannot get, okay? And, and it's high altitude. So, so it's more than 10,000 feet during July. It's incredible. It's unbelievable. It's, it's almost like, you know, the Wizard of Oz. But that only lasts like a week and a half, correct? <laughs> yeah. And so... <laughs> week and a half. Week and a half of, of, of wonder. <laughs> yeah. So, but... The, the, so, so, but... The, I mean, like we were talking about... This is what nature... What happened now with the Super Blue in California, when you see... These things about the 
10,000 sandhill cranes. Okay? That is, you know, that brings you appreciation of nature. Okay? Because you say, wow. Well, we're almost at our at our uh, stopping point here for tonight, and and we did get off topic quite a bit tonight. But I think it was interesting off topic stuff. Um, I mean, there's only so much photo news out there, and and it was and it was indirectly uh, would have effect on us photographers. It was stuff that I think was interesting to talk about, and um, <clears throat> so we have the. I will put it up here on the screen as a reminder one more time. Uh, we have the photo review next Saturday. Okay. Then the Saturday after that, we have Luis Pierre coming back to talk about Costa Rica. Um, I don't know how much more talking there is to do. He shared a lot of information the last Plenty. time with us, but, you know, he'll, he'll touch on, on it some more and share some images with us. And, uh, you know, I, I I joked with my wife today. I says I really want to go there. Uh, you know, maybe next year or, or or something like that. And she looked at him. I got the I got the look. You know, I got the look. You know, you know, I get the look. And uh, and I go, hey, you know, I says I'm at the. Uh, and I seriously, I said I'm 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 near the end of the yardstick. You know. And she looked at me like, what do you mean you're at the end of the yardstick? You're going to be around for a long time. I says, no, no. I says it isn't a matter. I says, you could live to be 100 years old. I says, I'm not looking at, <laughs> at my longevity, how long I'm going to live. Exactly. I'm looking at how many years am I physically going to be able to That's right, walk, do that. walk 10 miles if I wanted to walk 10 miles. Exactly. Or walk up a, up a, a, a good grade or uh, walk down to the river. Or, you know, do that kind of stuff. I says, there's, there's a, I says, the window is, is now, you know, like, like this now. It's not, it's not big. I says, so, you know, some of that stuff, I said, you know, you got to do when you're still feeling relatively good and you, and you're not, you know, hobbling around, right. you know, you still get around. So, I mean, I told her, I says, I got to start looking into planning some stuff, uh, you know, you know, and, and unfortunately, you know, it's not stuff she's interested in, but, uh, you know, I can't get too carried away with it. But I mean, I, I'd like to at least go to two or three different places, you know, while I'm still on the, when, my, when I'm still on the right side of the lawn, if you know what I mean. Exactly. Um, same, same, same philosophy here, Jeff. Yeah. Yeah. So but anyway, uh, we, we, we thank everybody for joining us tonight. As always, it was a treat to have Chuck on for the first hour of the show and seeing Chuck. Uh, please send your well wishes and have uh, our, our friend Roy Bixby in your prayers and think of him and wish him well uh, for a speedy recovery. Um, for those of you that maybe weren't here early in the show, you know, um, Roy was not here last week and... I tried to get a hold of him with no success, and we found out that he uh, suffered a stroke last week. And we don't know the severity. We don't know, you know, if he's home recovering or if he's still in the hospital. We really don't have those kind of details. If if we do get that information, any information that I get, I will share on the show when we when we get together. Um, but obviously, you know. Uh, it's it sad. It saddens us all uh, that um, you know that that someone in the community is uh, is going through something like this. I mean, it, is, it was horrible, obviously horrible, and still bad that you know Chuck is still uh, working. He's working his tail off to to, to uh, recover one hundred percent or as close to 100% as he can from his event, his stroke, and uh, to, to hear somebody else that has been a regular on um, AP Studios as well as other live streams and kind enough to uh, join me here on this, uh, this live stream that we've been doing for a while uh, is really uh, upsetting. And um, let's hope that... Uh, 
we all we all kind of look at our at our health uh take try to take take care of ourselves as best we can life life's too short man you know exactly but uh but anyway uh everybody have a fantastic easter for those of you who celebrate easter and uh enjoy the time with family and friends and uh and as i used to tell everybody don't be afraid to eat too much food on easter <laughs> uh, and uh and we will see you. We will see you next Saturday when everybody complains that they gained five pounds over <laughs> over over one day's worth of food. And uh, we wish you well. Send in the pictures. We're at uh, what did I say? We're at forty something, low forties. We want. I'd like to get at least sixty pictures if we could. Uh, so let's start shoveling them some of them my way in the next. Uh, early early next week so i'm not getting them all on friday and good night everybody thank you, so, thank you so much for your time and um have a good easter take care bye everyone good night